you. We're live. Good afternoon. It is March the 1st, 2022. This is a hearing of the House Judiciary Committee. Thank you all for watching. We have a number of bills today and we have a little over a hundred witnesses. So we expect that this will be a pretty full day. We're gonna start with House Bill 591, Delegate Moon, uh, the Vice Chair, and we'll hear him and John Fitzgerald speaking in favor of the bill. This is a three and two bill. So three minutes for the sponsor and two minutes for the witness. So go ahead, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, colleagues. House Bill um, 591 is super simple. It, it uh, basically takes the requirement that we enacted uh, for police body cams um, and extends it to all police uh, in the state the requirement we passed uh, last time around uh, went to the county and state police, but it did not cover municipal police and some of the, um, you know, uh, uh, park police, you know, things of that DNR, things of that nature. And so this bill would essentially just simply extend the requirement to all law enforcement in Maryland. Um, if you're curious, law enforcement essentially is defined in Maryland law as people who have arrest powers and are members of one of an, a number of enumerated uh, police departments. There's not really any opposition to this other than where the cost is going to come from. Um, and so I would um, concede on that point and note that when we did the uh, initial county police body cam requirement, we also um, had not identified funding. Um, and so certainly, if either separately uh, through the budget process or through amendment to this bill, uh, we would like to do that. I think it's, an, it's a good time to do it since we happen to be sitting, sitting in uh, surplus times. And just so you have a range of examples, um, the park police, then you've got um, everything from in Montgomery County, we have municipality, elected municipalities with their own police departments. Um, Ocean City comes to mind. Um, and others, but again, I think this is a sensible requirement and we should pay for it. So happy to take questions. All right, we'll hear now from John Fitzgerald, please. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thanks for um, inviting me in. My name is John Fitzgerald. I serve as the chief of police for Chevy Chase Village. It's a small municipality in Montgomery County. I'm in my 39th year in this work and uh, my um, 31st year as, as a Maryland attorney. Um, last year, Senate Bill 71 passed and it uh, required body cameras of all law enforcement agencies of a county. So there are 150 plus law enforcement agencies in Maryland, but most of them are not agencies of counties. So that means that the majority of agencies, um, other than the ones that our county sheriffs or county police departments have no obligation under Senate Bill 71 to adopt body camera programs. And I'm just here to suggest to you that um, body camera programs are certainly very, very good public policy. They're good for police agencies and good for Marylanders. And it seems to me that um, the, uh, the sponsor of SB 71, Senator Sidnor, was not aware um, that the language was as narrow as it turned out to be. His intent was to make this a universal application. And I think that that is where Maryland should be. And I'll close there and uh, invite any questions if the membership has any. Are there any questions for the panel? Delegate Shoemaker, then Delegate McComas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess this is uh, directed to the vice chair. So, I mean, you, you alluded to the fact that funding, I guess, is not identified in this particular proposal that's before us. Is that right? That, that is correct. Um, you know, I, I think the price tag is interesting enough on something like this that we would have to kick it upstairs for discussion if we wanted to um, move it with money. Um, yeah, because that's, I mean, that's the philosophical issue that I have with body camera mandates. I mean, I don't have a philosophical objection to 
body cameras. I think they work to protect the public and I think they work to protect officers. Uh, but, you know, what I don't like is when we mandate things and we don't provide the funding for it. So, you know, if we could, you know, if, if, if we could say the state's going to foot the bill for this with our $4.6 billion surplus or whatever the heck it is, then I'm fully, fully on board. Um, thanks. And, and I'll just add, you know, that a number of these departments are already heading in the direction of doing this anyway. Um, so I, you know, I also would suggest that something of a grant program or a cost split or something might be a reasonable, um, you know, middle ground here. Um, and also, I would point out, um, we, you know, there could be a different timetable for uh, implementation, uh, you know, an extended timetable for implementation on this as compared to, um, you know, the 2025 that the other departments are um, looking at if that's, uh, you know, something that helps dampen the cost concerns here. Okay, thank you. I'll look at your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just briefly, um, Delegate Moon, um, what happens if there's uh, installations that are federal within the jurisdiction? Like Harford County has Edgewood and Aberdeen Proving Ground. I think Anne Arundel County has Fort Meade. Um, it just it's, and they all, I, I'm, I know that Aberdeen has their own police. I won't say if Edgewood does, but I, I know because I've been in magistrate's court. So my question is, what do you anticipate, are, is there a federal requirement? Because that would be, okay, so. so no, anyway. in fact, um, I hate to do this to the public, but I'll, I'll cut and paste the code section of law that defines law enforcement officer in Maryland. It's 3101. Here, if you want to follow it online, Google 3101 of the um, public safety article. And they're, they're sort of enumerated police department. You know, we have, you know, Crofton is specified. The Baltimore City uh, School Police Force is, is a named department. Um, so there are named police departments in law. And then there's um, the general county and municipal departments. But again, it's people with arrest power. And I believe the folks you're talking about are essentially sovereigns in their, um, on their, in, in the military installations. So, so in other words, they have no, we can't mandate. I don't believe we can mandate um, body if, cams on federal facilities. And if we had tribal, um, tribal sovereignty, let's say we had, um, I don't think Maryland does, but I, but I know out West they do, we, we wouldn't have uh, authority to do that either, correct? That I'm indicate. unclear on actually what what the case law is with respect to that. Um, <laughs> well, but, but I, I'll, I think they I'll have their tribal police, but anyway, we won't get into that. Don't have to worry about it. I don't think <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions for the panel? Seeing none, we thank you both very much. We're going to hear from the one person here to testify in opposition, Bill George, please. Helps. If you're here, Mr. George, we'll hear from you for two minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bill George. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Municipal League uh, in opposition to House Bill 591 uh, as introduced. Um, and let me let me start by saying uh, and make this clear that, that MML's opposition is not to the broader use of police body worn cameras, but instead the significant cost concerns around un the unfunded mandate. Um, and I appreciate the, the vice chair uh, and sponsor of this bill's uh, comments um, at the beginning about possibly working towards um, some, uh, some cost uh, reduction or uh, a, a concern um, with us on, on this bill. Um, you know, about 40 out of the 88 municipal police agencies currently have a body camera program for their officers. Um, these departments have seen the benefit um, of expanded use of the body cameras and made the decision to implement it in their jurisdiction. Um, you know, as has been mentioned, the costs uh, for body cameras include not just the acquisition uh, and maintenance of the devices themselves, but the storage um, uh, of the recorded footage and also the review and redaction uh, needed for Public Information Act requests. Um, municipal police agencies uh, tend to be on the smaller side. 
um, of the 88, there's 42 uh, with fewer than 10 officers and 22 with fewer than five. Uh, those with fewer than five, the, the operating budget for the entire town annually is about uh, $2 million or less. Um, but this is not just about small municipalities. In fact, uh, police departments, municipal police departments of all sizes are concerned about the cost. Um, with that, I will uh, end my testimony um, and happy be, ha be happy to answer any questions um, and looking forward to further conversation on this issue. Thank you very much. We'll take questions now and we'll hear from Delegate Wanika Fisher, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. George, for being here. I have a couple of questions. When MML takes positions on bills, does each municipality have a single vote or is it done by population? So our legislative committee within the Maryland Municipal League is made up of, uh, it varies from year to year, but it's generally between 30 and 35 of our members. Uh, it is both uh, elected uh, mayors and council members, as well as appointed officials, such as uh, 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 public works directors, uh, clerks, city managers. Um, and it is from a uh, geographically uh, diverse um, uh, part of the membership. Um, and so that group of individuals is the one that sets the uh, official positions for the league um, on bills. And so each person um, gets one vote um, uh, that's on the legislative committee. Okay. And then my other question to you is, you know, when you're dealing with municipal municipal police, whether they're small departments or or large, either way, they're still, you know, arresting, charging, interacting, and are going to have to be able to give footage to, to prosecutors or whatever's going on, whether it's dash or, or body. I feel like, you know, you really, I guess my question with that is how do you enter 21st century policing if you're not, if small municipalities are unwilling, I guess from your testimony, um, to kind of enter into this best practice? I understand there's a cost to it, but is the only objection the cost or is the objection is the overall nature of having body? And I would also add dash camera. Sure. So, um, you know, there is a bit of, uh, of of the local authority argument on on this piece, and, and what fits best in the community um, should be at the, determined by the by the agency. But there, but the the primary concern is is in fact the costs, and and it really boils down to those smaller uh, municipalities with only a handful of officers. Um, it 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 just simply isn't in the budget um, for them to to have. Uh, you know, the sophisticated cameras, um, as well as the storage costs. Um, and, you know, the, this committee com certainly understands that it's not just for Public Information Act, but also for any sort of, uh, you know, criminal or civil discovery. The, these, these documents need to be stored for a certain amount of time. And that is, uh, that, that, that cost can be quite substantial. Right. But your, your earlier comment about a, a small municipal local authority and what's the best practice in in trial and evidence, is that your position that local authorities have their own opinion on what we what they deem as best evidence? Uh, as you know, I, I, I'm a bit out of my depth here, as I'm not I'm not an attorney and don't fully understand the 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 you know the, the chain of custody um, and 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 evidentiary procedures. Um, you know, I just do it, it does this bill dips into the um, you know it it is a uh, a, a preemption of local authority by saying that you local governments must do this thing. Um, and that is something that generally the league has uh, opposed, um, you know, and has, has for quite some time. Um, I will say that there is a general understanding, of course, that the, the, the broader use of body camera, uh, body cameras on police officers provides way more benefits than it does costs. Um, it, it just that it does come with the actual dollar costs and some of our members are struggling with that at the moment. Are there further questions for the panel or for the witness? Seeing none, we thank you all uh, very much for your testimony today and that will conclude the testimony on House Bill 591. Thank you very much. We'll go now to Delegate uh, Williams and we will hear House Bill 1044, 
We'll hear from her and from Crystal Williams. Three minutes for the delegate, two minutes for Crystal Williams. Um, and uh, whenever you're ready, delegate, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Klippinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Delegate Williams testifying in favor of House Bill 1044, also known as the Public Safety Use of Force Incident Reports. Um, this bill aims to enhance police data collection and accountability about use of force by law enforcement officers and police officers. Um, by passing this legislation, we can keep the public informed and hold officers accountable who abuse their power. Um, by altering a reporting requirement that applies to law enforcement police officers um, regarding use of force incidents in the line of duty, we're basically able to ensure liability and culpability from those who've been trusted to protect our communities. Um, you will see uh, with the written testimony that was submitted, there was one concern that was raised, I think, by the chiefs and sheriffs, um, which we will be submitting an amendment to deal with their first concern. Um, and so that will be forthcoming to the committee um, at a later moment. Um, but we do believe that the bill um, outside of that one amendment as written will be extremely helpful um, in ensuring that our local law enforcement agencies are basically accumulating the data pertaining uh, with regards to use of force instances within their ranks and by their officers. And as required by the bill to publish that information on its public website. Um, as this committee well knows, we spent a lot of time last session on police reform. And this bill is really just kind of an extension of the hard work um, that we did last session um, with regards to that. And the hope and the goal is that, you know, by having passing this bill, and this will help to really have a better and clearer picture about what's going on within our police departments and really creating more transparency um, so that that way everyone within the community will kind of have a clear picture as to what's going on. Um, and if any things need to occur to kind of deal with what the data is showing, then we can evaluate that data and move accordingly. Um, and so that's really the gist of this bill um, is really just to make sure that we're providing transparency about the use of force um, and help and making an effort to bridge the gap between the relationship uh, between law enforcement and our communities. And so for those reasons, I urge this committee to give a favorable report to House Bill 1044. Crystal Williams, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Klippender, uh, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the committee. My name is Crystal Williams, and I'm the Director of the Government Relations Division for the Office of the Public Defender. I'm here today in support of HB 1044, as we see this bill as an important component to continued efforts to increase transparency and further enhance important comprehensive criminal justice and policing reform measures. As we all know, last year was the year of sweeping police reform, and this is the year for two responses, uh, one that will fix um, what has not been working well, and also, there are other measures that are seeking to take back power or pass small laws that negate this body and the public's mandates of last session. And so we must remain vigilant on all policing reform efforts and pay close attention to the experts in the field seeking to clarify, to improve, and to make the, legislative effect, the legislation effective on the ground. Incident reports, use of force reports, the Attorney General's bill, and the body camera uh, legislation are all bills derived from experts in the field doing their best to see legislature's mandate through to success. And so for these reasons, we are in full support of this bill, as Delegate Williams stated, that this is an extension of positive reforms that are already in place. Thank you very much. Are there questions for the panel? Seeing none, that concludes the testimony for House Bill 1044. We thank you both very much for that. We're now gonna to go to House Bill 162. Delegate Jazz Lewis, there are quite a few people here to testify on quite a few people here to testify on, on this uh, legislation. So we're going to hear from, we're gonna hear from um, Delegate Lewis for three minutes. Then we'll hear from Ruben Collins. Uh, some of them are favorable with amendments. So we'll just hear from Delegate Lewis, Ruben Collins, and Angelia G D. Giuseppe. Uh, Delegate Lewis will get three minutes. The other two will get two. And then we'll go to the panel of favorable with amendments. 
So Delegate Lewis, if you'd like to go ahead for three minutes, that's fine. Sure thing. Uh, Chair Klimbacher, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, thank you for your time. I'm proud to be here introducing House Bill 162, and I urge the members of the committee uh, to support this legislation. This bill stems from our work on the Law Enforcement Body Worn Camera Task Force, which was charged by Speaker Jones with finding ways to cost effectively scale the use and acquisition of body worn cameras. This bill also holds body worn camera programs to the highest standards of transparency, ensuring that they are used properly across all of Maryland. This bill will require and authorize the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission to develop dis disciplinary practices for the use, misuse, I should say, of body worn cameras for all law enforcement agencies as well. All law enforcement agencies will be required to develop their programs consistent with the standards established. And many of the agencies who already have their own programs will be able to continue them, provided that they are consistent with the standards in place. This bill will also allow for statewide negotiation of body-worn camera contracts, the acquisition of devices, and storage for body-worn cameras, lessening the costs borne by local agencies. The costs of these programs have proven to be a significant barrier for smaller departments and agencies. And with this approach, we offer a standardized statewide system that reflects the needs of law enforcement, promises transparency, and removes the most significant hurdle to implementing body-worn cameras across the state, which is cost. Uh, implementing the best standards and disciplinary practices for body-worn cameras is essential for public safety. Body-worn cameras when utilized can be effective police accountability, uh, police accountability tool to improve oversight, transparency, and police civilian relations in our country. Current research shows that the benefits of body-worn cameras includes reduced use of force, better transparency, quicker resolution of issues, and increased corroborating evidence that often exonerates officers. So they are not a catch-all solution to the issues we face when it comes uh, to issues around policing. They are a useful tool in the tool chest to continue our police reform agenda that we've seen in recent years. The increasing demand that we have seen for body-worn cameras among law enforcement agencies must be coupled with standards and practices for effective implementation, as well as the ability to scale uh, this technology for all who need it. In 2021, a cost analysis on the implementation of police body-worn cameras programs in Maryland was conducted pursuant to the Maryland Police Accountability Act of 2021, which requires all county law enforcement agencies, as well as the state police, to implement BWCs by 2025. The study estimated that the annual contract cost of a program falls between just under $1,800 and under uh, $4,000 per officer per camera, which is equivalent to a statewide cost of between $25 and $50 million. The estimated average annual contract to implement this program would be about $32 million based on the data that was provided there. The usual counter argument for expanding BWCs is that the cost doesn't outweigh the benefits. I just want to flag that University of Chicago's Crime Lab and the Council on Criminal Justice found that investing in police body worn cameras has a benefit to cost ratio of five to one, which is obviously equivalent to turning a $1 bill into a $5 bill. No, uh, the multiple no, studies. No, all right, I'll, I'll wrap up. I'll wrap up. But uh, essentially, it's a scale, it's continuing what we started last year with the police reform package. I urge a favorable vote on House Bill 162. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Angelia, Angelia Giuseppe, please. And we're looking for Reuben Collins from uh, Charles County. So go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Angelia Di Giuseppe, and I'm a concerned citizen representing the Baltimore County's um, Police Accountability Board Group. I have no personal stories of police misconduct. And yet the topic of distrusting the police has come up with my neighbors and even at church countless times. We have a general distrust of police in Maryland that can no longer be ignored. I did some research on the police departments for the counties that you all represent. And only Baltimore City and PG County had any information on how much taxpayers are spending on complaint settlements. Only three more counties had any accessible data on PD-wide misconduct and use of force. This hiding of information, this lack of transparency is only hurting the police department's capabilities to protect our communities. And I've heard that argument that while the bill is great, it's just too expensive. And that is simply untrue. The estimated total, not yearly, but total, 
cost of outfitting all police uh, with body cams, archiving the footage, getting the software so citizens can see the footage, it's a little over 32 million. Now that is a lot of money, but we've already committed to spending most of it. The Police Accountability Act in, two, in 2021 guaranteed that we are already paying for all uniformed officers to get body cams. And it will be a waste of taxpayers' money if we do not develop the infrastructure for that footage to be accessed and used. Along with that, while I could not find how much each county spends on misconduct settlements, I did find a few numbers. Between 2014 and 2020, Baltimore City paid over 12 million in settlements. From 2012 to 2014, PG paid an average of four million a year. That is two counties spending half the cost of implementing a comprehensive body cam program, a body cam program that would eventually lead to reducing misconduct settlements. Financially, this bill makes sense. Morally, this bill makes sense. And even if you're of the belief that police misconduct is not as prevalent as the media makes it out to be, this bill makes sense because the footage will be your proof. I urge you to do the right thing, the right thing for so many reasons, and to pass HB um, 162. Thank you, Thank you so much for your time, you. and please remember your voters are watching. Thank you very much. Is uh, Ruben Collins available? We don't see him, so we are going to take questions for this panel. Are there questions for the panel? All right, seeing uh, Delegate Bartlett, please. Mr. Chair, I was a little late on my hand there. I have a question for the uh, bill sponsor. You mentioned the benefits, or you alluded to a number, and, and you said one in five show five the benefits. To five to one, right. Can you tell me, can you just give us a couple of the benefits? Maybe like maybe two or three of the benefits? Sure. So uh, actually, uh, I promise you, I did not coordinate with uh, uh, Angelia, but um, yeah, you know, one of the main benefits is lower incidents of use of force, right? When we fully fund these programs, people realize that they're funded like any society, you know, people's likelihood to commit a crime is the likelihood that you will get caught, right? So now that everyone is deploying it, there'll be more accountability. So we are shelling out less money in lawsuits on the front end. Um, there are also less complaints coming in from the public because of that increased accountability, uh, because they feel better about uh, the system. So literally from not needing the lawsuits to literally the lawsuits coming in on the front side is also uh, changed as, as well. So those, those are the main ones. And I will send you the study that I referenced as well. Okay, that would be helpful. So essentially what you're saying is what I think I hear you saying is the transparency uh, would increase the level of trust. Increases the level of trust and it also lowers- Among the other things. Yep, okay, thank you. Are there further questions for this panel? All right, seeing none, we thank you all very much. And we're going to go to the next panel, which is favorable with amendments. We'll hear from Rich Gibson, Andrea Mansfield, Bill George, DePaul Nibber, and Melanie Shapiro. We'll hear from these five people for two minutes each, please. And I think we have Rich Gibson, all right. If we could hear uh, State's Attorney Gibson, please, for two minutes, that'd be great. Rich Gibson? He won't unmute. All right, we'll come back to him. Let's go to Andrea Mansfield first, then for two minutes. We'll go to Andrea Mansfield for two and go from there. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Judiciary Committee, Andrea Mansfield, Manis Canning and Associates, representing the chiefs and sheriffs on um, House Bill 162. And really want to thank the sponsor, um, Delicate Lewis, for putting this bill in. Um, and you had a bill earlier talking about just the, the cost and um, the concerns with local law enforcement agencies trying to provide body-worn cameras. And we are pr really appreciate his efforts and the work group um, putting forth recommendations to do so. 
Um, we do have a few uh, amendments we would like to discuss uh, with the committee. Uh, we have spoken with the sponsor on these. And I know he is working on some amendments um, to share. But for a, a quick overview, um, there's language in the bill dealing with the disciplinary matrix. Um, Infractions dealing with body-worn cameras tend to be internal infractions that occur. So one amendment we would uh, be seeking clarification to provide, to make it clear that a disciplinary matrix that the Police Training Commission must establish would apply to internal and external complaints. Um, also, if you, as you've heard, um, a number of uh, law enforcement agencies already have body cameras in place. Some have been looking to put them in place since legislation passed last year. So instead of requiring agencies to participate as a part of the state program, uh, we would like to have the opportunity for jurisdictions to opt up in to this program to provide that flexibility. Um, and some of the agencies I've talked with, um, they were a little concerned about the technical specifications of and capabilities of the body-worn cameras. Some have a lot of bells and whistles, some that turn on immediately when you pull the taser and things like that. They want to be sure that that capability is, is available, so they would like to be able to weigh in in setting those um, technical capabilities for this, for this equipment through the procurement process. Um, another area is the custodian of the records. Um, this would set up a more centralized storage um, facility or location for body-worn camera footage, and I guess law, local law enforcement agencies would want to ensure that they have <coughs> access to that information. Um, there is language, I know cost has come up a little bit in conversations already. Um, we feel that that needs to be further clarified in the bill and, and what that means, and we need some regulations to do so. And lastly, and I'll be really quick with this one, um, there's language in the bill that deals with the release of body-worn camera footage. Um, there has been legislation in the past several, several years dealing with this issue. Actually, Senator Sidnor is sponsoring the bill on the Senate side, and it was on, well, it's going to be on the Senate floor today, Senate Bill 31. We think this is a very agreed upon approach by MAKO, MML, and the advocates, and we okay. would suggest this approach into that. But thank you very much. Thank you. Senate. We'll go back now to Rich Gibson, who's with us now for two minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Gibson. 18-year uh, career prosecutor, state attorney for Howard County, and president of the Maryland State Attorney's Association, here representing the organization and myself today. <clears throat> the MSAA supports the bill with amendment. We support the statewide implementation of body-worn camera, and we agree there should be some minimum thresholds established to find the use of body-worn camera. And we also agree that the Police Training and Standards Commission is a logical entity to define those minimum standards. Full disclosure, I'm also a member of the Police Training and Standards Commission and I have a deep appreciation for the work that they do. However, there are several issues that I wish to raise now. First is the bill as constructed has potential uh, contracts clause, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution issues because it, it, would, it would put in place procedures that might jeopardize existing contracts between uh, body-worn camera provider entities and services and uh, local municipalities. Uh, additionally, the bill is currently drafted, requires all body on camera to be stored with the Police Training Standard Commission. Every law enforcement agency in the state has unique identifiers, language codes for their, for their particular systems, and it'd be hard, very hard to keep track of everything. Additionally, putting everything in one place creates security vulnerabilities. If network storage issues were to arise, if hacked, it could create severe problems because law enforcement agencies and prosecutors' offices from across the state will be accessing this at all times. Additionally, it could create a discovery pinch point uh, where we need to access information. We can't get it because of some problem. We've tried to house things in one central hub before and had, had problems. You can look at the Maryland Health Exchange um, or the Maryland Department of Labor with unemployment benefits issues that, that are arisen there. Um, I've included language in my written testimony, which has been previously provided, that offers sufficient flexibility to establish minimum standards while offering the jurisdictions a, a degree of control to ensure they maintain local control of body-worn camera information. I'd also add that, that the bill could create a monopoly, which would create less competition and thus less innovation amongst body-worn camera providers. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We'll hear from Bill George now from MML for two minutes, please. Thank you to the chair and members of the committee. Bill George with the Maryland Municipal League here today in support of House Bill 162 with amendments. Um, thank you to the sponsor in particular for his work uh, with us on this. Um, the amendments to which I'm referring are those that were described by Ms. Mansfield. Um, we are in full agreement with those, um, and thank you for the work 
uh, with the Chiefs and Sheriffs as well as the Maryland Association of Counties um, on those particular amendments. Um, you heard me earlier talk about cost concerns uh, to municipalities in particular um, regarding the implementation of body-worn cameras. Uh, this bill uh, also includes that mandate uh, that municipalities, uh, municipal police departments uh, do have their uh, officers out, outfitted with uh, body cameras by the specified date. However, uh, our opposition is, is almost completely mitigated by the um, creative uh, cost-cutting uh, subsidies uh, and other provisions that are in this bill. Um, it, it, it helps with the uh, decreased costs of procurement of the uh, equipment uh, up front. Um, it has a unique storage, um, uh, storage mechanism to help uh, defray some of those costs uh, that are obviously ongoing, um, as well as uh, one of our amendments uh, that was alluded to provides a, a framework for our records custodians um, to help them uh, better uh, use their time efficiently when uh, reviewing and redacting Public Information Act requests for these uh, body camera footage uh, videos. So um, with that, um, happy to answer any questions, but we uh, uh, urge a favorable report uh, with the critical amendments that were mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you. DePaul Nibber, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is DePaul Nibber, representing MAKO in support of House Bill 162 with amendments. Our county officials sincerely appreciate the introduction of this bill and thank its sponsor, Delegate Lewis, for his willingness to entertain our suggested amendments. Um, last year, MAKO appeared before this very same body to express concerns with House Bill 187 citing the costs associated with body-worn cameras, specifically the storage and maintenance of footage. With the passage of last year's uh, Police Accountability Act, which incorporated elements of that bill, our counties are at varying stages of implementing their body-worn camera programs. Um, so our requested amendments mirror those proposed by our chiefs and sheriffs. They account for the flexibility needed by counties that have already invested a great deal into their body camera programs, including the ability to opt out of the state's procurement process and maintenance of uh, camera footage. We also requested for counties opting into the state's footage management system, greater coordination regarding the release and redaction of footage. Altogether, with these amendments, House Bill 162 will provide significant relief to counties addressing previously stated concerns regarding program costs and the administration of footage collected. MAKO urges a favorable with amendments report. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie Shapiro, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, Melanie Shapiro, Public Policy Director with the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence, here to testify um, in support of House Bill 162 with amendments. Um, I am going to refer specifically to page nine, lines three to 24 of the bill. Um, and Ms. Mansfield already indicated um, the amendment. It was the last amendment that she discussed, which is regarding Senate Bill 31. Um, this area of the bill discusses the policies that may need to be developed by the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission, including considerations for individual privacy and whether any edits or redactions are necessary of body-worn camera footage. In 2015, there was a survey conducted by the American Civil Liberties Union, and in that it was of domestic violence um, and sexual assault survivors. Over 80% of those surveyed believe police community relations with marginalized communities influence survivors' willingness to call the police. We believe body-worn cameras can improve accountability and transparency, but it also needs to be balanced with victim privacy. The National ACLU, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, the Batter Women's Justice Project, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and the 2015 Commission regarding the implementation and use of body cameras by law enforcement officers in Maryland all agree that, that there should be reasonable restrictions on the release of body-worn camera footage of certain victims. That language is already contained in Senate Bill 31 that has passed JPR. And we're asking that that language be amended on to House Bill 162, and we urge a favorable report with amendments. All right, are there questions? Yeah, are there questions for this panel? Any questions for this panel? All right, seeing none, we thank you all very much. And that concludes the testimony for House Bill 162. Thank you all very much for your testimony today. Now going to House Bill 545. Uh, this is Delegate Grammer's bill. 
Um, House Bill 545, we'll hear from, we'll hear from Delegate Grammer, and he's the sole witness in this bill. All right, Delegate Grammer, for three minutes, please. Except he, uh, Sorry, can, can you hear me okay? You're fine, go ahead. All right, let me get my notes up here. Sorry, there we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Delegate Robin Grammer here to present House Bill 545. House Bill 545 adopts a framework for the legal use of persistent aerial surveillance, including the constitutional check of the warrant requirement. When persistent surveillance systems started surveilling the city of Baltimore, it did so in a discreet agreement without any public awareness. The wide area live feed surveillance system was deployed for wartime use. After being shut down in Los Angeles and Dayton over privacy concerns, the program was brought to Baltimore and authorized by city police. The Supreme Court has long held that aerial surveillance does not constitute a search in considering the Fourth Amendment. However, the persistent monitoring makes aerial surveillance more equivalent to GPS monitoring, which the Supreme Court has already considered a search. And it was on this premise that the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals based its opinion when it ruled the Baltimore City program was unconstitutional. I brought this bill one last time as I feel codifying our Fourth Amendment protections is the right thing to do. It also gives us the opportunity to discuss the technical aspects of a related warrant, such as related warrant requirements or the appropriate warrant duration. In times of violence and uncertainty, the rule of law still matters. For this reason, reason we should put these protections into statute. Thanks for the opportunity to present House Bill 45, 545. Be happy to take questions, and I'd ask for a favorable report. Are there questions? All right. Seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 545. We thank you very much. We'll go now to House Bill 651. Again, Delegate Grammer, and we'll also hear from Debbie Levy. So Delegate Grammer for three minutes, Debbie Levy for two. Go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Again, for the record, Delegate Robin Grammer here to present House Bill 651. Uh, House Bill 651 discontinues the use of no-knock warrants in Maryland. On January 21st, 2005, a no-knock warrant was executed on a home in Dundalk, Maryland. The door was breached and a flashbang grenade was thrown. Woken from her sleep and fearing intruders, Cheryl Knoll grabbed a lawfully registered gun near her bed and held it pointed at the floor. When the SWAT team kicked open the bedroom door, Cheryl Knoll was shot three times and killed. In evaluating the use of force by officers, we make allowances for the fact that no-knock warrants can be exceptionally confusing and fast moving with officers required to make split second judgments under suboptimal conditions. Therein, we judge officers under a more forgiving standard. What is seldom recognized is, though, is those on the receiving end of a no-knock warrant are disoriented, off guard, and are completely unprepared in these circumstances. What frequently ensues is the worst case scenario. The occupant pulls a weapon into self-defense. In these cases, there is almost always a fatality. This was the case in Cambridge, Maryland, when officers executed a no-knock warrant on Andrew Cornish, who emerged from his bedroom carrying a sheath knife in self-defense. He was shot in the face and forehead and killed. This was the case with Cheryl Noel of Dundalk, Maryland, who was shot and killed. And this was the case of Duncan Lemp of Potomac, Maryland, who was also shot and killed. Judge Pamela Harris wrote in a related dissent, this precise sequence of events a surprised and defense reaction by a resident to which the police respond with force is exactly what the knock and announce rule was designed to prevent. Unfortunately, knock and announce and the castle doctrine has been almost completely eroded. I Delegate McComas, could you mute yourself, please? I believe we put both residents. Delegate McComas. Delegate McComas. Delegate McComas. Delegate McComas. Delegate McComas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're going to hold the. We'll stop right now. Thank you very much. Good to know it's she's paying attention. I'm sure Delegate McComas will appreciate it when she gets to that part of the tape. It's okay. Delegate Grammer. 
if you want to maybe rewind 15 seconds and then we'll go sure. from there, that'd be fine. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Judge Pamela Harris wrote in a related dissent, this precise sequence of events, a surprised and defensive reaction by a resident to which the police respond with force is exactly what the knock and announce rule was designed to prevent. Unfortunately, knock and announce and the castle doctrine has been almost completely eroded. I believe we put residents and law enforcement at heightened risk with the continued use of no-knock warrants. With this bill, we restore no knock, we restore knock and announce, and we commit to less volatile issuance of warrants. With that, I thank you for the hearing for House Bill 651. Happy to take questions, and I would ask for a favorable report. All right, Deborah Levy, please now for two minutes. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Debbie Katz-Levy and I'm the Director of Special Litigation with the Maryland Office of the Public Defender in Baltimore. We join in Delegate Grammer's request and respectfully request that this committee issue a favorable report on House Bill 651, eliminating no-knock search warrants. Last year, this body courageously passed an incredible amount of police reform bills, becoming a leader in this nation uh, to courageously change the laws in favor of the citizens of Maryland. Um, there was a tremendous push last year to repeal no-knock search warrants, and unfortunately, that push was not as successful as some others, and we're here to renew our request for the same reasons that we did so last year with the unfortunate circumstance for more individuals who have died at the unnecessary um, end of a no-knock search warrant. Just February 2nd, 2022, 22-year-old Amir Locke in Minneapolis was killed by police at the execution of a no-knock search warrant. Um, like Breonna Taylor, Mr. Locke was not the subject of the search warrant. We would posit to this body that even young law enforcement officers don't want to be executing no-knock search warrants because they are dangerous for everybody. And it continues to boggle the mind why we don't come together and insist that before law enforcement enters a home, not just to save the lives of the citizens, but even to save the lives of law enforcement, that police are required to announce themselves. So folks are not startled. They have the right to bear arms in their home. And so they don't use them to protect themselves on the reasonable belief that somebody is breaking and entering into their home. It is an unnecessary loss of life that often tragically results. And for those reasons, we respectfully request a favorable report for House Bill 651. All right. Thank you very much. We'll now, now I'm fighting with it. Now we'll go to questions. I believe for this panel, we'll go to Delegate Cardin first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, thank you, Ms. Levy and uh, Delegate Grammer for bringing the bill. Um, we passed some sweeping um, reforms last year on no-knock warrants. Do you have any any information, statistical evidence in Maryland where, uh, since the time that we instituted the new knock no-knock warrant policies with tremendous restrictions? Whether um, there has been any issues with with um, no-knock warrants here in Maryland, so that we if we have any evidence that we need to further reform the system from what we've already done. Thank you for the question. I'll start. I, I don't have any statistics about Maryland, nor have I seen any collected in any uh, digestible fashion. Uh, I will say that I believe in other states, particularly the state where uh, Mr. Locke was shot, uh, I believe they had adopted some similar regulations. Uh, and and I, I think what you have to consider is really, frankly, the, the principle of the issue here. When I, when I made the case for this reform last year, the, the, the circumstance that I suggested was like, look, who, who is, <laughs> who is going to be um, put in the, in the crossfire here? And there are a lot of questions that could be asked about the situation, but, you know, what was Mr. Locke's fault? That he legally owned a firearm? Uh, and I think if we are to continue to, to press the issue forward, you know, I, I, I reassert a lot of the same arguments that I made last year. I think one day we'll look back at no-knock warrants and we'll just say, look, we, we understand that the issuance of warrants is dangerous. Um, creating these situations where we're, we're breaching a door 
escalates things both for law enforcement and um, uh, and the people in the in the house. Um, uh, but I, unfortunately, I don't have any any statistics that I can give you uh, to indicate our uh, the changes in policy from last year. I don't know if Miss Levy has any comments. I could just briefly add that following Mr. Locke's death in Minneapolis, a moratorium on no knock warrants was recently enacted. And they invited partners across the country to come and study um, tragedies, enforcement, need for no-knock warrants at a rate higher than has previously or at an effort that previously not been undertaken. And perhaps this um, legislation, this body could take the lead from Minneapolis that has said at this point, we need not to have another young, innocent human being killed and impose a moratorium until we have better answers. Um, and I just would always leave with the question, everybody knows that when you open the door and announce police, it's simultaneous. Nobody's going to run and hide any nefarious material at the same time you're busting down a door while you're saying the words police. There's just no need for another young person to die needlessly because we can't say police. Are there further questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very much. We'll go now to those in opposition, Joe Riley, Gavin Potashnik, Steve Kroll. And they're probably not gonna be here because um, I believe they're testifying on a bill in JPR. Uh, so we are, um, a bit of a, a bit of a loss here. So I will refer to the committee to any written testimony that they may have submitted. I believe there may have been some written testimony in opposition. Uh, there is some, at least some written testimony in opposition and um, we're gonna have to go from there. Um, and they are presently in the Senate. So that's gonna conclude the testimony on House Bill 651. I'm going to keep moving now to House Bill 666. Unfortunately for Delegate Grammer, he got that one this year. So we're going to hear from Delegate Grammer and we're gonna hear again from Deborah Levy, three minutes for Delegate Grammer and two minutes for Debbie Levy. So go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Delegate Robin Gramber to present House Bill 666. When former P Baltimore City Police Officer Michael Wood was asked what his suggestions were for improving police culture, he recommended that we think about what our goals are. He told the story about uh, how the metric that he was given by leadership were arrests. He told about how to, satis yeah. how to satisfy this request he would drive through his assigned detail, uh, looking for ways to fulfill his arrest quota. He couldn't fill his mandate in the rich part of his assigned district, so he went to the place where he could fill, could fill his num arrest numbers by arresting people for jaywalking or throwing cigarette butts on the ground. This just happened to be an area that was predominantly minority. If this sounds like a bill that was requested by a criminal justice reform organization, this is quite to the contrary. This bill was drafted in response to discussions with local law enforcement officers. And what it does is it strikes the ability for uh, leadership to um, grade law enforcement based on the number of arrests or citations that they have made. Former Delegate Michael Smeagol attempted in the past to do away with uh, uh, citation quotas and arrest quotas. His bill was amended. And although we, don't, um, although we don't allow quotas as a policy, we if you look at the bill, if you look at the statute as it's currently written and you look at my bill, we actually do allow for the judgment of law enforcement officers based on their issuance of citations or in part based on the number of arrests they have made. So this has been um, what I think is really a dark part of law enforcement. We, we tend to, um, 
we, we don't always recognize this, but we really, we're really pressing our frontline law enforcement officers to, to really drive up the arrest numbers, uh, even though uh, publicly we know that quotas are bad. Uh, I think this is contrary to community policing. Uh, if, any, if any of you have been in an environment here in Baltimore County, I think our local law enforcement actually really does great. Uh, they come to community association meetings, they listen to what the issues are, and they assign resources for the next month based on what the community association, the community tells them they are. What we want to avoid is politics and policing. We're still doing that. We're still allowing our political leadership to press quotas onto our law enforcement, and I think we should stop doing that. Uh, and, and finally, committee members, consider who who is opposed to this? It's the chiefs and sheriffs who are opposed to this. And these are the folks that are pressing our on the ground law enforcement officers to increase the numbers. Of course, the chiefs and sheriffs are going to be opposed to doing away with quotas. But I think it's it's time we did so. Uh, lo local law enforcement, hates it. It, uh, a, a, as well as a criminal reform, criminal justice reform advocates with that, uh, thanks for the opportunity to present House Bill 66. I would ask for a favorable. Thank you very much. We'll go now to Debbie Levy for two minutes, please. Good afternoon again, Deborah Levy from the Office of the Public Defender in Baltimore. I wanted to call this committee's attention to uh, a 660 page report that was recently published in January of 2022. It's called the Step to Report, the Anatomy of the Gun Trace Task Force Scandal, Its Origins, Causes, and Consequences. For those who haven't read it, I urge a reading. Um, in that report, the city of Baltimore and the police department hired a group of experts to study how corruption flourished in the Baltimore Police Department. I'm going to read a brief excerpt in my approximately one minute and 30 seconds remaining. Um, in studying corruption over decades in the Baltimore Police Department, the author of the Stepto report, Michael Bromwich, writes, the pressure to achieve high arrest and gun seizure numbers created its own set of long-term problems. Corrosive incentive structures were created that were inextricably linked to the pressure to produce. BPD members and command staff were judged to a large extent based on the numbers of arrests and gun seizures they achieved, rather than on whether those arrests and seizures led to successful prosecutions. When combined with inadequate training, these incentive structures produced unjustified stops and frisks, unlawful arrests, and gun seizures that did not result in successful prosecutions. Even though BPD would claim it did not have quotas, this does not for even a moment suggest that incentive structures were more responsible than the choices of individual officers for the existence of corruption. The incentive structures that emphasize arrest and gun seizure numbers and the misconduct by some officers in response profoundly damaged relationships between BPD and the community, especially Baltimore's Black community. At the end of the day, nothing good comes from quota. You want quality policing, not numbers focused policing. We urge a favorable report. Questions for the panel? All right, seeing none, we thank you all very much. And that'll conclude the testimony for House Bill 666. I think you have a question, Mr. Chair. Oh, I do have a question. Oh, it's Delegate McComas. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, just briefly, uh, I apologize for the, uh, I had my first bill hearing and I was trying to juggle two computers. My question is for Ms. Levy. Um, one, do you have the uh, site for the Gun Trace Task Force study or just uh, Google it? The other question I have for you is, um, did some of these problems uh, were caused because of um, city stat? where um, the commanders were put into, uh, you know, the mayor's office and they had to report on a, a very, uh, you know, periodic basis. I don't know if it was weekly or whatever, but they were, the commanders were pre pressed to uh, clean up the streets. And we had a lot of rest without, without uh, prosecution. And we had to then deal with all the expungements. I just kind of want to know that, you know, kind of, I think that that has caused a lot of problems that we've had to deal with to clean up. I apologize. I was kicked out of the meeting. I'm not sure if that uh, question was directed at me. So I, I sincerely. It was. <laughs> it uh, 
I, I, I somehow got kicked out, so I only heard the very end. I apologize. Okay. One, one um, can you provide the link to the study for the gun trace task force? But the other, but the question I had was, I wanted to know if historically in your, because you, you kind of studied this obviously, um, that uh, under a, a, a prior uh, mayorship in the like, I guess the, the, the late nineties and the, the, you know, early, early twenties um, to, you know, two hundreds or two thousands um, that there was a lot of um, city staff and everybody had to report and say how their different districts were doing. And there was a, a, a high number of arrests without prosecution, I believe over 20,000. And then that, that kind of caused the problems with the expungements. And in other words, there was a lot of pressure put on the commanders to produce. So I wanted to know if this is what has caused a lot of the problems that we have today. And, and, and basically the gun trace task force, because everybody was, you know, trying to try to make the numbers look good. I think I'm happy to provide, um, and maybe I can send Chairman Clippinger a, a link to the pro, to the report and the executive summary that he could then circulate. I'm happy to do that today. Um, and I, the report focuses on, it says, look, we can't just look at the gun trace task force and how corruption flourished. We're going to go all the way back decades. And over the decades, what was consistent is this rush to numbers. And so the answer to your question is yes. What happened with the gun trace task force per the report is that um, the, the police department became so focused on success with numbers that they overlooked complaints of misconduct. They overlooked whether those saw through to fruition in a prosecution. They overlooked whether the officers consistently failed to appear for court. All of that was, while, they, while the misconduct was being documented, the police department was praising them for the numbers of guns that they brought off the street. So there has to be some place where you're not focusing on the numbers and looking at the overall content and the quality of policing, not the numbers. So I think the answer to your question is yes, that consistently remained a problem, not just in the early 2000s, but all the way through recently. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there further questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very much. Committee, uh, I understand that the Attorney General uh, is speaking on the same bill um, the Senate version of uh, House Bill uh, 638 and uh, JPR. So we're going to skip that. We're going to come back to it. And we have our friends now from Appropriations who are coming here. Uh, Delegates Proctor, Osvero, and McKay, who are here uh, on House Bill 1207 from Delegate Anderton. We'll hear from him for three minutes. Um, and uh, then we will go from there. So Delegate Anderton, please, for three minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing, Mr. Chair? How are you doing, community members? Um, uh, it's very entertaining when you sit in on another community, especially uh, committee, especially virtually, you get to see what everybody else is doing in the background. And one of y'all was adjusting your picture frames, and you got one a little off. So if you could touch that one, the third one in the middle there, uh, you'll be right on point. Uh, House Bill 1207. Uh, it was a very simple bill, easy bill. Uh, there were a couple other pieces of legislation earlier that dealt with body-worn cameras, but there seemed to be a missing piece. Just something's just not quite there. Bam, House Bill 1207 finishes it off for you. you Got to find a way to pay for them, and here it is. So as a mayor, before I was a member of this illustrious body, I wanted to do body-worn cameras in 2013 and 2014, but they were extremely cost-prohibitive to a smaller municipality with a tight budget. And here we are, 2022, and we still do not have body-worn cameras because of that exact same reason. So bam, House Bill 1207 takes care of that. Uh, it's a very two-page bill. It says that if we're gonna mandate it, we're gonna pay for it. And uh, I think that's about it. So I, uh, I'm going to be quiet. I know you got a long day ahead of you, just like we do in the Environment Transportation Committee. And I think I have some other folks that would like to speak on this if you feel so inclined. So please, please, I ask for a favorable report and let's make it happen. Bring in the witnesses for Delegate Anderson. Uh, uh, we'll hear from uh, Mayor Day from uh, Salisbury, DePaul Nibber from Mako, Bill George from MML. 
and Adam Ribozinski from the city of Havre de Grace. So we'll hear first uh, from uh, Mayor Day, if he is in. Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right, for two minutes, please. All right, um, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much, uh, members of the committee. Um, I am proudly here to uh, seek a favorable report on this uh, bill. I wanna share with you that in July, 2017, a call came in for a distressed subject in a park with a gun at night in our city. Minutes later, the first responding officer discharged his service weapon in that park. The next day, the mayor, myself, our police chief and the department leadership team were standing behind a lectern and before TV cameras explaining what happened. Now there's some missing elements to that story and how they're filled in would determine what the second and third order effects are. Adrenaline, emotion, memories, mitigating circumstances, evidence, witness accounts, they can all play a role in how things are remembered and reflected. In this instance, the press conference was about reaction. It was about timing. It was about quick thinking officers. It was about good tactics. It was about experience. And ultimately it was about a life saved. The officer ceased contact, recognized that the gun was likely not real, moved back to cover and talked him down. And that young man, still a city of Salisbury resident is someone I check in with regularly today. I'm proud of course that he's alive, um, but also that he's doing much better. Luckily, those factors that can shape a narrative that I mentioned were largely put to bed by the fact that all officers that night were wearing body cameras. Two years earlier in 2015, the city of Salisbury funded body cameras for all 92 of our officers at the time. We now have 102 police officers. The cost was significant, especially for a fairly small city like ours. Uh, but the initial cost was, was only a small part of what has been a rapidly rising expense uh, for our municipalities. Uh, data uh, and managing that data has been the most significant rising factor. And so there are many, many things that go into uh, considering uh, how we fund this moving forward. But I am of the belief that a mandate uh, passed down by the state without funding puts undue pressure on our local governments that is unbearable uh, at this point and unsustainable. Our budgets are strained and no doubt, this is the time that if we're going to make improvements like this uh, and support something, which I wholeheartedly do, um, funding needs to come along with it. And that's why I seek a favorable report from the committee. Thank you. Thank Mr. you very much. And to Paul Nibber, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is DePaul Nibber, representing the Maryland Association of Counties in support of House Bill 1207. Um, as mentioned by the bill sponsor, Delegate Anderton, this bill is simple. It is incredibly broad and will cover a variety of anticipated and potentially unanticipated costs borne by our counties. As mentioned earlier, our counties are concerned with the costs associated with body-worn camera programs, including the procurement of equi equipment and maintenance and storage of body camera footage. Um, this bill completely takes care of that um, that issue. And for that reason, MAKO urges a favorable report for House Bill 1207. Thank you. Bill George, please, for two minutes. Thank you to the chair and members of the committee. Bill George with the Maryland Municipal League here today in support of House Bill 1207. Um, as you've heard, ML's concern about body worn cameras is not around their benefit to transparency and public safety, but instead their substantial costs. This bill addresses those specific concerns in a very straightforward manner by having the state cover those costs of police body-worn cameras. I'm gonna tell you just a quick story of, of instances of, of conversations I've had with some of our members. Um, there have been instances where police departments have, have actually allocated funds for the purchase of uh, body-worn cameras for their officers, but have not done so uh, because of the, um, uh, the ongoing costs associated with storage. And uh, while they have the funds available for the purchase and acquisition of those cameras, they do not uh, have the funds allocated for the ongoing storage, which of course is a, a major component of this discussion. Um, other members that currently have body camera programs have talked about the sticker shock uh, when they go to their vendor to renegotiate contracts that are uh, uh, getting close to their expiration date. These are just a couple examples um, of, of ongoing cost concerns uh, within our membership. At this point, I'd like to offer MML's assistance in crafting a way to provide some level of funding assistance to police agencies as they embark 
or continue on the implementation of body-worn cameras within their police agency. Um, it seems to be a, a thread that has kind of uh, tied together these um, several bills on uh, police-worn body cameras. So with that, um, MML offers their support and asks for a favorable report on House Bill 1207. Adam Rybzinski. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Adam Rybczynski representing the city of Havre Grace. The city supports House Bill 1207. House Bill 1207 would require the state to cover all the costs and expenses related to the procurement and use of body cameras. The city of Havre Grace has implemented a body camera program and believes that body cameras are an essential tool for law enforcement officers. The city has also hired one full-time employee dedicated to the management of body camera footage. However, the use of body cameras comes with a cost that places a large financial burden on local governments. In the next fiscal year, the city anticipates it will spend over $57,000 in expenses associated with the use of body-worn cameras, and this does not include salaries or benefits. The city of Havre Grace requests the committee give HB 1207 a favorable report. Thank you very much. Are there questions for this panel, either from the Judiciary Committee or from our friends from the Appropriations Committee? Any questions? Okay. Well. And that concludes the testimony for House Bill 1207. We thank you all very much for your testimony today. We are still waiting for uh, the Attorney General, and it may be that we're waiting for a little bit of time, so we're going to keep going. We're going to House Bill, and I think this is why Delegate Weibel is here. Oh, wait, uh, did I miss a question? Oh, they're gone. I'm sorry. I tried. Um, we are going to go to House Bill 1042, and, and this is Delegate Weibel. We'll hear from, uh, okay, we'll hear from Delegate Weibel, and then we'll hear from uh, uh, David Morris from the Chiefs and Sheriffs. We'll hear from Delegate Weibel for three minutes and uh, go from there, right? Delegate Weibel on behalf of the Washington County Delegation. Thank you, Chairman Clippinger. It's good to be with you and the honorable members of the Judiciary Committee this afternoon. On behalf of the Washington County Delegation, I am pleased to present House Bill 1042, which seeks to protect the privacy of our law enforcement officials. As you are aware, police reform passed in the 2021 legislative session declared that records relating to administrative or criminal investigation of misconduct by a police officer, including internal affairs, hearing and disciplinary decision records are not personnel records, and therefore subject to the Freedom of Information Act request. One exception was created for records of a technical infraction. This bill adds an additional exception for administrative or criminal investigation records if the investigation determined that the complaint of misconduct was unfounded. In this case, the record would remain a personnel record and therefore remain confidential. The issue was brought to the Washington County delegation by our sheriff, and we believe that it is appropriate to be a statewide bill. And on behalf of the Washington County delegation, I ask for a favorable report and thank you. Let's hear from David Morris, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, David Morris speaking as the co-chair of the Maryland Chiefs of Police and Maryland Sheriff's Association's Legislative Committee in support of House Bill 1042 with amendments. The Maryland Chiefs and Maryland Sheriffs have repeatedly been at the table offering reasonable middle of the road measures to provide for the release of certain records of alleged police misconduct. In 2020, the Maryland Chiefs and Maryland Sheriffs offered testimony in support of House Bill 1221. That bill sought to enhance law enforcement transparency and accountability by providing access to personnel investigative records relating to complaints involving the discharge of a firearm, use of force resulting in serious bodily injury, and sustained investigatory findings of complaints involving an officer's integrity. Those incidents of the most egregious nature and, and of significant public interest. Last year, the General Assembly passed Senate Bill 178 related to inspections of records pertaining to alleged misconduct. 
while defining technical infractions as protecting certain records, the bill still, still created a wholesale release of most records, including those in which the investigation revealed that the allegations were unfounded, meaning that the acts for which the law enforcement officer was accused did not occur, as well as those cases in which the law enforcement officer is exonerated, meaning that the law enforcement officer's actions were lawful and justified. This bill would still permit the release of those cases in which the investigation in which allegations of misconduct by a law enforcement officer is sustained. It would, however, classify as personnel records and not subject to MPIA the investigations that are unfounded or exonerated. Law enforcement is the only classification employee whose disciplinary records are subject to indiscriminate release and public scrutiny. The Maryland Chiefs and Maryland Sheriffs believe that House Bill 1042 represents a reasonable and common sense approach for providing access to information regarding law enforcement complaints, improving transparency and accountability. For these reasons, the Chiefs and Sheriffs support House Bill 1042 and urge a favorable committee report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions uh, for this panel? Uh, Delegate Weibel, very, very briefly, this is not a local bill, correct? This is... It's, that's correct, it's a statewide bill. The statewide bill, it's just, somewhat odd that it was a delegation bill. I mean, not unusual that members of the delegation would all co-sponsor a bill, but, but uh, just to be clear for the committee, this is not a local bill. It's a statewide, has a statewide impact. All right, are there questions? Further questions? All right, uh, we have one person speaking in opposition, so we'll hear from them then. Thank you both very much. We'll hear from Debbie, Debbie Levy for two minutes, please. Maybe Levy. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon again, Debbie Katz Levy from the Office of the Public Defender. Chairman Clippinger, I've already sent you the report. Hopefully, you have that and can circulate. I'm going to read again from the report by uh, the Steptoe Report, studying Baltimore Police Department. As a litigator who focuses on disclosing internal affairs records, I can assure you that this bill is an incredibly dangerous end run around the progress that this body passed last year. To read from the report, so I can tell you from my own experience that officers investigating officers for misconduct, just like if you were investigating your colleagues for misconduct there, find it difficult to hold their counterparts accountable. Um, I didn't just say so though, the report that was completely independent says the internal affairs unit was reviled and distrusted by the BPD rank and file, and as a result had great difficulty recruiting and retaining capable investigators. Police department members are reluctant to report their colleagues to IA and those who do are labeled as being a snitch, but in cases that do go to trial boards, the outcomes are frequently contrary to the evidence and favored the accused officer. Officer, and, and I, I am quoting that outcomes are frequently contrary to the evidence and favor the accused officer. Members of the trial board frequently misunderstand or claim to misunderstand the preponderance of the evidence standard they're required to apply or they simply ignore it. Many members believe the outcome of trial boards depended more on who you know than what you did. Simply put, the program that existed to deter, detect, and punish misconduct lacked credibility and in both internal and external legitimacy. So to set aside all the progress that happened last year and say, you can call it unfounded, and then we will house it as a personnel record and not disclose it is simply an end run around the mandate that this legislature passed last year that the citizens of Maryland so desperately needed, and it would be a complete disrespect to the progress that happened last year. I strongly urge an unfavorable report. Questions for this witness, Delegate Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Levy. Um, real quickly, uh, two questions. Number one, are these complaints uh, filed in a sworn fashion? In other words, uh, the complainant, uh, do they still have to swear under oath? And the answer is no. 
And then uh, that's a concern, obviously, because uh, the second question uh, kind of presents that concern to me in that an individual who has been arrested and is sitting in jail can file unsworn allegations of a complaint and put those in the files. And then the end result is, although we all know they're unfounded and they are deemed unfounded, um, they still can be doxxed on the internet. That officer can be doxxed on the internet with those unfounded complaints. Isn't that the way it works right now? I mean, I think that's the same way a statement of charges that anybody could file or file a civil lawsuit. Folks have the right to, to, to say whatever they want against anybody at any time, and that will continue to exist regardless of what actions the legislature takes. Well, uh, actually, if you file a statement, if, if you file charges with the district court commissioner, you, ha you have to sign them under oath. And if you, you, if you lie, then you're subject to uh, investigation for a misdemeanor um, perjury. But not to file a civil lawsuit or even a 1983 action. So there's other ways that folks can exercise their rights. But if the concern is, to, to, from our perspective, is a judge is still a gatekeeper on admissibility in a, in a trial. So even if that parade of horribles were to happen and somebody in jail actually somehow has access to make a complaint and then put it on the internet, even though they're incarcerated, which they don't have access to the internet, so if that goes out into the universe, that's not going to come into trial if it's an if it's if if there's no evidence to support it, the judge is still the gatekeeper. Now, the Court of Appeals in a unanimous decision, Fields versus State, has already said that for admissibility, it does not turn on the outcome of the complaint. So that means if an officer commits theft, and we have documented instances where officers will change the outcome. Officers will plea bargain outcomes away. This is all talked about last year. And this is why the legislation, I think, passed the way that it did. Because the outcome of the complaint is not as important as the substance of the complaint, at least for the criminal defendant. So an officer is accused of theft, evidence planting. I do not want to rely on their fellow colleague who was just yesterday having their back in a SWAT team raid who's decided it's unfounded. I'm going to go interview that witness myself and the judge is going to be the gatekeeper on admissibility. And if there's nothing there, if it's unfounded, then what are they afraid of? If well, there's nothing there and it's unfounded, there's nothing for them to be afraid of. But we want this for transparency, for sunlight, to root out misconduct and to step back now would be to wipe out that progress. And I would posit to this group that every time we- Miss Levy. Forward, I, I just real quick follow up, though, that you, you said that a civil rights complaint doesn't have to be under oath, but this isn't that. In fact, it's a it's a quasi criminal proceeding and police officers are subjected to that based upon, uh, you know, on these unfounded allegations. We're not, we're not talking about situations where there's credible allegations of evidence planting. I mean, that's certainly I would think um, falls into the category of verification and as you in, as you point out, um, judicial discretion. But we're talking about a quasi criminal proceeding against an officer being able to then be doxed before a determination is made. So right? I, I guess unless you have statistics or experience, I have more cases where complaints that were legitimate, for example, the gun trace task force complaints that came back unfounded and turned out to be true. I have more examples of that happening. And most respectfully, Delegate Cox, absolutely none of the circumstances that you're presenting happening. I have found no officer, a public servant, going home in complete disrespect because somebody took out an unfounded complaint against them. I haven't seen one instance where that's happened, but I've seen hundreds of people go through a criminal proceeding without a document properly closed that should have been. And that should be the harm that we are striking to prevent, not the officer who is worried about something that they didn't do going out into the universe of the internet. I mean, obviously if that were the case, then that I'm a public servant as a public defender. People can take out grievances against me if they like and I defend against them. This kind of thing happens when people put themselves in the public. But what we have to be concerned about is the harm that will fall if we let internal officers change everything to unfounded so they don't disclose it. I guess bring to me, although I'm not voting, but bring to me a legitimate circumstance where what you're presenting happened. But I can bring to you hundreds of prosecutions that happened where documents were not turned over that showed legitimate 
findings, legitimate circumstances that should have been disclosed. And until we fix it, we shouldn't be walking backwards. Well, I, I think, and I, I, I respect that, but I think that the reason for the legislation today is because of a massive change that occurred last year. And so I've, I've received the same concerns from uh, the FOP and from uh, sheriff's departments all over Maryland that have been receiving huge numbers of MPIAs that are uh, scraping for these unfounded allegations. And so it's a, it's a, it's a present issue that didn't necessarily exist prior to last year's law, law being passed. But, but thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll just Mr. say- Mr. Chair, may I please thank respectfully you. respond to that last statement, please? Briefly, yes. Briefly, because I have authored the MPIA requests around the state for the documents that Anton's law was supposed to expose or make public. And I can tell you as an officer of the court that Washington County has not yet delivered all of the documents that we've requested. And neither have most of the counties around the state. And we have not gotten where we were supposed to be in Anton's law. And until we get there, we ought not to be dialing it back. Delegate Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Levy, for your um, for your expertise. It, it's um, it's refreshing. I, I will tell you that when I first heard the description of the bill, the first thing I thought was that this was an end round uh, end run around Anton's law. So um, I appreciate um, your input. My question is: um, there seems to be an argument that police officers don't like MPIA, and that hasn't been my experience. What does what does the um, the, the the test, the results of your of your studies show? Well, I will say that when I have developed close relationships with with people who are in charge of internal affairs, with officers who are working hard and doing well to protect the community, they want these officers rooted out of their forces. They want to encourage review and disclosure. And that has been my legitimate experience, even in Baltimore. Um, and I'm proud of the officers who we're seeing through these requests, who are reporting other officers for racially profiled policing, for reckless policing, for disregard of truth. We are seeing this start to happen and to change. So I can only respond anecdotally that I'm seeing officers who are, who are grateful, who are saying, thank you. I know that in the past, uh, uh, chairs of IAD departments have had trouble with bad officers being absorbed back into the system, and they would like to see these officers rooted out as well. So we want to help these officers who are positive, who are doing the right thing, who are working for change in their department to make their jobs easier, and this will help move that along. I will also say that um, it, it, the other thing that we're seeing in a huge barrier to success in Anton's law is tremendous fee requests. From Montgomery County, we got over a $300,000 fee request. From Calvert County, over a $200,000 fee request. And this is not for all IAD files. This is just for identified IAD files. And so we are seeing lots of chipping away that is making these, non -pub these public documents non-public. And I would really caution this division, this unit to get farther out down the path until we start looking at ways, if ever, to dial back transparency. We have not gotten there yet. Delegate Eric Han. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Levy, thanks for being here. Can you tell me what, what kind of actual um, files are you applying for? You said Washington County hadn't given everything back. I mean, I thought that the bill I mean, the original uh, law uh, allowed for administrative complaints, those kind of things. I mean, criminal complaints are different, correct? That's not what you're trying to get access to. Those are already public. No, so we are making, re they are supposed to be public under Anton's law. We're making requests for internal affairs investigations related to specific officers. We don't like shoot, we're not, you know, just fishing for information. If, if an officer is on a do not call list, if an officer is the subject of a 1983 action that they lost, if an officer has killed a civilian with their patrol vehicle, if an officer has been the subject of some kind of lawsuit, if even if the officer and some do uh, have, have, have alarming content in their social media, um, if we see this kind of thing, then we'll put in a request for the documents. Most agencies are coming back saying, this is going to be a huge expense for us. Can we summarize the information for you? This Can we give you the, and, and, and lots of agencies have done that for us. And we have found 
scores of officers who were disciplined for um, untruthful conduct or who were terminated in lieu of discipline for untruthful conduct. And so folks may, and I can show you all of the responses that we've gotten where officers will be, will, will decide to leave an agency rather than accept their termination, which then could result in unfounded and we wouldn't know. And then they go to perhaps your count, your jurisdiction to engage in policing. So this is why transparency is so important. Um, and, and we're all, so those are the, the documents that we're trying to collect, things that we believe should have been disclosed previously. Um, and we're surprised at how much information we are getting, even in the form of summaries. And it is alarming that folks are leaving one jurisdiction to go to the other um, in, lieu of, in, in lieu of discipline they'll take. So that means that uh, it, it could remain unfounded because they've agreed, they've plea bargained, will leave, and then they'll go to Montgomery County, PG County, Calvert County, Harford County, and the discipline doesn't follow them because they got away before it was imposed by way of agreement. Interesting. And so could you, do you have do, so documents that, yes, how often this happens, who they are, who the officers are, is, is this published somewhere? So it should be published somewhere. And, and we've actually created an entire division in the public defender's office to help track officers who engage in misconduct and go from one jurisdiction to the other. And candidly, I'll tell you that we are doing our best to collect this public information so that we can make sure it's properly disseminated to criminal defendants. Um, and ultimately, as sure, it, it should be um, disclosable to everybody because it's public. Um, so but I, do, I could give you the responses that we've gotten. For example, a chart we got from Montgomery County, a chart we have from St. Mary's County. We have document, I'm happy to share that with you because the beauty of it is it came by way of a PIA request and now it's public. So you can- right. if you like. So, so there's like a hand, are there five or 10 or 20 of these officers who were disciplined more. that more than, you've seen more than that, that were disciplined in other jurisdictions and just applied for jobs elsewhere? Or, or would leave in lieu of discipline. Let me let me not give you a count until I, I can break and go and tabulate for you, but a, enough to be significant, to be jarring, to be concerning. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Delegate Tolls, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a statement for Ms. Levy. Um, thank you so much for being here and for providing um, such passionate remarks, just one little favor for me. I noticed that you mentioned the other counties and their four counties. Could you please, as you um, continue to provide remarks, mention Prince George's as Prince George's County, as you do the other jurisdictions? We just have a thing in Prince George's where we like to say Prince George's instead of PG. I apologize. I grew up no right words. in Montgomery County and Prince George's County. So I mean, no disrespect. Oh, I know. I, know. No, I, I apologize. apologize. Thank you so much. I was taking it. I was like, oh, let me just say something. I would be remiss if I did not. So thank you so much for understanding. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there further questions for this panel? All right. Seeing none, thank you very much. That'll conclude the testimony for House Bill 1042. I believe we are still waiting for the Attorney General's bill from across the street. So we're going to go now to uh, Delegate, uh, Delegate Stephanie Smith and House Bill 991. There are quite a few witnesses. So we're going to call uh, Delegate Smith, Chris Apple, Tierra Hawks, Toby Ditz, Davon Love. We'll stop there and then we'll go to the next panel. So uh, Delegate Smith, go ahead for three minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Delegate Stephanie Smith, and I'm here to present House Bill 991. Um, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of Judiciary. Um, I don't want to take too much time because you do have many um, witnesses coming after me, so I'll summarize um, this point. Um, the Civilian Review Board in Baltimore City that was established in 1999 has limited um, investigatory powers as well as limited disciplinary powers. Um, it was um, replacing non-existent or very minimal oversight in 1999. But last year, um, House Bill 670 created police accountability boards in every jurisdiction. However, Baltimore City was a 
jurisdiction that not only is presently under a federal consent decree for unconstitutional policing from the Baltimore Police Department, but also has a legacy of um, concern about police overreach, um, uh, misconduct, and abuse. As such, I think it's important that um, the citizens of Baltimore feel that the police um, the citizen-based accountability and oversight provided to them is not just the minimum, but really adequate for the challenges we have faced in our city. As many of you all know, Baltimore City has had persistently high homicide rates. And in many ways, there is an, uh, a caution from residents to participate and navigate um, investigations with the police because of that broken relationship. Any effort to improve the residents' accountability of their police department is directly related to public safety. Because when we have residents and citizens that can distinguish their police force from a common criminal, it will um, it will strengthen their resolve to be in cooperation and collaboration with investigations, and that will ultimately lead to getting those bad actors off the streets. We have an array of witnesses that will testify to the importance of ensuring that the Civilian Review Board has expanded investigatory powers, the resources to carry them out, and expanded opportunities for those to actually report um, victimization beyond the year um, statute of limitations that currently exists. So I want to give more time for the speakers to provide additional context um, to our demand for House Bill 991 to be given careful consideration and, ho and hopefully um, a positive report from this um, from this body. But I do want to flag that um, there are ongoing negotiations that will be continuing today with the Senate crossfile and myself as well as the City of Baltimore to see if there are any, um, 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 any amendments that we can arrive on um, together. So I do want to plug that as something to keep in mind as you hear the rest of the presentations today. And with that said, I respect um, this body and, and love an opportunity to come before you and do hope that you'll give House Bill 991 your most thoughtful and careful consideration. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Chris Apple now, please, for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, committee members, good afternoon. I am Chris Apple, a resident of Columbia, Maryland. I think the Civilian Review Board is the best option for meeting the legal mandate of a police accountability board in Baltimore. I had the opportunity to hear a member of the CRB speak at a meeting recently. They were very passionate about their work. They seemed to really care about the communities they served. They also have a lot of experience. The CRB has been in existence for over 20 years. It has existing relationships with the community and the community is used to working with them, which I think makes them a huge asset. Adding the powers of the PAB would be a natural extension of the work they already do. A separate entity would have to build those community relationships from scratch. It would require more runway and spin up time. As a brand new organization, it would have to figure out its own operating procedures and best practices. It would create a lot of duplication, which might also mean inefficiencies and cost. Allowing the CRB to take on those roles would ensure the most efficient solution, and I believe they are a great organization to empower with those additional capabilities. I think this win is a, win, a bill is a win-win for Maryland, and I urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. Tierra Hawks, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Chair and members of this committee. My name is Tierra Hawks, and I'm the Chairwoman of the Civilian Review Board. Um, the Civilian Review Board is the only entity in the city that can investigate complaints of police misconduct and provides a neutral and safe space for citizens for where they can make complaints of police misconduct. Since I joined the board over two years ago, the CRB has been ridiculed for its limited power and jurisdiction because we're only limited to the five allegations. Um, our lack of resources, we lack funding and outreach tools and other advancements to be an effective player. And third, that even with our investigatory power, we have little influence on the disciplinary process. We don't have proper training or knowledge to issue disciplines on the BPD, and we have little effect on community policing and, and whole. Um, despite these limitations, the CRB has operated with what we have, and what we have done is investigated hundreds of police misconduct cases and issued disciplinary recommendations stemming from complaints submitted by citizens of Baltimore City. To replace the CRB would be a disjustice to citizens of Baltimore City and a step backwards in police oversight in Maryland. What we know is that strong independent civilian oversight of police misconduct is fundamental to safe communities and effective policing. The CRB can't be ignored as we are a key stakeholder in the consent decree and we are able ent able entity in the policing business that strives to create a transparent relationship 
and an accountable police department in Baltimore City. The CRB has a has a role in a strong infrastructure of systems and people involved with institutional knowledge and experience in policing. So we should expand it, we should empower it, we should uplift the CRB by reconciling it with the Maryland Police Accountability Act of 2021 to ensure that the CRB's current structure and authority remains intact while empowering the CRB with additional powers and scope of the Police Accountability Board. Thank you for your time and I'm hoping for a favorable report for House Bill 991. Thank you. Toby Ditz, please, for two minutes. Oh, thank you so much for the, oops. There we go. Thank you so much for the opportunity and to Delegate Smith for sponsoring the bill. I'm Toby Dietz, longtime Baltimorean, testifying in support of HB 991 on behalf of Jews United for Justice, and it's more than 6,000 members throughout the state. The bill authorizes the city's existing civilian review board to require to basically acquire all the powers of the new police accountability boards that you mandated last year. And the main goal here is really to consolidate the powers of community oversight in a single board and to do that now, because otherwise we're just dispersing and weakening those powers. I know that's not what you intended when you passed HB 670. It's also real inefficient and as someone said, wastes money. And I also think that the, the approach we have here in HB 991 supports the spirit of your reforms, which what you did was establish a statewide kind of baseline for us, guardrail for local jurisdiction in this post Leobor era, but you meant for these jurisdictions to flesh out the framework you provided. And that's what HB 991 allows Baltimoreans to do by building on the advantages of the review board. Um, and just think about it, local reformers, because they recognize the burdens of bias and corrupt policing on Black Baltimoreans, we worked really hard to get that civilian review board in the first place. And it, it's, of course, it's a work of progress, but it embodies innovations that we Baltimoreans already said we want, powers of investigation, all civilian membership from every part of the city, so the basic idea here is let's not start at, from scratch, continuation legislation that's going to make our existing board stronger by giving it the powers, all the powers of the PABs and enough resources and autonomy to give us the strong oversight we really need here in Baltimore. So JUFJ respect, respectfully urges a favorable report on HB 991. Thanks again. Avon Love, please, for two minutes. Greetings, Chair Committee. This is Davon Love, Director of Public Policy, Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Last year, when the Maryland General Assembly passed HB 670, it required the establishment of police accountability boards in every jurisdiction, which would serve as the container for the community to make complaints about police misconduct. And the legitimate oversight by the legislature were, were in the case where jurisdictions had existing oversight entities. And in the state of Maryland, it's Prince George's County and Baltimore City. As was mentioned before, Baltimore City established a civilian review board in 1999 with the attempt to get civilian oversight with investigatory and disciplinary powers. While the, civilian, while the civilian review board did not accomplish during that period of time getting the maximum amount of powers that it wanted, it does have limited subpoena um, and investigatory powers. What HB um, 991 attempts to do is essentially reconcile the duplicative nature of establishing a police accountability board um, in Baltimore City while having um, an existing CRB. So that's essentially what it hopes to do while additionally moving the CRB in the direction of community oversight. What I wanna do now, um, and it's also important to note that Baltimore City's uh, police department is technically a state agency. So that's why the Civilian Review Board was created through state legislation in 99. What I wanna do now though is, is, is talk briefly about what the city will say in its opposition um, so that you can direct some questions to them in, in, to, the, to this effect. One is, is that the city will say that instead of going to the state to address police accountability, we'd rather do it locally. The problem, as I just mentioned, is that Baltimore City's police department is technically a state agency. So it has to go to the state. HB 670 only gives local jurisdictions the ability to determine how those police accountability boards are populated, not it, to give it additional powers and responsibilities. And so, so, the, the, so HB 670 does not give a, a, the level of flexibility the city will describe. Additionally, what the city has said on the record that they will do is that they will establish a police accountability board 
and having to have in operation the CRB and the PAB and then eventually repeal the CRB. That means two things. One, it means that you'll have two duplicative entities existing at the same time. And secondly, what it means is that those subpoena powers and, and investigatory powers would be lost, which means that we would be going in the opposite direction of community oversight. And so I hope you, and we're willing to negotiate on the budget piece, which is another part the city will bring up. So I hope you address this and some of your questions to the city and their opposition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions for this panel? Questions for the panel? All right, seeing none, we thank you all very much. Zainab Chowdhury, Matt Parsons, Debbie Levy, Yolanda Martinez and Yannette Emanuel, please, for two minutes each. Zainab Chowdhury. I'm establishing a police for two minutes, please, and please turn off your. Uh, yeah, so it looks like you've turned off your YouTube link. That's fine. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Chair Clippinger. Thank you for bearing with me as I figured out how to unmute myself. Um, and dear Chair Clippinger, members of the House Judiciary Committee, on behalf of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, I thank you for this opportunity to testify in strong support of House Bill 991, sponsored by Delegate Stephanie Smith. CARE is America's largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. My organization is part of the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability, a large diverse statewide coalition of over 100 organizations that are united in seeking meaningful police reform. It includes civil rights activists, religious leaders, legal experts and advocates for a whole host of groups representing communities who are disproportionately over policed and impacted by harmful policing practices. Police reform measures passed last year by this body mandate that each Maryland County, as you know, form a police accountability board that provides oversight over police departments in their respective jurisdictions. 22 years ago in 1999, the Maryland General Assembly voted to establish Baltimore City's Civilian Review Board after years of advocacy to address concerns around police violence. As someone who was born and raised in the west, side, west part of Baltimore, I have myself personally witnessed firsthand the impact of police violence on our communities. This board was tasked with processing and handling complaints alleging the use of excessive force by police, among other forms of misconduct. The CRB has the authority to investigate complaints, as you know, and issue subpoenas. It also reviews police department procedures and makes recommendations to Baltimore's police commissioner. While the responsibilities and functions of the Baltimore City CRB as established in the 1999 statute largely encompass those required of newly mandated police accountability boards, PABs have greater oversight over broader categories of complaints. They have more opportunities to weigh in on disciplinary processes, and they have access to more expansive funding. This bill would essentially ensure that the city's CRB structure and authority remains intact while empowering and funding it to match the scope of PABs mandated by the Maryland Police Accountability Act. We support this bill and respectfully urge a favorable vote. Thank you for your consideration. Matt Parsons, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Matt Parsons. I am with Baltimore Action Legal Team. It is settled law that the Baltimore Civilian Review Board is an independent agency. This was established by the Court of Special Appeals over 15 years ago in 2006. In Wilbin v. Hunsicker, I quote, the CRB is not an agency of the mayor and city council of Baltimore City or the BPD. It is an independent entity created by the General Assembly. As an independent agency then, the CRB has the legal ability to sue and be sued as well as retain independent legal counsel. HB 991 would affirm this essential legal ability. And despite that, the city solicitor's office opposes the bill because in its view, the, C the CRB is allegedly not a legal entity which can contract for independent counsel. Um, however, um, this view that the CRB is a department within the mayor's office is simply incorrect. Um, currently, a conflict of interest exists where the city solicitor provides legal counsel for both the Baltimore Police Department and the CRB, even as the review board is meant to hold the BPD accountable for misconduct. On its face, um, the Maryland attorney's rules of professional conduct state, an attorney shall not represent a client if the representation involves a conflict of interest. A conflict of interest exists if the representation of one client will, will be directly adverse to another client. Um, but even practically speaking, 
this conflict is directly adverse to the CRB members uh, and the agency as a whole. The city solicitor's office regularly defer to the interests of the BPD against the interest of the CRB, um, whose members consistently complain they don't receive citizen complaints at all or on time. Uh, in the past, the, city, the solicitor's office has ordered the BPD not to send complaints against officers to the CRB. The solicitor has also pressured CRB members to sign a confidentiality agreement to protect the BPD's reputation, but members who exercised their rights and refused to sign were rejected access to complaints against officers. Additionally, according to the Baltimore Sun, between 2013 and 2015, the BPD failed to forward to the CRB over two thirds of police misconduct complaints received at their station. Mr. Parsons, please begin to wrap up. Yes. Um, as long as the CRB remains under the legal counsel of the city solicitor, misconduct such as this will continue to happen that will prevent it from fulfilling its mandate. We urge a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deborah Levy, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Klippinger. I'll be brief. I incorporate the comments of my fellow panelists, but I will also add a few things. As my colleague Crystal Williams told you at the beginning of today's hearing, there are two types of bills um, that relate to policing. One is experts asking for some fine tuning. Um, and the other is folks who are pushing back. And this is just like the Attorney General's bill that we'll hear soon, it's over in the Senate right now. This is another bill to perfect something that we need um, to iron out with the experts who are doing it. The CRB members are experts in their field. They've been doing it. They need, we don't need the duplicity of the uh, PAB and the Civilian Review Board. And most importantly, the goodwill that the CRB has in the community. I can tell you as a public defender in Baltimore, folks need to be able to go to the CRB to lodge complaints. That needs to be an effective body and they need to have the powers appropriate with the PAB. They are the experts who've been doing it. And it's important that they remain with the same power and absorb all of the authority of the PAB. We urge a favorable result. Yolanda Martinez, please, for two minutes. Señora Yolanda, ya puede comenzar a dar su testimonio. Sí, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. Mi nombre es Yolanda Martinez. Soy original de México y llevo 24 años aquí en la ciudad de Baltimore. Se ha convertido en mi hogar para mí y mis hijos. My name is Yolanda Martinez and I'm an immigrant from Mexico, a mother of four, and I've been living in Baltimore for the past 24 years. Soy un miembro orgulloso de casa, la organización más grande dirigida por sus miembros de lucha por las familias inmigrantes y de clase trabajadoras en la región de Atlántico Medio. CASA es una orgullosa organización de miembros del CGCG y MCGPA. I am a proud member of CASA, the largest um, organization um, led by members in the Mid-Atlantic region. CASA is a proud member of a coalition, CJSJ and MCJPA. En el 2017, hubo Una experiencia aterradora con mi hijo, amenazado y golpeado fuertemente en la escuela. Yo estaba autorizada y me puse en contacto con los administradores de la escuela y la policía para que me ayudaran a ese momento difícil para mí y mi familia. Pero en vez de ayudarme, los oficiales rechazaron a mi hijo de criminal y no trataron con mucho racismo. No pensaba que lo que estaba pasando era por la barrera del lenguaje y busqué una, una persona que hablaba bien el inglés para tra traducirme. Eso no sirvió de nada. La policía nos ayudó y luego no nos ayudó y luego haber tomado el, re el reporte de oficial no nos quisieron dar una copia del reporte para nosotros tener un, una prueba de que hicimos el reporte. 
In 2017, I had a horrifying experience. My son was threatened and beaten at school. Terrified, I contacted the local police department in Baltimore City and the school administrators to help me out um, with the situation. But instead of helping me, the officer branded my son as a criminal and, and treated him with much racism. The police didn't help us. After having taken the police report, they refused to give us um, a copy of the report so that we could keep record and follow up. Without that copy of the report or a report number, it was impossible, impossible for me to follow up with the officer leading the case or what happened with the situation. Nunca supimos qué pasó de ese reporte de la policía y sin el reporte se me hizo imposible en el momento hacer seguimiento del caso. We just weren't able to follow up on the case and we'd never find out what happened. Similar a la experiencia de mi familia, escuchó muchas historias de amigos, vecinos y otras madres que describían sus interacciones, miedos y responsabilización hacia la policía debido a la constante mala conducta y traudularidad a pesar de, de que Baltimore es una ciudad acogedora y tiene una policía que prohíben que el, P, el PPD colabore con ICE. Todavía tenemos oficiales que no siguen las políticas y cometen malas conductas cru, crueles que han estado tanto problemas relacionados con ICE a las familias inmigrantes. Similar to that. Similar to my family's experience, I hear many stories from my friends, neighbor, and volunteering groups that I participate in. Fear and mistrust of the police department due to ongoing misconduct and brutality. Despite Baltimore being a welcoming city, city and having um, policies that forbid um, Baltimore City Police Department from collaborating with ICE, we still see officers who do not follow those policies and commit crucial misconduct that can cause many escalating ICE-related issues for immigrant families. I'm going to need her to wrap up, please. Okay, un poquito más rápido. Como la cuenta de una madre inmigrante de tres hijos, de, el Baltimore quiso del 2019 llamó al 911 después de que la robaran su automóvil en la entrada de su, de su casa solo para terminar huyendo de su casa y escondiéndose después de, le, de escuchar al oficial de la policía llamar a migración. Ok, dígalo todo. Yo creo que la reunión hace mucha fuerza y por eso yo y los miembros de casa seguimos siendo parte de esta lucha, apoyándonos este proyecto de ley, ya que fortalecerá la responsabilidad de la policía al fortalecer nuestra Junta de Revisión Civil. El fortalecimiento de la Junta de Revisión naturalmente levantará a muchos más. I'm sorry. Miembros... I'm going to need her to begin to wrap up right now. Okay, I'm going to translate everything that she said really quick. Like an immigrant mother of three in South Baltimore who in 2019 called 911 after having her, her car stolen from the driveway just to end up fleeing her home afterwards because the police officer they arrived at the location um, called ICE. I believe that there is a strength in unity and I'm here today as just one of many, many CASA members um, who have gone through a difficult situation like this one. We already have a review board that we trust and we just hope that you can um, work with this review board to empower community members to be actually able to file complaints of misconduct. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now hear from Yannette Man Emanuel now for two minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Klippinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Yonetta Emanuel, Interim Public Policy Director with the ACLU of Maryland. The ACLU and the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability strongly support HB 991. As you've heard, the CRB was established in 1999 after decades of relentless advocacy um, from community members and civil rights organizations calling for community oversight over police misconduct. Since then, the board has conducted hundreds of investigations into five allowed categories and has tried its best to highlight its findings where possible. However, since its inception, the CRB has been underfunded and limited in its authority. There are only five categories of misconduct that the CRB can review and investigate, which, include low, which do not include low-level offenses. 
The GTTF report is explicit that most officers that were involved in high level offenses first started by normalizing and not getting disciplined for low level, though significant offense offenses such as misrepresenting facts in court. The police accountability boards, while unable to conduct their own investigations, have access to all misconduct complaints allowing the CRB to absorb this wider reach along with the adequate funding necessary for them to have appropriate investory staffing will be possible through HB 991. Secondly, since its inception, as you've heard, the CRB has had to get legal counsel support from the city, uh, city solicitor's office, um, the same legal counsel that is used to defend BPD against allegations of misconduct. This creates a fundamental conflict of interest and one that has made it extremely difficult for the CRB to ensure their investigations are adequate and their findings are responsibly available to the public. And as Mr. Parsons mentioned earlier, in 2018, the city solicitor's office tried to force the CRB to sign a confidentiality agreement out of concern that their findings would be public and damaging to BPD. The GTF report and the DOJ con consent decree make it clear that this type of inherently limited legal support has made it needlessly difficult for the CRB to hold police accountable, inform the public, and focus on their responsibilities. We know that police cannot police themselves, and like with any other crime, the only deterrent is the likelihood of getting caught and held accountable. Real civilian oversight, given the adequate resources and authority, has the potential to actually hold police accountable for misconduct and deter future um, misconduct from happening. So for the foregoing reasons, the ACLU of Maryland urges this favorable report on HB 991, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions for this panel? Questions for the panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very much. And we'll now hear from Lydia Walter Rodriguez, Darlene Kane, Ray Kelly, and Dave Shepard. Lydia Walter Rodriguez, please. Lydia Walter Rodriguez. Mr. Chair, it looks like she's having some type of audio difficulty. She's connecting. Uh, we'll give her another second. Uh, we'll talk, see if uh, Darlene Kane, Darlene Kane. All right, we see you there for two minutes. Darlene Kane, go ahead, and then we'll hear from others on the list. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. I'm Darlene Kane. I am the president and founder of Mothers on the Move. I'm also a member of CJSJ. I've also been a resident of Baltimore City for 61 years, and I'm the grandmother to Dale Graham, who was shot and killed October 28, 2008, by a Baltimore City police officer. And my organization is for to help mothers and also to teach them about fighting for legislations and changes. I'm here today asking that they have this bill passed today. And um because we need this very badly in Baltimore City. We need changes. And I'm also standing for many families and voices of the lost, who lost their loved ones that are voiceless who are not here able to stand for themselves um, in reference to police brutality. My son was a father, a brother, and a loving son. After my son was killed by BPD, I spent my life working towards police accountability. Today, I thank you for this time and hear my voice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's try Lydia Walter Rodriguez again. Thank you, members of the committee. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead for two minutes. My name is Lydia Walter Rodriguez, and I'm the region director of CASA here in Baltimore and Central Maryland. I'm also a co convener of the Campaign for Justice, Safety, and Jobs the Baltimore-based coalition that includes over 30 community, faith-based, civil rights, and grassroots organizations. CGSJ is part of a larger statewide police accountability coalition, numbering over 100 organizations throughout the state of Maryland. 
both coalitions representing thousands of Marylanders who have stood firmly and united in support of House Bill 991. Just yesterday, over three dozen Baltimore residents, mothers, families who have suffered police misconduct and brutality, activists and policy act advocates stood united in front of City Hall to share their stories and remind the mayor to be inclusive of community voices in this process. The community at large has not heard of any alternative plans from the city's administration, and this is alarming given the de July 1st deadline. H Bill 991 would increase police uh, oversight and accountability in Baltimore. Our city has been plagued by police misconduct and brutality and currently under a consent decree imposed by the Department of Justice in an investigation of Baltimore Police Department that followed the police killing of Freddie Gray and the outcry from our residents demanding justice. HB 991 would unite the existing civilian review board and the police accountability board. Without it, Baltimore City will have two weaker, overlapping and less effective boards. Streaming the CRB through HB 991 will bring about greater police accountability through a more powerful mechanism of civilian oversight and encourage the community to come forward with their accounts of police misconduct. For all of those reasons, CASA and the Campaign for Justice, Safety and Jobs strongly urge a favorable support of House Bill 991. All right. Uh, we don't see Ray Kelly, the committee staff, and then uh, Dave Shepard, please. Dave Shepard for two minutes, please. Dave Shepard. Dave Shepard. Understand he's coming back in. Members of the committee, please be aware that the next bill we will hear is House Bill 638 is going to be the chair of Ways and Means' this bill that will include the Attorney General. So now I think we do have Dave Shepard. Let's see if we have him. Dave Shepard, please. Mr. Shepard. Mr. Shepard. All right, are there questions for this panel? Any questions for this panel? Unfortunately, I think we're gonna have to stop. Questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very much for coming and testifying today. I'm going to go to the one, one person testifying in opposition. That's Chaz Ball, we'll hear from him for two minutes. Um, Mr. Ball, he's coming in. Here for Mr. Ball for two minutes, please. Hello, good afternoon. All right, for two minutes, please. Well, good afternoon. My name is Chaz Ball on behalf of the Maryland State FOP. Um, this, this bill itself, I mean, what the, one of the things that, um, there's a story of uh, Van Halen um, had a rule within, um, in their rider that they always required to have a certain m m not in their bowls and their in their concert. So every time they went to a concert, they knew if that specific little detail wasn't in there, then there would be some issue in the rest of it, that, they, that there wasn't that that full attention to their request. And the 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 MM, the brown MM in, in this bill, and to me is the fact that repeatedly the reference to um, what what functions as the internal affairs section of the Baltimore Police Department um, is referenced as the internal um, investigation division. It hasn't been that in years. Uh, currently, it's the uh, Public Integrity Bureau, and it, it's been that way uh, for some time. And to me, that shows that there hasn't been that attention to detail um, within this bill. More than that, 
as, as everyone's well aware, the, the city of Baltimore and the Baltimore Police Department is under a consent decree. Um, and in this bill, we're talking about $11 million, $11 million of the Baltimore Police Department's budget being allocated to the Civilian Review Board. That's without the input from the city solicitor. That's without the input of the uh, the, the Judge Bradar, who's, who's managing the consent decree. That's without the input of, of citizens of Baltimore to vote on it, to, to have it as a, as a specifically Baltimore-based bill. And that's an allocation of millions of dollars of the police department budget in a time where the city of Baltimore is dealing with, uh, obviously, a, a crime crisis. So to, to allocate $11 million um, to, to the Civilian Review Board, a board that, as I look at the website right now, there's two vacant positions right now um, that, that haven't been filled, um, shows that that, that creates a, a significant issue. That all of the stakeholders Ball, need to be involved in this. And when we're talking about that much of the, the budget of it, the city of Baltimore and the budget of the police department, the, the stakeholders should be more involved in that. Mr. Ball, thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for the witness? All right, seeing none, we thank you all very much for your testimony and that concludes testimony on House Bill 991. Now we're going back now to the chair of uh, Ways and Means. We should have the Attorney General um, with us. I think we do, we do, that's fine. So we'll hear from the Chair of Ways and Means for three minutes. We'll hear from the Attorney General, Deborah Levy and Dana Mulhauser. May I uh, go ahead, Mr. Chair? You ready? For, for three minutes, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I am here in support of House Bill 638 and am asking for your favorable report. And I would be remiss if I did not start by thanking our attorney general uh, who just spent a significant amount of time across the street uh, on this very issue um, and his office for all of their efforts uh, on this piece of legislation. I also wanna thank the committee for all the work that we did together last year uh, in terms of police reform. And when I think about what, 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 we, did, what we accomplished, it was significant, but I'm the type of person I'm always like, Ah, oh, but we didn't do this. There's always more we could we could do. And for me, it was this piece, and it it really eats at me, quite frankly. Um, we passed the independent investigations piece so that police aren't policing themselves. But what we did not do was solve the problem of an independent prosecution when there has been death or serious bodily injury that could have resulted resulted in death that was done by the actions of the police. And that's what this legislation does. And the bill is a little bit different than it was last year. But what it does is like we did with the independent investigations, it says, look, that prosecutions will go to the attorney general's office and they will be first up to prosecute uh, these types of cases. And should they choose not to prosecute, then it will go uh, to your local jurisdiction if they decide uh, to prosecute. Look, there are prosecutors, we all have our prosecutors uh, that we love, who we know would do the right thing. And I'm talking about our local prosecutors, but there are prosecutors who absolutely would not do the right thing. That is why um, the tragic death of Anton Black was so significant uh, to this body. And that's why we passed that legislation in his name, because that prosecutor in Caroline County refused to do uh, the right thing in that instance. And so what we need are independent prosecutor who will take a fresh look and fresh, fresh eyes at this. Someone who does not have uh, a relationship you know, relying on the police, which is what the local prosecutors do. In one instance, they're relying on the police um, uh, to investigate their, their cases and they work closely uh, together. And then we're gonna ask them to rely on those same police. Um, um, I'm sorry, then we're gonna ask them to prosecute those same police. So there's that natural um, um, conflict that exists uh, right there. Um, so all I'm asking for uh, is that this, this body pass out a legislation that would have our prosecutions um, be uniform across our entire state, not just in certain jurisdictions, but uniform across the entire state. 
Um, I also will add, and then I'll wrap up, Mr. Chair, just anecdotally, um, I'm sure you're going to hear uh, from uh, the police folks on this issue. Um, and I just find it interesting that the prosecutors, local prosecutors came in last year and said, hey, yes, we absolutely need independent investigations. They should not investigate uh, themselves. Um, and the police were upset about that um, because the state's attorneys did, did not support their effort to retain those um, investigations. But, but uh, I, I suspect the police are gonna come in opposition to this um, 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 and support the, their local prosecutors. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Um, and I think we should have uniformity across the state. And with that, Mr. Chair and Mr. Thank Vice you. Chair, thank you for your time committee. All right, we'll hear from the Attorney General now, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, thank you, Chair Atterbury, for introducing this uh, bill. Uh, our office supports it. As you probably remember, uh, we did not, we have not taken a position on bills in previous years that would have vested our office with the authority to investigate and or prosecute uh, police involved fatalities. Uh, last year, you, you chose to give us the investigatory uh, function. Uh, it's been going, I think, extremely well, but it makes sense to unify both the investigation and the prosecution. It's a process that is seamless, but for the fact that in Maryland, it's cut in half. And the principle that you relied on last year is the same one that obtains this year. And it was really, I think, encapsulated very well by the US Commission on Civil Rights. They said investigation and prosecution of use of force cases should be made as independent and as public as possible. The agencies investigating and determining whether to move forward with prosecution should not have an ongoing relationship with the department. Um, we think that uh, having a, an investigation and prosecution that is independent will give the public greater confidence. Uh, we, we think that it makes sense to unify those functions in the office of the Attorney General. Um, there are several other provisions of this bill that Dana Mulhauser, who is the chief of our Independent Investigations Division, uh, will uh, explain. They're mostly clarifying. There is one uh, subpoena power, which is, uh, she'll, she'll explain that as well. But the, the central point is, that it makes sense to, to have these functions unified in one place as they were before uh, this bill was passed. And um, it also makes sense to have it in an independent agency. We think the attorney general's office is the right agency for that. And uh, when it's appropriate, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. We'll hear from Dana Mulhauser now for two minutes, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Kleppinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the committee. We are now five months and 12 cases into the existence of the Independent Investigations Division. I feel privileged to lead a team of smart, dedicated lawyers and investigators who specialize in this area of law and who prioritize transparency, thoroughness, and independence. That said, the bill that created our division, like almost every bill, has a few things that need clarifying. The first is the language in the original bill that refers to alleged or potential police-involved deaths. Right now, there is uncertainty over what it means for a death to be alleged or potential. Are we allowed to begin investigating before an individual dies? And who gets to decide that? This bill provides a much needed and certain answer. The bill also provides a mechanism to resolve disputes if law enforcement agencies attempt to interfere with or harm our investigation. Although the vast majority of local agencies have cooperated with and welcomed our investigations, we would be naive and we would be irresponsible if we did not provide some clarification and a remedy if one chose not to do so. Third, this bill provides the ability for the Attorney General's Office to obtain subpoenas in the exact same way that the special prosecutor and the state's attorneys can. Without it, we have to use more cumbersome grand jury subpoenas, which have already delayed several of our investigations. The bill also provides our office with the ability to prosecute without taking that ability away from the state's attorneys. The most important aspect to these cases is independence uh, and independence is what we are asking for. 
Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee. All right, we'll hear from Deborah Levy now for two minutes. Good afternoon, again, members of the committee. As I've told you multiple times today, many of the bills today uh, are addressing prior police reform efforts come into categories. One is to perfect issues that arose with incomplete or um, uh, un, un, un Well, Sleevy. Oh. Hello. Ms. Levy, we lost Miss Levy. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We'll go ahead and start taking questions. Um, she might be coming back in. We'll give just another second. Let's see if she comes back in here in a moment. Uh, but we will start to take questions here in a couple seconds if we... All right, Debbie Levy seems to be back, maybe. Here, I'm here, I apologize. I don't that's, know where I'm, yes, I apologize. Start again for two minutes, that's fine. I apologize. Uh, so I, I was saying to the members of the committee that I've spoken today about bills that incorporate two things. One is to refine um, some finer points from the bills for the reform from last year, and the other are bills that are aimed at pushing back. And I think that this bill incorporates both of those um, because number one, the attorney general's office who's been doing this and, and strange bedfellows, the public defender's office is saying, we think that they're doing it very well. Um, we have really been impressed with Ms. Mulhauser's work, um, her diligence, her, her desire to reach out to the community, to gather information, to be fair in her investigating. Um, and we think that their office should be given the deference to do what they need to do to complete this mandate that the legislature gave them last year. Um, and the other is to be cautious about pushback from jurisdictions who are unwilling to give up the ability to investigate their own. And like I spoke about in um, House Bill 1042, we should be cautious of, invest of police officers investigating themselves. Um, the legislature passed this last year with confidence in the Attorney General's office, and we have absolutely no reason to think they don't deserve absolute deference to do their job and to do it well. We urge a favorable report. All right, we'll take questions for the panel now, and we'll start with Delegate Arakan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, my questions are for the uh, Mr. Attorney General. If you could just go through a little bit about sort of how the current process works. Um, so when you get a call into your office for help for whatever an investigation, who, who do you send out? How many police officers in it? Um, you know, do they collect the evidence? Where is it stored? I'm just trying to understand the whole framework and picture of sort of what does it look like right now? Those are great questions, Delegate Erican. Um, let me give you 30 seconds and then turn it over to Dana Mulhauser because she's the one who runs the operation. Uh, we have nine employees, uh, four attorneys, five investigators. Um, and uh, if we get a call, there is at least an attorney and an investigator that, that goes out. If we, we learn of a police involved fatality, usually there are two or three. Um, sometimes we have four people at the scene. Um, and uh, they commence the investigation. Usually what happens, we, we, have, um, we, we have protocols that uh, Dana has, has set up given to all of the uh, local law enforcement agencies, state attorney's offices. And uh, they have worked uh, very well. We, we have one, uh, maybe a couple of folks who have protested and said, look, you can't, uh, we're, we're going to be primary. If you're in our jurisdiction, we're going to marshal the evidence. We're going to interview the witnesses. That does not work. Um, but in, we have 12 cases. In all of those cases, uh, we've gotten good cooperation from uh, the locals, and things have gone smoothly. Um, let, me, let me ask Dana to fill in there uh, and tell you how it works after, uh, after we get to the scene. Before we get to the scene, the locals usually uh, secure the scene. We get there, commence the investigation. But if Dana could fill in, that'd be great. 
Uh, sure, and that, that covered most of it. So I, I will add that we have a, a very important for us partnership with the Maryland State Police because, you know, obviously the, the Attorney General's office does not have a crime lab. We don't have drones, right? So, so we are uh, very fortunate to have the partnership with the State Police. Uh, and so those folks respond in even greater numbers than we do, and they send out uh, detectives and they send out the crash team and they send out their lab and, and they run the phone line and all of those things so that we are able to respond with a real legitimate full-scale investigative presence from the get-go. And so, so our folks respond, but the state police also uh, respond. And the, the, the one thing I will add about the, these, the protocols that the attorney general referenced is in, in the sort of lead up to all of this in October, we really focused on, we had, we had just meeting after meeting that were so helpful with local law enforcement to sort of say, okay, when you are going to be handing over these investigations for us, what, what are you worried about in the way of evidence being lost? What do we need to think about? What questions do we need to answer so that we could have this turnover be seamless and not have, you know, a, a piece of paper sitting out in the rain and getting washed away because anybody was afraid to, to take it up. And so the, the, the protocols have been worked out collaboratively to work for that. And in practice, that has worked very well. Okay. Can you remind me for the Anton Black um, case that was mentioned, who handled that investigation? So the Anton Black case was before the, our division came into existence and we don't right. have any, any retroactive abilities. And so we didn't right. have any involvement with that. Case. Yeah. Did, was, was, it, was it the local jurisdiction or did the state police get involved? My belief it was, was that it was the state police. Okay. Um, and then uh, in terms of Baltimore City with the consent decree, what kinds of different protocols did you need to apply to them? Because it's just not the same situation um, for that jurisdiction. What are the differences between sort of the protocols for the city and the protocols for everybody else? Sure. So so our core principle in all of this, right, is, is independence. And one of the things that the consent decree does is it already provides a degree of independence and oversight for Baltimore City. Uh, and so that did mean in addition to making sure that they had the ability to comply with that consent decree, which, which is important and making important strides and we didn't want to interfere with also means that some of those independence concerns are a little bit different where they are concerned. And so what, what we did is we set up a, a, a sort of procedure or a protocol where where unlike with other jurisdictions, we do a criminal investigation and they are also doing a criminal investigation. And, and by and large, we are we are working together on that so that you know when interviews happen, it's not us doing an interview and them doing an interview. It is we will sit in the same room. Now, one of the things that was really important to us when we were working out this MOU is the ability to say if we did not believe that their investigation was being independent or did not believe that it was it was adequately distanced or rigorous, we could say, you know, this is ours, you know, we're doing this without you, thank you and, and goodbye. And so we do have that written in uh, and it's important to us that we have that ability. And did you ever do that? Have you done that so far? How many of the 12 cases came from the city? We've had two cases from the city and no, we have, we have not had to do that. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Delegate Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Mr. Attorney General, Ms. Mulhauser, um, and everyone for your testimony. Real, real quick, simple question, Ms. Mulhauser. Um, in the event of a Maryland State Police shooting, um, do you still utilize the same protocols of involving the state police in the investigation, such as the I Leonardtown, the Leonardtown teen shooting, for instance? Um, so I, I appreciate that. We we don't have a shooting in Leonardtown. I don't know whether that was before we started, but we we were obviously aware that this would happen. And so we did create a special protocol uh, specifically for the Maryland State Police. And what that does is it is it divides the uh, the state into regions. And so the Maryland State Police have to use a different region as part of it for their investigative team than the region where this occurs. I mean, I, I will be frank with you, that's not perfect, right? I mean, I would, I would love the state to have a second police force that, that could do that, but there's one state police. And so given the reality that we do need, you know, we, we, we need drones, we need a lab, that was the best solution that we could come up with. And we have had one case involving the Maryland State Police and we did implement those protocols. 
Okay, thank you. Are there further questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very much. And that concludes the testimony from those testifying in favor. We're now going to hear from representatives of the police and the chiefs and sheriffs, and then we'll hear from representatives of the state's attorneys association. So we'll hear from Jack Simpson, Chaz Ball, Sheriff Gaylor from Harford County, and Mike Lewis. If we could hear from them and we'll begin with Sheriff Gaylor. Sheriff Gaylor. Only Chaz and Mike Lewis are here. All right. Well, let's try that then. We'll hear first from Chaz Ball, then we'll hear from Mike Lewis. So Chaz Ball, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon again. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and and honorable members of, of um, the Judiciary Committee. This I'm once again speaking on behalf of the Maryland State FOP, and I'm I'm speaking against this bill. My issue with the bill is it, it provides in some ways a, a, a half measure. The the issue becomes that you have an investigation um, that's that's done by the attorney general's office, but then there's but sort of the potential for dueling results, different results from a local prosecuting agency and the, the state agency, both of which have the ability to either prosecute or decline prosecution. So you could have completely different findings based upon the same facts and, and two prosecution offices that have reports and investigations that come to different conclusions. Beyond that, this division, um, this unit is, is sort of in its infancy. As um, as been, um, Ms. Mulhauser has mentioned, there's been uh, 12 investigations so far across 10 different jurisdictions. At this point, uh, we not one report has been released thus far. And at this point, there hasn't been any findings that there's some issue where a local, a, a local prosecuting agency has decided to have a different result and go against the findings of the attorney general's office. Um, and, and once again, it's um, the, the investigations and I've been been to a couple of these investigations and been part of a couple of these investigations the, the state police have to get involved because we might have something in the middle of the night and, and the investigation itself isn't necessarily the issue, but it's it's ultimately the problem is having those different inconsistent results between the local uh, prosecution office and the, the attorney general's office. So I would I would add, uh, in opposition. Thank you. Mike Lewis, please. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, my name is Mike Lewis. I'm a 37-year veteran of law enforcement, 20 years for the Maryland State Police. I'm currently running for a fifth consecutive four-year term in Wicomico County. I'm also the president of the Maryland State Sheriff's Association. The Maryland Chiefs of Police Association and the Maryland Sheriff's Association are opposed to HB 638. This bill would, A, greatly expand the category of newly enacted notifications required to be made to the Attorney General to include all police-involved incidents with civilian injuries likely to result in death. B, it would require the physical transfer of evidence from pending police criminal investigations to the Attorney General. And C, authorize the Attorney General to obtain virtually unrestricted injunctive relief without factual justification. And D, preempt current prosecutorial authority from a local state's attorney and all police involved incidents that result in civilian deaths or injuries likely to result in deaths. As originally created by the legislature, effective October 1st, 2021, the AG's Independent Investigation Division investigates all alleged or potential police involved deaths of civilians. After investigation, the IID sends its report containing detailed findings and analysis to the state's attorney of the county with jurisdiction over the incident. The IID does not decide whether to prosecute an involved officer and does not bring criminal charges. Rather, the local state attorney retains their customary prosecutorial authority and accountability, like it's always been. Criminal procedure changes proposed by HB 638 have the potential to complicate and interfere with orderly local criminal investigations and prosecutions, certainly the loss of chain of custody of evidence and results in the disruption of critical enforcement activities against serious criminal perpetrators. For these reasons, 
the Maryland Chiefs of Police Association, and the Maryland Sheriff's Association oppose HB 638 and urge an unfavorable report. Sheriff Gaylor, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I would also like to offer my opposition to uh, this bill. Uh, during the last year's session, um, and, and several years past, we've had this discussion on independent investigations, on, on various proposals legislatively, and, and I'm pleased to say that I supported the concept uh, last year, supporting what ultimately passed, uh, although I offered some amendments that weren't included. Uh, I, I do think there's some shortcomings that could be addressed, but overall, I, I do not believe the new bill is needed. The uh, um, bill has passed, what, uh, permitted for a independent investigative investigation by the attorney general on what I uh, assume was a legislatively intended to be a very small scale, allowing for just two or more uh, investigators from the state police and uh, the AG's office and civilian employees, they could employ uh, more on the lines akin to a Department of Justice civil rights investigation and oversight or complete access to the local investigation to ensure that there's nothing nefarious or uh, inappropriate being uh, conducted. My, my issue came up with the implementation after the passage of Senate Bill 600 last year with the uh, protocols issued by the Attorney General that were outside, out the, outside the bounds of the statute. Uh, and, and much of this, other than the state's attorney's piece in, in this new bill, uh, is related to that and is basically, in my opinion, creating a new police department in the state of Maryland um, underneath the Office of the Attorney General. I think the bill as passed last year is workable. I don't believe the new legislation is needed. Uh, and, and I believe we should function within that structure. And, and in the 12 cases, uh, I, I think there have been no issues, although the Attorney General and I have exchanged some correspondence. I've assured him that you know, the Hartford County Sheriff's Office intends to completely cooperate with the uh, Office of the Attorney General on any investigation, should we have one of these. However, it is um, incumbent upon us to, for our citizens to conduct the criminal investigation as well as we always have and would. And this legislation would prevent that usurping the local responsibility of my office. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Man. Thank you, Will. Um, Jack Simpson, I'm guessing Jack Simpson's not. No, he's, he's with me, he can, he'll jump in here. All right, for two minutes. All righty. Uh, Chairman Clipcher, Vice Chairman Moon, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the proposed amendments to the law that established the Internal Investigations Unit, uh, the IIU, within the Office of the Attorney General. I'm Jack Simpson. I've been in law enforcement for almost 38 years. I retired from the Maryland State Police as a major after 28 years. Worked two years as the director of the Vehicle Theft Prevention Council and almost eight years as a major with the Hartford County Sheriff's Office. Uh, nowhere in law does it say that the IAU is the only investigative body of these matters. In fact, if that were the case, which I don't believe was the initial intent, the legislature has in effect created another opportunity to dim the light on transparency. Worse would be to incorporate, as the bill before us calls for, investigation and prosecution into a single body, in effect erasing any hope, meaningful police reform, and putting accountability in question. The job of the IAU is to conduct an investigation another set of eyes, if you will, on potential police-involved deaths of civilians, a parallel investigation. Their work can be independent and it can be joint. The integrity of the investigation and the trust from our communities is at great risk with the current overreach from the Office of the Attorney General. The responses by IIU and MSP are delayed. The search for recovery and recovery of evidence is delayed. Witnesses and information are lost during the delays. Investigations are at risk and citizens are robbed of timely information throughout the investigation. How does this enhance the transparency that was, that was sought, strengthen the public trust, and engage with the community? The work we do, certainly, uh, is often complicated and uncertain, but the kinds of errors that will arise from the OAG's continued uh, overreach that includes this proposed legislation would never happen, uh, and as we as a collective should ensure that it does not happen. Uh, for these reasons, I encourage an unfavorable report and um, thank you so, so much. And Mr. Chairman, and any members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to any questions. Delegate Cox for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you, uh, panelists. 
Uh, I think this one might be best for Sheriff Lewis. Um, uh, I appreciated um, Sheriff Gaylor's comment about this is essentially creating a new PD under the, uh, the Attorney General's office. And so my questions, first of all, is um, does this actually remove, does this, this bill appear to remove Article 4, Section 44, Sheriff's Authority, Constitutional Sheriff's Authority, for the, uh, the policing in each county. In other words, the Constitution of Maryland gives sole authority to the sheriff within the jurisdictions of each county for policing. Does this essentially create, uh, remove that and create a new, uh, a new police force under the Attorney General's office? Sheriff Geller, would you like to answer that first, sir? I kind of believe the delegate directly at you, but I, I, real quick, I, I will offer that I, I do believe it steps on the office of sheriff, just like we've heard from the state's attorneys, at least on the Senate hearing that I was just a part of, that you know, I, the citizens have elected me to office, have elected the sheriffs across the state to office, like our legislators, our delegates, or senators. Um, and they, it's to me, they have the ability to hold accountable in my jurisdiction. It's not the attorney general, and it's certainly not the superintendent of the state police who are actually conducting these investigations. Um, so I, I do believe from that standpoint, uh, it does usurp the authority of the, of the local sheriff and, and the local jurisdiction. Th thank you, Sheriff. And then a uh, quick follow-up um, for e either of you. Uh, in a context, as you heard me ask a question earlier, potentially uh, you heard me, uh, re relating to Maryland State Police-involved shootings, in the context of a sheriff's investigation of that would involve the Maryland State Police, for instance, um, or any other uh, individual, um, law enforcement individual within the jurisdiction of the county, does this seem to create a new secrecy uh, at the AG level? In other words, it would remove evidence that the county would lawfully be required to investigate and put it into the hands of a select few of the attorney general's office? I did not hear your earlier question. I, I certainly believe, you know, that the goal of last year's legislation, although I agree with the independent investigation um, need that uh, I just don't agree with how it's being implemented within the office of the attorney general. Uh, the, the part of the statute that keeps the whole thing a secret really runs afoul of, of any transparency. Uh, and again, this is an area where, although I may not be able to discuss uh, as the sheriff, if we're investigating a case, I may not be able to discuss specific aspects of the case, but citizens can ask me, come and ask me questions, and I'm not limited by the actual wording in the statute that says, um, you know, I, I can't discuss, reassure them uh, that, you know, there's no further threat to the community, the things, you know, those kind of general things. Uh, the Office of Attorney General is actually, by statute, um, or anyone associated with these investigations, by statute is prevented from having any sort of communications. And if you heard some of the testimony in the Senate, it was, we can't talk about that. We can't talk about that because of statute. So I, I don't believe it offers transparency at all. Sorry, I need to stop right here for a moment. We won't accept any more questions for Sheriff Lewis as he is in actual physical control of a motor vehicle. Delegate Cox, do you have any further questions? Th thank you. Uh, didn't realize that that he was driving so i definitely would direct the question uh, just my final follow-up uh, i had mentioned um sheriff gaylor uh, or mr ball I, I had mentioned about the the leonard town shooting by maryland state police and it just it drew my attention because um, in the context of what we've come through the last two years with a uh, a, a state police unit uh, issued by the governor to go into counties sometimes without notice to the county sheriffs my concern is that this could create a little bit of a conflict there between jurisdictions. And that's that's kind of what I was hoping to, to focus on. And, and again, I, I think that between sheriffs, between the, the state police, you know, those relationships and between the attorney general, I believe most things can be worked out uh, between individuals and we don't need additional legislation. Uh, I, I do believe, and I, I guess this is part of what you're touching on, they're coming from 28 years in the state police and Major Simpson, who you just heard from, also did 28 years in the Maryland State Police. Um, both of us retiring at command members. Um, there is no way for the state police to conduct the investigations independently of themselves. I, I mean, and, and overall, they are the ones that are conducting the, the investigations uh, for the attorney general's um, IIU. 
but uh, I, I think that's part of where your question was going that uh, are Thanks. these truly it coincide with the investigation. I know they've set up protocols to try to make sure these people aren't associated. I, I believe that that's an impossibility from my experience there. Th thank you, Sheriff. Delegate McComas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, I have like two questions. Is it not true that the Maryland State Police have, uh, they're rather low on personnel uh, because I mean, I've heard that complaint just for the, the local barracks. And so I miss my question is we have enough people that can investigate um, the, these uh, police involved uh, incidents where there, somebody is fatally shot and dies um, because they might have to go all over the state. So that's one question. I, I, uh, Delegate, I don't have their actual numbers, but I, I believe them, like every police department across the state, is having a challenge recruiting, finding candidates to join their ranks. Um, but person, you know, we, we certainly locally, the local police departments have a lot more immediate access to manpower that they can put on the scene anytime one of these things unfortunately happens. Um, the state police uh, are challenged in that you, geographically, you may have people responding from all parts of the state, uh, we, we heard, and I don't have firsthand information, of course, um, but pretty close to it, that the uh, investigator that went to Wacomico County actually drove from Anne Arundel County. Um, you know, we, we could have had the scene being cleared up, evidence collected, and on our, on our cleaning up before the uh, first trooper even arrives on the scene, uh, much less the IIU. So I, I think that the local police departments, just by the nature of the beast, are better suited to respond and initiate these investigations. And um, again, much akin to a federal uh, Department of Justice investigation, the uh, Senate Bill 600 provided the framework to allow for that kind of oversight and access to ensure that that is done uh, appropriately to assure our citizens that nothing uh, locally is being done to uh, you know, compromise the investigation. So uh, person for person, we can put more people on the scene. I don't know what their actual numbers are in vacancies. Okay, just a quick follow-up question. I assume that if there is, is, a, is an incident um, where there is a death, um, it's critical. Time is of the essence. And I guess what, where I'm coming from is that if it's within a county, the county police, or if it's in a municipality, they can handle this a lot quicker than if everybody's waiting around for um, the attorney general's investigative unit to show up. Is that correct? 100% uh, uh, correct. Absolutely. So is it possible that a lot of evidence could just kind of get um, degraded, lost, um, disappear um, because of the fact of the time factor? Certainly, the longer it goes, the, the more danger, or, you know, the more access to the scene, if the scene's not locked down, you know, that's part of the investigation. I think people lose sight of that. The investigation starts when the first police officer gets on the scene and starts putting a crime scene tape and determines what needs to be protected and what's not and holding witnesses. So local police are going to be part of the investigation no matter what. Um, and when that's done, I think the most timely, no one's going to argue that the most timely collection possible of evidence is best case. I know the attorney general's protocols that um, they are asking individuals to follow, uh, police departments to follow, or, or to determine whether this piece of evidence can sit out longer than another piece because of the weather or because of other conditions. Um, I say, let's do a timely investigation because that's what the citizens deserve and collect it as timely and as professionally as possible. So if, if that's the case, um, that you're supposed to kind of with a Ouija board figure out well, I can collect this, but I can't collect that because because you could be wrong. And then who's going to who's going to carry the bag? It's going to be the, the locals that they didn't get 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 all the evidence that they should have because they're trying to guess. Absolutely. You're gonna, which I, I think that's a fair you're going to get you're going to get second guess. And again, it, this goes to the question of, um, you know, the, the attorney general's office by the bill that passed last year under Senate Bill 600 have the ability to look at the actions of the individual police officer and any um, misconduct allegations or concerns that result from that, that may result from that investigation. But there's still other, uh, as we've seen in many of these cases, other matters to be investigated. So there's gonna be uh, parallel investigations. There should be, in my opinion, one, you know, the local police department should handle as they normally would. And, and again, the AG come in and add that transparency, that access to the part of the officer involved um, death and potential death or death uh, 
that that should be their piece to ensure um, that everything is being done properly. And that provides the transparency that the public expects. Thank you, Sheriff Gaylor. Thank you. Delegate Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my question is for um, Officer Simpson, Sheriff Simpson. He's, wait, yeah. He's coming back. Oh, actually, I met you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. All right. Music so here's cares. my question. My question is, I thought that last year we took care of um, giving the investigatory power to the um, Office of the Attorney General. Our, but it sounds like we're kind of re-litigating that here. So I'm a, little, I'm a little confused. I thought that the only thing that, not the only thing, but one thing that House Bill 638 was doing was to create prosecutory power within the AG, something that law enforcement itself does not do. Uh, law officers um, do not, you know, not today, not tomorrow, or next week, prosecute. So I'm, a, I'm just a little confused about that. Can you, can you clarify that for me? Well, as far as the, uh, the prosecutor, uh, prosecution, uh, you wouldn't want me to also be the prosecutor in a case. So you wouldn't want the IIU, the investigators, to be the prosecutor in the case. Uh, as well as the investigators. You, you want to have uh, another set of eyes put on those. Uh, the, um, the state's attorney is the place for that. Uh, the state's attorney is elected by the citizens of that county. They are responsible, just that, as you, uh, to those citizens. And, and if they don't like the job that the state's attorney is doing, uh, short of criminal act, they'll remove that state's attorney next time the election comes up. Um, right. If, but the bill doesn't take anything away from the state's attorney. It's my understanding when I read the Office of the Attorney General's testimony, it is to remain, um, it says that um, uh, without removing the power from state's attorneys. So that's what I'm, the, the bill grants the OAG the power to prosecute officer involved fatalities without removing that power from state's attorneys. So that's where I'm confused because we're talking about the investigation a lot in this bill when it's actually the prosecutory power that the OAG would be receiving. Uh, well, I, I think you mentioned- Because the they already have investigated, they already have investigative powers. We, we've, we've already taken care of that, I thought. Not too much. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll share the seat with uh, yeah. Sheriff Dillon. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and, thank you. Sure, and, and Dalia, thank you for your question. The, the bill last year, enabled the states, the uh, Office of the Attorney General, IIU, the powers to investigate that action, the police officer's actions involved in some incident. It didn't exclude or preclude or indemnify, I don't know what the right word is, um, local police from continuing to conduct uh, necessary and in the investigations that they're responsible for by law in their jurisdictions, which would also include um, the internal, you know, we. Anytime there's a police shooting presently, we do a criminal investigation and a parallel, um, a parallel internal investigation, administrative investigation. The IIU would be a independent, um, as passed in SB 600, an independent separate investigation, again, much akin to a Department of Justice uh, investigation that's conducted normally well after the fact. And of course, if there, that, would, that level would still exist if there were civil rights in, uh, allegations, rights violations, allegations related to a case. Did I, did I do you? You still look. No, you explained it, but what I'm saying is I don't understand understand the testimony here because the testimony that I'm hearing has mostly been centered around the investigation. So, are you? Is it your position that House Bill 638 is doing something that? House bill is do, is taking away an investigative power that House Bill six hundred didn't already do. Yes, uh, yes. That, okay. Can you tell that, me what what that is? Yeah, sure. Again, I, I think SB six hundred Senate, Senate Bill six hundred last year created enabled um, the unit within the Office of the Attorney General to conduct that they shall conduct an investigation uh, in those limited circumstances when there is a police involved or potentially police related death. 
uh, the nothing in the legislation precluded the local police from continuing to conduct their investigation as they always have. And there are multiple, usually in these cases, there's other underlying, I'll use the cases in Baltimore County, for example, although it's not been concluded, I'm not party to or privy to any inside information. But in that case, the deceased subject wasn't found for hours later. The police had already responded, collected evidence, um, began their investigation before it was even found out that IIU applied. So, you know, much like when IU came, I, I believe they turned the case over, but these investigations still occur. It just could be separate under SB 600, what I believe the initial intent was 600. The attorney general issued a lot of protocols that I, I believe personally uh, exceeded the boundaries of SB 600, the statute, once it was signed into law and um, took what was this oversight, this separate independent um, investigation and has rolled that into a complete police investigation outside the bounds of the statute. Um, and this legislation would address many of the things that I have addressed. I, I've personally spoken to the AG about concerns that I have. And, and one thing particularly put in the word primary in this bill, making them the primary, but still not exclusive. You know, I, I, I think there's a recognition and understanding that local police, as I said, the delegate in Comis, are always going to have a role in these cases no matter what, because we're well, the first. I guess my, I guess my, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I get my, right. my, point, my point is that the local law enforcement agency will still be in, is still present. Um, and it simply states that they shall cooperate and may not impede the, you know, the independent investigations division. It says we shall cooperate and may not impede. So how is the cooperation that is currently going on now with the 12 cases that the Office of the Attorney General um, testified, how is, is, is there more autonomy or is there more involvement now? And, and this bill is taking away some of the involvement of the local law enforcement agency? Uh, no, and, and I've exchanged some letters with Mr. Frosch, and uh, and we've had discussions. We had, we had one meeting, and, and I think uh, um, some of these suggestions are because of um, some suggestions, some conversations that he and I have taken. And as it relates to cooperate, I, I have told the attorney general uh, point blank, you know, should we, I hope we never have one. Um, we've had them before. I hope we ever have one again in Hartford County, a police involved or a police death. Uh, but should one of these incidents occur in Hartford County, you know, the Office of the Attorney General will get complete cooperation from me and my office as we both conduct what the responsible duties that we have under, under statute uh, that our citizens expect us to do. I think the problem comes into, and this was just discussed over in the Senate, trying to define um, cooperation. So, you know, I think that's a, a wide open term that, you know, you and I may have two different definitions of what cooperation looks like. Well, yeah, I understand that, but it also states shall not impede. And I think that um, to me, that kind of gives the definition of cooperation to, you know, to work with, um, but not, it doesn't, it doesn't um, exclude, which is kind of where I was hearing, what I was hearing about the testimony. It's it seemed from the testimony that um, everything was within the powers of the independent investigative um, division um, without and totally saying, you know, when you all come, just goodbye, go away, don't go, be here. That's that's not what I'm getting from the bill. So I just wanted to clarify that um, because it seems more like it's a, it would be a, um, like I said, a, a partnership and a corporation. Okay, well, thank you. And, and I do believe that the protocols that the attorney general has issued, and I'm not sure if you have seen those in light of SB 600, I, I think they do in a large part exclude local participation. Um, so I, I think that's the effort of this bill and, and it, it, why I testified in opposition to it, because I think it does exclude, um, you know, step on the, on the local responsibility. Next, we'll have uh, Delegate Eric Hand and then Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you so much to Sheriff Gaylor for being here. Um, so uh, I have a couple of questions for you. But first, I was um, you probably heard the testimony of the Attorney General where he referenced there's a difference in protocols set up for 
Baltimore City than other jurisdictions. I found that a little bit concerning. Um, the other thing that was mentioned um, that you kind of explained that I was also confused about um, that Delegate Bartlett was asking about was the problem that you're seeing is that um, the Office of the Attorney General is both investigating and now we're about to add them to prosecuting and that does not make any sense at all. We, we want those departments to be totally separate, um, not, not like that. So, and I was just reading through your, your written testimony a little bit um, on some of these uh, exact issues. And I also looked up um, the Attorney General's testimony and he did not include the protocols. I would love to see the protocols for both written out. That would be great. I don't know if you have copies of that. Um, otherwise, I'll have my staff reach out to him to try and get what the actual protocols are so we can just visualize them. But but some of my questions are around um, right now, how is this working in practice? Because I've had some reports from Baltimore County that they've called numerous times for the attorney general to come um, to the scene and they have not shown up. And so I'm wondering how often have you called? Um, have you run into an issue where you have called and, and felt like you were within the, the you know, SB 600 guidelines, but but people are not showing up? Is there a protocol in place for when that happens, when they just decide not to show? Because my understanding was they were supposed to show every time and they were supposed to decide what to do at that point prosecutorially. Um, so if you could just explain sort of what are you seeing on the ground and, and if I'm missing anything. Sure. Um, and, and, and not prosecutorial, but investigatively, they should um, you know, respond. It, it, and I believe in, in the exact wording the past last year was the independent investigation investigative unit shall investigate all alleged or potential police involved deaths of civilians. And again, my office has um, followed the statute as written. Um, my written testimony says 25 notifications as of today's 27 notifications to the IIU where a law enforcement officer in the course of their duties has taken action based on their training and experience uh, and a light and a person has died, a civilian has died. Um, 27 cases are all cases of um, first aid, you know, Narcan or CPR or those type of things. And this is one of the things I thought this Although SB 600, I think in concept without the protocols was a good bill, I think this is one of the things that should be clarified that if we're just talking use of force and pursuits, then let's narrow down what needs to be reported. But in those cases, uh, 27 notifications, um, there have been some difficulties in making notification. I believe maybe they have addressed this, but uh, in one case, we had a victim of a cardiac arrest who was on the floor for more than an hour uh, before we could get uh, with miscommunications at the state police uh, answering point before we could get it, them to call the AG to get us a call back to say they weren't coming. Um, you know, the family had to deal with the extra trauma of related to us not being able to move the body because that's what um, the, the, uh, the AG has wanted. So again, these are 27 examples where if you are a police officer or a some rogue police department, and you don't want the IIU in your backyard, you know, you, you beat someone and God forbid this ever happens anywhere, but you just call the number and say it was a heart attack and they're not, the telephone investigation, they're not coming. The law says shall investigate all alleged or potentially police involved. That's what we're doing in Hartford County. If the statute changes, we will stop notifying on those. But again, I, I think that was, one of the things that could have been done better in last year's bill, but overall, I think the independent investigation unit, the, the, what I believe passed last year before the protocols is a good bill and offers transparency to the citizens. It's just overreach in what is trying to be implemented, which is basically a new police department in our state. At yeah, that, five dollars. Yeah, that's, that's really disturbing. Um, so I, I think I understand more about why they're, they're just calling in saying that they don't want to come because they think, that there's likely there's no police involved violence, but obviously if there was police involved violence and um, there was a rogue officer trying to cover it up, he would simply say it was a heart attack, which I believe was what caused the death of Anton Black was a cardiac arrest, was it not? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it was a medical, it, it was medically related. I, I don't know exactly what it was. Right. So we, so the system we put in place to try and fix what happened there is, is 
already showing us in the first year to be ineffective. Well, thank no, you. Very much. The, the Anton Black case was a case where the local police didn't handle the investigation and the state police did. And people didn't like the outcome of the state police investigation because it had to be biased. And yet state police are investigating all these cases across the state. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. All right, Delegate Shoemaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is for uh, Sheriff Gaylor. Uh, Sheriff, um, we heard earlier uh, testimony from the Attorney General uh, addressing a couple of things. One, he was extolling the virtues of placing the in, uh, investigation component under the rubric, I guess, of his office. I guess you heard that, right? I, I I did not. I was still testifying in the Senate when he was. Well, up. Take, my, take my word for it. That's what did, he sir. said. So, yeah, but in fact, I mean, it sounds like uh, uh, notwithstanding what he was saying, these investigations are um, heavily reliant, I guess, for lack of a better word, on MSP. And, and so, in fact, what we have, even under the setup from the police reform legislation of uh, 2021, is uh, cops inv investigating cops, right? Yeah, not, not in part. Entirely, it's the state police doing the investigations. Okay. All right. Uh, good. So, with regard to the, uh, the pro, uh, pro, uh, prosecutorial component that's dealt with in this particular uh, piece of legislation. They, you know, the attorney general was expressing uh, concern, I guess, about the, uh, the relationships, the symbiotic re relationships between uh, the state's local states, of, uh, state's attorney's offices and uh, uh, law enforcement, and he used that as justification for uh, vesting uh, prosecution of, you know, the subject matter that we're dealing with today in the AG's office. So, I mean, that's, that's essentially what he was saying. But let me ask you this question, uh, Sheriff. When, when sheriffs are sued, uh, all sheriffs, not just you, but, you know, my sheriff, DeWeese, all, you know, Sheriff Lewis is on this uh, uh, Zoom call, et cetera. When they're sued, who is it that defends the sheriff or personnel of the sheriff's office? Well, and I will offer that situation. Oh, it's the attorney general office in most cases. However, if it's specific to um, law enforcement at a county level because of home rule and, and county charter, you know, the, the county law office becomes our legal representative. Okay, but if you were sued as the sheriff of Harford County, who, who would- the attorney, the attorney General. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, all right, there's Delicate Bartlett. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you for the second bite. Um, I have a quick question for the sheriff from Harp County and um, I, two quick questions. So the, um, I just have to clarify something on the record about Anton Black. The um, cause of death might have been heart attack, but the manner of death would have not been heart attack. The manner of death would have been as a result of the beating that he received. Would you agree? I, I wasn't privy to that investigation. The state police conducted that investigation. I don't I don't believe that that was the findings, but I don't have firsthand information. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Um, that looks like the end of the questions for that panel. Thank we have, um, we're gonna call up the next panel. It's the state's attorneys, uh, Gavin Potashnik, Joe Riley, and Steve Kroll, I believe. It should just be the three of them. Um, if we could go ahead and bring them in. All right, I see Joe Riley. All right, we have Joe Riley. Um, <clears throat> uh, hopefully some others might trickle in, but um, Joe Riley, you can begin uh, when you are ready. 
Thank you, Vice Chair, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is Joe Riley. I'm the state's attorney for Maryland County and the legislative chair for the Maryland State's Attorneys Association. Uh, I'm also uh, previously referenced in this uh, bill hearing as the person who did the wrong uh, thing in the Anton Black case. Um, I invite the chair of the Ways and Means Committee to come to Caroline County and uh, we can go over uh, what was, without a doubt, the hardest decision of my life, not my legal career, but of my life, to not charge in that case. But if she doesn't want to take my word for it, she could go to the investigators from the Maryland State Police, the same investigators that do the investigating for the AIID, and ask them if they thought that charges should have been brought in this case. Or she can go to the office of the chief medical examiner, the same office of the chief medical examiner that does the autopsies for the AG in these types of cases, and ask them if they told me that the manner of death was an accident, to reference the last question by Billy Barlett. And it was deemed an accident and related to the heart defect of Mr. Black. There was no indication of choking, no indication of any injuries that led to the death in that case. If she doesn't believe those people, she can go to the United States Department of Justice. Uh, after my decision was made, I took the entire file, soup to nuts, to the U.S. Department of Justice. The Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice also determined that no charges would be brought federally. If she doesn't believe the Department of Justice, she can go to the uh, people who are suing civilly in this case. They are suing the officers civilly. They are suing the uh, chief medical examiner civilly. One person that they're not suing civilly is Joe Riley. Not on that case, um, but I did the wrong thing. So let's talk about the people who would do the right thing in this bill. And if the attorney general elected to not prosecute, uh, they would give that case over to the local state's attorney who could do, I guess, the right thing and prosecute the case. Who would be the defense's first witness in that case? I would suggest it would be Dana Mulhauser. Call Dana Mulhauser to the stand. Question one, are you in charge of the investigation? Do you oversee the entire investigation? And then follow up with why didn't you determine, why didn't you, why did you determine to not charge in this case? And have her tell the jury why she didn't charge in that case. That would probably also be the first witness called in the subsequent civil lawsuit that would happen because you would be losing your immunity in that case, is my estimation. So uh, this law, uh, while it seeks to have these dual prosecutions, gives a lot of power away from local uh, state's attorneys and causes them to be subject of uh, civil and other um, collateral consequences that I don't think have been contemplated by this bill and we seek a negative report. All right, Delegate Bartlett. I'm going to leave the Anton Black case alone. I want to move on to a question for Mr. Riley. Um, you're a state's attorney. Yes. And do you have investigators? Or are there investigators who work for you? I have an investigator who works for me. Right. And so you have someone who will investigate a case, and then you will, in turn, prosecute the case. My investigator does not have uh, law enforcement powers. But they have investigative powers. Uh, they not like you think. Well, they're an investigator, so I'm just thinking that they would. So they're you know, not. Investigate they're not going out to a crime scene and uh, conducting interviews and things like that. But they are talking to witnesses, correct? They can, yes. Uh, usually, right. witnesses who have uh, business records or uh, medical records, things like that. Okay, so so and you can use that if you sometimes submit that evidence in your prosecution against um, a defendant. Sure. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood. Thanks. All right, Delegate Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you um, for being here, uh, Mr. Riley, um, and thank you for explaining the the Anton Black case so that we could um, see all the pieces um, because it seems like we're sort of mimicking almost exactly what happened with that case in the new structure um, that they've formulated and, and we're expecting a new outcome um, of something that we've already litigated under the exact same structure. 
So that's that's concerning. Um, in terms of um, this new bill, can you just explain exactly why, what the conflict is with having, you know, of course you have an investigator, but you you don't have a law enforcement. You're not the only investigator. You're not the one that's that's um you know doing holding the the evidence things like this. Um, what's the real conflict here with having the same people holding the evidence, doing the investigation? At this point now, we're hearing that there's overruling happening of local jurisdictions during investigations. What is the conflict here with that? And then having a new um, prosecutorial piece of the exact same department. Sure. Uh, you have law enforcement agencies that are delaying action on very important cases that are critical stages of the investigation. I'll give you an example that happened in Talbot County relatively recently, where a uh, person was committed a serious assault in St. Mary's County, fled St. Mary's County to Delaware, and then uh, was attempted to be apprehended in Delaware, fled Delaware, and went through the Eastern Shore. Stopped in Talbot County, took out a gun while surrounded by law enforcement officers and shot themselves in the chest. Had to be flown to shock trauma. Uh, the, to my knowledge, the independent investigative division was contacted and they said, let the locals handle it. Um, so I guess because it wasn't a death on the scene, you, you would have to ask the agency for that. Uh, but there is this decision-making that no one knows what to do. Uh, and, and then we're waiting and waiting and waiting and critical information can be lost. Witnesses could leave the scene. Witnesses who could be surrounding decide, well, we've been here for a couple hours. We're going to go home. Uh, so it's just a when we're talking about uh, homicides or we're talking about incidents that are so serious that they may lead to death. Uh, it's vital that we take action swiftly and waiting for an investigative decision uh, from an agency that could be hours away when we're talking about Crisfield and Somerset County or Oakland and Garrett County just uh, isn't uh, the best way to do a homicide investigation in my estimation. Yeah, and are you like in my one of my counties, are you seeing in your county that police are calling for sort of cardiac arrest deaths, things like that where, where officers are present? Uh, yes, uh, that, that, that is a concern that they don't know what, what is the type of cases we should be calling the IID for, what is the type of cases that we shouldn't. And since their penalty is so severe, if they do the wrong thing, uh, they are going to err on the side of uh, probably calling in cases that wouldn't typically warrant calling. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative for, sh for you sharing what you went through when you made those decisions on that really, really tough case. And uh, I'm sure none of, none of us envy being in that position. So thanks. All right. Um, it looks like that is the end of the witnesses and testimony on uh, House Bill 638. So thank you everybody. We're going to go next to a pair of bills from Delegate Wilkins, House Bill 123, and then House Bill 1012. Um, we'll start with House Bill 123. We have, um, it'll be Delegate Wilkins and Bill Henry on that panel. Um, Delegate Wilkins, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Moon, and greetings to Chair Gruber and the rest of the committee. Very good to be here with you today. I am Janelle Wilkins for the record, and I'm pleased to, prevent, to present House Bill 123. In 2019, Maryland officer Michael O'Sullivan was found guilty of perjury and misconduct in office for his testimony given in a district court trial on June 4th, 2018. Under oath, Officer O'Sullivan testified that he saw Yusuf Smith reach for his waistline and throw a gun before fleeing from the police. It was later discovered through body-worn camera footage that Officer O'Sullivan did not and could not have seen what he testified to under oath while in court. 
Smith was charged with illegal possession of a gun and other firearm offenses and served 70 days in jail as a result of the officer's lie. He also suffered $50,000 in economic damages. Not only did former officer O'Sullivan's actions cost a man his freedom, it also cost the city of Baltimore $100,000 as it settled with the innocent man who served time in jail as a result of this false testimony. Should O'Sullivan walk away with taxpayer funded pension checks from the state? In 2019, an incident made international headlines when Corporal Michael Owen tragically shot Michael Green multiple times while he was handcuffed and seated in the police car. This case led to a $20 million settlement and the former officer is now facing a murder charge. If convicted, should Owen walk away with a taxpayer funded pension check from the state? Unfortunately, these convictions of officers in criminal court happen more often than we would like. According to data from Bowling Green State University, Henry A. Wallace Police Crime Database shows that between 2005 and 2016, at least 190 Maryland officers were convicted in criminal court of crimes varying from sex related crimes to violence or perjury. And that doesn't include some of the recent convictions that we've seen um, more recently. HB 123 creates a process for law enforcement officers' pensions to be subject to forfeiture of benefits in whole or in part from the state retirement and pension system or the local pension system when an officer is found guilty of a felony, perjury, or a misdemeanor related to truthfulness in their course of duty. After all appeals under this bill, after all appeals have been satisfied, and there's a sustained conviction of the law enforcement officer, the attorney general or the state's attorney, would file a complaint in circuit court to forfeit their benefits in whole or in part. The court can consider things like the severity of the crime, the amount of um, money lost, the degree of public trust, and other considerations in making the determination. I do have amendments as well that would require consideration as well as notification of beneficiaries um, and, and, and spouses in, in terms of domestic um, orders. This bill helps put the state of Maryland on track to restore public trust and ensure that taxpayer dollars are not rewarded and awarded to criminally convicted officers. HB 123, as introduced, was passed in the House last year as part of HB 670. And I urge this wise committee to pass HB 123 again. I urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll hear from Bill Henry for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, honorable committee members. My name is Bill Henry. I am the controller for Baltimore City, and I am appearing before you this afternoon to express my support for House Bill 123. As controller, I am one of the three citywide elected officials who are responsible for Baltimore's fiscal policy as members of the Board of Estimates. For several years now, the board has regularly dealt with settlement agreements requiring the city to pay for damages inflicted on the people of Baltimore by law enforcement officers. The history of deliberate infliction of harm by the Gun Trace Task Force has been documented so thoroughly, it is now common knowledge. Over the last five years, the Board of Estimates has approved over $14.3 million in Gun Trace Task Force related settlements. We've had to compensate citizens for the actions of police officers who were themselves found guilty of crimes and terminated from the department. The city has paid out claims for these officers wrongdoing yet these same officers have been allowed to keep their pensions. If the city is going to be stuck paying for their pensions, sorry, if the city is going to be stuck paying for their crimes, we should have the authority to recover our own damages from the police officer's pension benefits. We should not have to continue paying for police officers' criminal conduct without any recourse. A change in state law to allow forfeiture of pension benefits is the right thing to do fiscally and morally. The General Assembly recognized this in its deliberations over last year's law enforcement reform legislation, as Delegate Wilkins pointed out with HB 670. That bill contained a forfeiture provision, which was amended out before final passage. I'm urging you to right that wrong now. The most important consideration for my constituents, the people of Baltimore City, is that pension forfeiture legislation be enacted in some form as soon as possible. Thank you very much, and I'm available for questions. 
All right, we've got um, one question, our Delegate Fisher and then Delegate Cardin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Delegate Wilkins, good to see you. Um, this legislation sounds very familiar to provisions we put in to the larger um, police reform legislation that passed this committee last year. Can you talk about what happened um, with the language in, in the bill last year and where it left off and where we are today? Thank you so much, Delegate Fisher. That is a great question. Um, this, the pensions provisions um, last year did pass in House Bill 670. I really wanna emphasize this bill as introduced did pass um, the House in that legislation. Um, when it went over to the, the Senate and in negotiations, um, these provisions did not end up making it through in the final bill. Um, so we are back now with hopes of um, having this bill independently pass and become law. And Delegate Fisher, as, as you know, um, you helped to put that amendment on HB 670. And I think that this wise committee um, took great action in, in doing that and hope we'll, we'll be able to get to full passage this year. Delegate Cardin. You are uh, still muted. How is that happening? Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and apologize. Um, if the bill, if, if you have an example where, let's say the city was required to pay $100,000 and the person's retirement um, portfolio has well over that, has, let's say, $200,000, would you be would, would you be amenable to um, I guess this is really for Mr. Henry. Um, would you be amenable to saying yes, we can recover our costs, but then he's entitled to whatever um, he he would get over that? Well, first of all, I'm not going to contradict whatever the sponsor wants <laughs> because it's it's not my bill. I'm just here to say it's uh, it's a good idea and it addresses a problem that we know we have. From my perspective, I'm, I'm, I don't think I would qualify myself as a vindictive person. I just want the city to not lose money. Um, so if the, if the pension is worth dramatically more than um, the, the settlements that we're claiming from it, um, if, if it was the wisdom of this committee to put some type of cap on that, um, on that claim so that the city can't take more than it was due, um, you know, we'd be happy to just uh, hold the city harmless for all practical purposes. Um, I guess we can get into the, the larger philosophical question of, um, you know, how much uh, does the fact that they betrayed the public trust uh, mean in terms of the city continuing to uh, support them at all, but, uh, you know, as, as the delegate knows, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a guy trying to do right by his constituents. And in this case, um, if, the, uh, if the state would let us reclaim the money that the city is paying out, um, then I think that, that would be a great start. Councilman, you're doing a great job and keep up the good work with the money. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Next, we're gonna bring up uh, two witnesses, one unfavorable and one's an informational witness, uh, Clyde Boatwright and Ann Gothrop. Do we have a uh, uh, Clyde? Yeah, um, Clyde Boatwright, you can, um, you can uh, start for two minutes whenever you are ready. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Clyde Boatwright and I'm the president of the Maryland State Fraternal Order of Police. I represent over 21,000 men and women uh, statewide. Uh, the bill before us, House Bill 123, um, seems to uh, violate a contract uh, between local employers and their employees. Uh, this will jeopardize the viability of local pensions and no other uh, public profession is subject to this. We're asking the few brave souls who are left in policing, we're asking, when does it end? Uh, the moratorium and, and the, uh, the, the hate for police continues. After historic legislation was passed last year, 
Um, we thought that, you know, we were uh, um, a group of, of professionals that worked well um, with this body to try to get to meaningful police reform. And we understand that police reform was needed. and We were not opposed to it. But now this bill will affect the families of our police officers. It hurts the recruitment and retention and retirement of our police officers. If this bill passes, we will see historic levels of retirement. I implore each of you, ask your local police chief or sheriff, how's the recruitment going for the, uh, the vacancies that they have? Prince George's County has over 400 vacancies. Baltimore City, over 500 vacancies. We don't have a bullpen of people ready to join the fight against crime. Our profession is suffering. We do not have people ready to come and join this profession. And I'm afraid those that are left will start to leave if we start attacking police pensions. Um, we're asking uh, for an unfavorable, unfavorable report and I'll stand for any questions. All right, next we have uh, Ann Gothrop, who I think is um, here from the State Retirement and Pension System to answer any questions. But Ann, you do have um, two minutes on the floor if you wanted to make a statement. No, State Retirement's not taking a position on the, on the bill. I'm just here because Delegate Wilkins asked in case there were questions to the existing forfeiture provisions or anything else related to State Retirement. I'm here as a resource. All right, are there any questions for Clyde Boatwright? Um, okay, let's see, uh, Delegate Fisher and then Delegate Bartlett. Thank, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, you can hear me, okay. Um, well, one I wanted to say, um, um, Mr. Boatwright, I think everyone on this committee, some of us have been prosecutors, defense, everywhere, you know, we appreciate our men and women um, that serve in law enforcement and risk their lives and and we care about them. And I don't, I don't think it was, um, the work that this committee spent hours and hours, and I don't know if I said hours on, um, wasn't in attacking our men and women in uniform, what was responding to our community. And honestly, years of reform, and I will tell you just my three years, three sessions of being here and working in Annapolis for years, there was a, a lackluster approach by um, FOP and others to bring reform pr prior to this time. I mean, it would be like one chief, chief of police and one bill. So I think those those comments to the general public and them not knowing the context um, I needed to correct on the record. And my question basically goes to, from the way I read and understand Delegate Wilkins' uh, bill and proposal, the local state attorney or the attorney general has to make an actual action, has to go forth and actually go get the pension. It's not something that's automatic. And it would be after someone exhausted their appeals and found guilty. So I don't understand the notion that it would be attacking police pensions and just clearing out pensions when one, the officer in question would have to not only be found guilty, have to exhaust appeals, and the local state attorney or the attorney general would have to actually go after that money for return. Is that your understanding of the bill or there's like an automatic nature to it? No, I, I, I understand the bill. Um, um, we've done a poll um, from the FOP and 90% of our members don't feel supported by the elected officials. Um, and that's, again, that's 21,000 members statewide. We're feeling it. And this, um, um, what we feel is an attack on pensions. What's next, the healthcare? Uh, these are different things that are negotiated by local jurisdictions in order so uh, they don't have to pay the salaries that our police officers deserve. So they, they, offer, they offer pensions uh, as, a, as a benefit uh, to our police officers. And in some cases, they're different. I mean, if you go from one jurisdiction to another, some have 20 year pensions, some have 25. And so that's when I talk about the re uh, retention of police officers. Local jurisdictions are pulling from the same pot for the same group of people. I think you heard an earlier testimony from one of the local sheriffs. Police departments are short. We just can't find people. Uh, and so the last people that are in the game are now saying, hey, if they're going to start attacking our pensions, I can retire now. And that's what we don't want. The people that are staying around, members of the gun trace task force that we all agree were criminals are now coming home from jail. And they're not here to, to deal with the fallout from their crimes and their action. They're home, they're released and they're gone on with their lives. They've served their time, but we as the police officers that are still sitting here trying to, to, to protect our communities have to decide whether or not, you know what, if this is in the best interest of my family to continue doing this job. And so that's the concern 
Um, and I understand uh, all of the different layers and our officers understand that, but they just view this as an attack on pensions. Uh, and, right. and, and I, I'd be interesting that. to see if you all did a poll of our community and what they would say about police officers retaining their pension after they're found guilty and exhausted appeals. Because I'll tell you, in my community, they were pissed that the pension um, um, amendment didn't make it through. So we well, also have people to answer to, too. And I just think to 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 qualify this committee that we that we're attacking law enforcement is way more out there than the truth, um, especially when uh, almost like a fourth of the people here have, have worked with law enforcement um, in prosecuting crime. Um, so I just I just would I would just say those remarks. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would like to respond, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, briefly. I, I, yeah, I don't want to characterize it that we are uh, calling this community uh, into question about attacking police. We're saying that the entire process is attacking us. So I want to clarify that. All right, thank you. Um, Delegate McComas. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is probably for Ms. Galthrop. I think I said that right, or Mr. Bodewright, uh, or anybody else that might be able to answer this. Somewhere I read, and I, I can't quite remember where, was that they're not sure that this is actually legal um, to be able to confiscate the pensions because, well, one, it's it's based on a contract, you know, the contract to work for a group, and then you earn so much every year. But um, also, it might it might cause problems with the whole pension system, is what I read that it that it's that it's harmful to the whole the, to the entire pension system for the whole group under that pension system. Um, and I think I might have read it in the fiscal note, uh, but Ms. Galrath, can you comment on that at all? Sure, I'd be happy to. So there are currently two forfeiture provisions already in place in state law. The first is for the legislators. You all have forfeiture. Um, and the second was passed, I think it was in 2016 with the delayed effective date of 2019. So it just came in for the six constitutional officers. I understand what you're saying about the issue of contract. The way these bills are drafted in order, Maryland is absolutely a contract state and you can't take away a benefit that's already been earned. And I believe this bill, the existing forfeiture provisions that we already have in place in law, they only affect, they, they don't affect anything prior to the date, the effective date of the bill. So if this effective date is gonna be July 1st, 2022, then, any service earned before 2022, and this is in Delegate Wilkins' bill, any service earned before July 1st, 2022 can't be touched. Any crimes that occurred before the effective date of the bill, before July 1st, 2022, you can't use those to forfeit your pension. And that's how we um, implement the, well, we haven't had to implement it for the constitutional officers, but that is how we have implemented it for legislators. Um, just a follow-up question. Um, could this have, well, and this is probably for Mr. Bodewright, could this have a very chilling effect for folks that, you know, they might, they might say, oh, I want to work another five years or, you know, another couple years to get, you know, maybe to get the maximum amount of my pension. And they say, oh, so this bill passes, I'm out of here. So you could be losing, a, you know, just because they don't want the hassle and, and just kind of that, that, you know, everybody's going to be looking well, you, you know, I mean, it's it's more pressure put on the police. So we're going to be losing a lot of talent is what I'm kind of concerned about. Um, and not having the folks to replace that talent because nobody, you know, this is a disincentive for folks to join the police force because, because it starts, you know, anybody that starts after the effective date of this law, they could lose every every year that they put in, right? Isn't that the, okay. So Mr. Bodewright, what are your thoughts? Yes, I, I totally agree with you. Um, that's what we're hearing from our veteran police officers that are just trying to hang on uh, and trying to, uh, you know, they don't want to leave their brothers and sisters, their police departments. Uh, and, um, you know, they have and in some cases they have the time to retire. Uh, in some cases, they are a few years away. Uh, some people will just take the penalty just to get out of policing because, uh, you know, they're not they don't feel supported. Uh, so we want to keep and, and attract the best talent, but we also want to retain the best uh, talent. And some of the people that are near retirement uh, could decide to leave. Okay, thank you. Um, one quick question, Mr. Bodewright. 
can I get your email address and phone number? I want to talk to you about something else. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Totally good, Eric. Can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Boatwright. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, sort of along the line of questioning of my, of my colleague from Hartford County, um, do you have any of the updated numbers on how many officers were short in um, the city right now, in the county, Baltimore County, um, even Hartford County, if you have that? Um, I know that we're struggling right now to recruit people and the officers I've spoken to, at least in, from Baltimore County, are close to retirement and all of them plan on retiring within the next 24 months. So that's terrifying. A lot of these people are detectives, um, not the kind of people that we can afford to lose and easily replace. Um, you know, becoming a detective is not the easiest job ever. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could comment on the impacts bills like this seem to be having on uh, recruitment and entertainment. Thank you, Delegate Erica, for the question. Um, I do know, uh, like I said, Baltimore City is over 500. Uh, Prince George's County is over 400 vacancies. I've, I've talked to another uh, local jurisdiction that are used to uh, have academy classes of 40. Uh, they, they are canceling academy classes because they only have 12 to 13 um, uh, recruits that get through the background process to be hired. Uh, so academy classes are being canceled or shifted to other jurisdictions. Um, where they're just combining local jurisdictions to make one academy class. Um, so it, um, we are all struggling and uh, across the state of Maryland uh, to, again, like I said, pull from the same pot. Um, you know, it's the benefits such as a pension uh, or the other benefits that local jurisdictions offer that attract police officers or people that want to become police officers to these local jurisdictions. And, um, you know, if we see this, uh, this, this bill uh, enacted, it, it does have an impact on families. It has an impact on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on the, the spouses and, and the young people that, that are the dependents. So, um, you know, my concern is that, you know, we just won't get people to, to sign up and we're already yeah. seeing it. Yeah. And that we actually, in the last bill, I think, you know, that we passed last year, we actually lowered some of the hiring standards. Um, so we're still struggling to recruit people even with lower standards. And I drove through PA like two weeks ago and I saw a sign in PA asking for people to apply to jobs in Maryland for police. It was, it's, it, it's, it's a struggle. And I'm, I'm sorry that you guys feel targeted. I really am. You know, it's, it's uh, sadly, I, I drive on my way home. I, I ride through Baltimore city um, and I see four different local surrounding jurisdictions with billboards in Baltimore city uh, advertising and recruiting people from Baltimore city uh, to come to their local jurisdiction. So um, yeah. that's, that's just the struggle we're seeing across the state. Yeah, well, thank you for being here and sharing this testimony. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Boatwright. Aren't we oversimplifying the discussion just a little bit? Um, we always, all the, when in the middle of police reform last year, we kept talking about they're just a couple bad apples. They're just a couple bad apples. Now, do we really want officers still on the force? who are afraid of, of committing criminal activity and getting found guilty in a court of law and, and getting their pensions taken from this point forward? Is that really what you're arguing? No, no, no to, uh, to answer your question, uh, the criminal justice uh, system is, uh, is in place for that. If a person is found uh, to, uh, is alleged to have committed a felony, if they're a police officer, they're immediately suspended without pay. So that, they're separated at that point. Um, and so the criminal justice will take care, the system will take care of anybody that's found by a jury of their peers, um, they'll take care of the penalty for that. And if that penalty is jail time, then they'll get jail time. Uh, so we're concerned uh, about uh, the impact that it will have on the dependents, uh, the wives and, and kids of these uh, young people, um, of, of these uh, uh, police officers. Um, and we're, you know, we're just concerned about the overall optics of we'll take your pension from you. Um, if you've worked hard uh, as, um, as a police officer, we're concerned about the optics. If I may, what about the optics of continuing to give money to people who have maybe even killed somebody, committed murder? What about those optics? Well, we will never um, have uh, public trust uh, if um, you don't have both sides working together. Um, and I think that the police officers that show up every day and still answer the 4 million calls a statewide 
are, are trying to bridge that gap of public trust. But if we got to continue to live, um, like I said earlier in my testimony, members of the Gun Trace Task Force have already served their jail time and have come home. They're no longer police officers and they don't qualify for pensions because they're not vested. They're not, they don't qualify for a pension, so they won't get a pension. Uh, so, but we, uh, the ones that are still here uh, trying to protect our communities have to suffer for the, the crimes that they committed. And we agree that they should have gone to jail. And are you arguing that people from the Gun Trace Task Force should be entitled to their pensions? Uh, no, I'm not, because they won't be entitled to their pensions because they are not vested in the pension system. Thank you. All right. Um, it looks like that's the end of testimony on House Bill 123. Thank you. Um, we are going to go to House Bill 1012, Delegate Wilkins. And sorry, we've got. Um, why don't we go ahead and do a seven? seven person pro panel on this one. Um, we just call them and see who's here. Uh, Karen Ramaley, Danica Starks, Keisha James, Chad Reese, <clears throat> Carrie Hansel, Deborah Levy, and uh, Kobe Little. Um, so we can start bringing those folks in and we'll try and take them in order. In the meantime, um, Delegate Wilkins for three minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice Chair. Greetings again to everyone on the committee. For the record, I am Delegate Janelle Wilkins and I'm pleased to present House Bill 1012. Qualified immunity for police officers has shielded these officers from liability and prevented victims from gaining justice in civil cases, even in egregious circumstances. And this has taken place for far too long. Immunity regularly permits unconstitutional misconduct from being addressed. And despite the facts of a case or how serious a case is, an officer may claim immunity from lawsuit. Once immunity is granted, is it difficult for a victim to obtain justice in a civil case from the employer or the officer? Immunity hurts the victims of police misconduct and it also harms public safety. When police officers are held immune from unconscionable constitutional violations, it erodes trust which makes public safety and policing far more difficult and dangerous. I wanna be absolutely clear. When we talk about immunity and we talk about police accountability, these are not in conflict with the need to address public safety issues. Accountability is public safety when we have the public's trust and we have transparency. If you are familiar and you probably are familiar with the idea of qualified immunity as a Supreme Court doctrine, we cannot change federal qualified immunity and the US Supreme Court's doctrine, but we can create a clear path for accountability and justice for victims in Maryland state courts by removing immunity for officers. What HB 1012 does is it creates a cause of action or ability to sue in state courts for violations of the Maryland or US constitution. Officers would not be immune from suit. It also provides, it also requires that the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission has to review any case where the officer is held liable or where there is, there's a settlement to review the officer for decertification. It also requires that the employer has to satisfy the judgment and then seek reimbursement from the officer for $25,000 or 5% of the judgment, whichever is less. This bill will have very important impacts. One is justice for victims, ensuring that they have full access to a remedy. Two, it removes immunity for these state and, these state, um, and local officers and ensures that local agencies and employers are incentivized to improve training and oversight as well as make better hiring decisions. It has a layer of accountability from the work that we did last year um, to ensure that in addition to the criminal process that there's a clear civil process and access to justice. And I also wanna reemphasize the accountability around decertification to make sure that officers um, who are held liable are also reviewed for decertification. States like Colorado and New Mexico have taken steps to eliminate or severely limit qualified immunity, and the impact is very promising. Our work 
to reimagine public safety and make reforms to policing is unfinished until every resident of Maryland is able to access fair and equitable public safety and justice. I urge a favorable report on HB 1012. All right, thank you very much. Um, so witnesses, uh, we'll have two minutes. Again, we'll do, we're doing um, Karen Romaley, Danica Starks, Keisha James, Chad Reese, Carrie Hansel, Deborah Levy, and Toby Little in that order. Um, Karen Romaley, two minutes when you are ready. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Moon and members of the committee. My name is Karen Romaley. I live in Reisterstown in District 10 in Speaker Adrian Jones's district. I am a volunteer with the Baltimore County Local Group of the Maryland Chapter of Moms Demand Action. I am here in support of HB 1012 and I ask for a favorable report. This bill establishes that police officers are not immune from civil or criminal liability for violations of individuals' constitutional rights. I believe that this is crucial to effective police reform. If law enforcement is not held accountable for violating an individual's rights, then police reform that has been enacted will not have the necessary teeth to allow harmed individuals to receive justice. The, count, the courts may acknowledge that their rights were violated, but uh, on the federal level, since there's no previous case law in which someone else's rights were violated in a similar situation, then the officer cannot be held accountable. It is inappropriate and indeed shameful in a healthy democratic society to allow civil rights violations to continue without redress. There has been much discussion and debate in recent years about poor relationships between law enforcement and the communities in which they work. This situation is rooted in an awareness that law enforcement too often gets away with doing harm, leaving the community members feeling as if their rights do not matter. When citizens feel that way about their government, it undermines trust and weakens the community and our democratic process. Citizens may think to themselves, why should I vote and be an engaged, engaged citizen when my rights ultimately don't matter? Our state as a whole is harmed, but marginalized communities bear an unequal burden. Black people are four times more likely to be killed by police than white people in Maryland. The lack of trust in the police further reduces public safety. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much. Um, next, we'll have Danica Starks. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Klippinger, Vice President, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the committee. My name is Danica Starks. I live in uh, <clears throat> I live in Glendale in District 24, Delegate House District. Um, and I am also a volunteer with um, the Maryland Moms Demand Action Chapter with the Prince George's County Local Group. Um, I am here in support of HB 1012 and I ask for a favorable report out of the committee. This important bill establishes that police officers are not immune from civil or criminal liability for violations of another individual's constitutional rights. It will do away with qualified immunity in Maryland and ensure transparency and accountability in cases where police officers abuse their authority, providing our communities with safeguards against and recourse for instances of police misconduct. According to mapping violence in Maryland, as my predecessor mentioned, black people are four times as likely as white people to be killed by police. In all, 20 people were killed by police in 2021 in Maryland. With the lack of accountability and lack of transparency that qualified immunity case in qualified immunity cases, many of these instances of police violence can go unaddressed and can create a ripple effect, negatively impacting community trust in the police and further reducing public safety. Maryland citizens deserve a right to recourse against excessive use of force or abuse of authority by police officers, the same accountability that all other industries are subject to. As some of our volunteers like to say, that when it comes to qualified immunity, the good cops don't need it and the bad cops don't deserve it. Thank you for your time. All right, next we're gonna have Keisha James for two minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Keisha James and I'm here today on behalf of the National Lawyers Guild National Police Accountability Project, NPAP, in support of HB 1012. NPAP is a nonprofit organization dedicated to holding law enforcement and corrections officers and their employers accountable for violating constitutional and professional standards. Victims of police misconduct need a clear path to hold officers accountable for misconduct. Victims have tangible injuries, including medical costs, lost wages due to missing work, and emotional trauma, among others. 
However, qualified immunity shields the officers responsible for these injuries from liability and forces the victims themselves to bear the costs of police misconduct. By eliminating this shield, HB 1012 will ensure that all victims have access to justice. The reforms passed last year were incredibly important for holding law enforcement officers more accountable. However, those reforms did not address the, the inability of victims to seek justice for police misconduct due to the qualified immunity defense. HB 1012 specifically addresses this issue. One concern often raised in opposition to eliminating qualified immunity is that doing so will somehow prevent law enforcement from doing their jobs effectively, which will lead to an increase in crime. However, there is no evidence to support this claim. In fact, as uh, Delegate Wilkins mentioned, Colorado has passed a similar qualified immunity bill. And based on our research and an examination of crime data out of Denver and Colorado Springs, there has not been any increase in violent crime rates since that bill was passed. We support HB 1012 and respectfully urge a favorable report. Thank you. All right, next we'll have two minutes from Chad Reese. Thank you, Vice Chair Moon and members of the committee. My name is Chad Reese, and I'm with the Institute for Justice, a public interest law firm and advocacy organization. Uh, for my written testimony uh, is in support of HB 1012. I'd just like to highlight a couple of brief points today that I think might be especially important given the overall conversations that uh, the committee has been having this afternoon through, throughout its session. First, I just wanna emphasize that qualified immunity, frankly, is incompatible with the basic principles of the American justice system. And that's simply because for a right to actually exist, there must be a remedy available to victims whose rights are violated. Qualified immunity, as, as my fellow witnesses have already noted, robs victims of their ability to seek that remedy and essentially hollows out the promises of both the US and Maryland constitutions. Simply put, we believe that if everyday citizens have to follow the law, then government officials should have to follow the constitution and that requires an enforcement mechanism to do so. Second, especially considering the debate over the previous piece of legislation, I just wanna highlight a couple of myths about qualified immunity. Uh, and I'll follow up from, uh, from my friend, Ms. James's comments about Colorado with the first one. And, and just note that while concerns about police retention are real and understandable in states across the country, including in Maryland, we don't actually have good evidence to suggest that ending qualified immunity should give you any heartburn about exacerbating those problems or causing police to leave specifically. In fact, the best numbers we have here are also from Colorado, since that's our clearest example. And that state saw fewer police officers leave their departments in the year after the state ended qualified immunity than left it during the two years prior to that debate. And again, there are a lot of reasons why police might leave the force in today's environment, but there is no reason to believe that ending qualified immunity would exacerbate or accelerate that change. I also understand that many are concerned about increasing frivolous lawsuits against law enforcement if you were to end qualified immunity. But again, I think this is based on a misunderstanding of how qualified immunity works. And I want to assure you that courts are already well equipped and capable of dismissing frivolous lawsuits without qualified immunity. And in fact, by definition, qualified immunity prevents non-frivolous cases from moving forward through the justice system. I also want to emphasize something about good faith officers making reasonable mistakes in the moment. We all understand that split second life or death decisions happen in the world of policing. But I want to remind the committee that the Supreme Court also has a, a separate doctrine in a decision, Graham v. Connor, that requires judges in these cases to use what's known as an objective reasonableness standard and does not permit courts to second guess officers' judgment using 2020 hindsight. That would still exist in a world about, without out qualified time. immunity. So with that, I would just like to encourage the committee to move the piece of legislation forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have two minutes from Kerry Hansel. Thank you, Chairman Moon. It's uh, a pleasure to testify today. As some of you know, I am a civil rights lawyer here in Maryland where I have practiced in that arena for 20 years. Uh, I want to let the uh, committee know that this bill is a crucial building block to any meaningful reform in Maryland. It only eliminates immunity in the instances of violations of our constitutional rights. In a court of law, that is an incredibly high standard for us to meet. It is reprehensible and dangerous misconduct. It is nothing anyone here would stand up to defend, and there is no reason for us to continue to immunize. In fact, the vast majority of the states around the country have done away 
with police immunities of all types. There's a great list of those in a case called Pruitt versus Rosedale. It's out of Mississippi in 1982. So in Mississippi in 1982, they were far ahead of where we stand here in Maryland. Our Court of Appeals has consistently said, this is an issue for this body, but in doing so, the court has begged you to make this change. So this has been called by the Court of Appeals, police immunities have been referred to as a growing injustice, a harsh doctrine. The Court of Special Appeals in a case called Baltimore versus Austin said the application of the doctrine of sovereign immunity has resulted in many cases of unfair and unjust denial of the rights of citizens. It's time today to end it as your courts have begged you to do. Finally, this is a wildly racist doctrine explicitly adopted for that purpose. Maryland through chapter 53 of the acts of 1786 waived sovereign immunity for all of its citizens. That waiver remained into effect until the rise of abolition in Maryland in 1820. And that's when, and that's when these immunities, all of them, police immunities were reinstated explicitly because our new fellow citizens of color would have a right now to sue. Likewise, the Supreme Court first adopted qualified immunity in Pearson versus Ray to deny recovery to freedom riders in the South. That didn't happen until 1967. Until that date, we were free of police immunity and it was only explicitly adopted for the racist reason of denying justice to freedom riders. Uh, and this is a doctrine that is born of racism that our courts instruct is unfair, unreasonable, harsh, and unjust, and it is time for us today to end it, and I applaud Delegate Wilkins' efforts in that regard, and I wholeheartedly support it, and I hope uh, that there is a favorable result from this committee. Thank you so much, Chairman Moon, and I'm more than happy to answer questions to the extent there are. Any. All right, next we'll have two minutes from Deborah Levy. Levy, thank you very much. I actually yield my time to read to you today from the Honorable Carlton Reeves, United States District Judge, from reading from the opinion, Jameson versus McClendon. Clarence Jameson wasn't jaywalking, that was Michael Brown. He wasn't outside playing with a toy gun, that was Tamir Rice. He didn't look like a suspicious person, that was Elijah McClain. He wasn't suspected of selling loose untaxed cigarettes, that was Eric Garner, and he wasn't suspected of passing a counterfeit $20 bill, that was George Floyd. There are 14 more names in this opinion, but with two minutes, I'm going to fast forward in this opinion. Clarence Jameson was a black man driving a Mercedes convertible. As he, he made his way home from South Carolina from a vacation in Arizona, he was pulled over and subjected to 110 minutes of an armed police officer badgering him, pressuring him, lying to him, and then searching him, his car top to bottom for drugs. Nothing was found. He wasn't a drug courier. He's a welder. Thankfully, Jameson left the stop with his life. Too many others have not. The United States Constitution says everyone is entitled to equal protection of the law, even at the hands of law enforcement. Over the decades, however, judges have invented a legal doctrine to protect law enforcement officers from having to face any consequences for wrongdoing. The doctrine is called qualified immunity. In real life, it operates like absolute immunity. In a recent qualified immunity case, the Fourth Circuit, our very own conservative district said, Although we recognize that our police officers are often asked to make split second decisions, we expect them to do so with respect for the dignity and worth of black lives. This court agrees. Tragically, thousands have died at the hands of law enforcement over the years and the death toll continues to rise. In the form of abuse and misconduct by police, qualified immunity has served as a shield for these officers, protecting them from accountability. But let us not be fooled by legal jargon. Immunity is not exoneration and the harm in this case to one man sheds light on the harm done to the nation by this manufactured doctrine. And as the Fourth Circuit concluded, and I quote, this must stop. I urge a favorable, favorable report. Um, thank you very much. Next, we'll hear uh, from Reverend Kobe Little for two minutes. Uh, Kobe, up. Oh, we might be having technical difficulties there. Um, well, why don't we? 
go ahead and begin questions and see if that resolves things. We have three hands up, <clears throat> Cox, Lopez, and Bartlett. Um, I, I hate to do this, but since we have seven uh, witnesses, eight witnesses on this panel, you could try to direct a question to a specific person if you appreciate it, um, Delegate Cox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> Mr. Vice Chair Moon, um, and uh, panelists. Uh, Mr. Hansel, good to see you again, sir. Um, appreciate everyone's testimony and work. Um, Mr. Reese, um, just had a, a quick question. Uh, you made a comment, and I look, I, I think everybody here in this committee believes in holding people accountable. I mean, that's um, something that civil rights requires, and we all believe in that. The, the concern that we hear every day is the fact that um, uh, that you touched on, and that is that there's no evidence that this will dissuade uh, individuals from signing up to be police officers in Maryland. However, uh, are you aware of the shortages in Maryland at this moment after the last year's bills went through? Uh, yes, sir. And, and I've heard that that same from the other witnesses today on, on other bills. What, what I would suggest is, is something I mentioned in my testimony is I think there are a lot of reasons, some related to police reform efforts, some related to living through a pandemic and the challenges that that is, has put on folks, um, and some just to the rhetoric, oh. regardless of what policy actually gets placed. And I think it's hard to disentangle those, which is why I cited Colorado's example, which gives us a pretty clean look at what happens when a state actually removes qualified immunity. Well, I can assure you, I'm in every jurisdiction, all 24 jurisdictions of Maryland. I talk to the sheriff's departments, I talk to the police, and I can assure you that uh, you're, mis you're misunderstanding the reasoning. Um, uh, for instance, my own sheriff's office in Frederick County is uh, regularly about 50 officers shy of applications. Now, after they, after they get officers to apply, they still have a very stringent vetting process, which knocks out a huge majority of those that actually apply, and they're, and they're literally um, dozens and dozens shy of those who even wish to apply. And the number one thing that we're told is because this state is exposing them personally um, versus sovereign immunity, which would potentially allow for constitutional torts. Um, this is going much beyond that and say, let's, let's waive malice issues. Let's just turn this on its head and, and allow us to pierce immunity for, for virtually any reason um, of a mistake or anything like that. And I know, you know, some of you are experts in this area, but that's the actual understanding of what's going on on the ground. And it concer it's concerning because why would anybody want to, you know, apply for a job as a police officer in Maryland and bring their family through that if it's, if it's going to be different uh, and expose them differently personally than, say, another great state that might even be paying them more. So uh, that's just a concern I have, and um, I appreciate your time, though. So isn't that so? I, I, I'll just respond very briefly. And, and I think that you hit on something really important, which is there's a lot of messaging work to be done to actually explain to law enforcement what other options and protections they have. You know, I mentioned the Graham v. Connor standard for a reason. And I think it doesn't come up in these, these situations or these conversations enough. And I, I honestly do worry that a lot of law enforcement folks and potential recruits don't realize that the Supreme Court has also said that they have that objective reason, reasonableness standard. Uh, in the in these cases, but uh, but your point is well taken, sir, and I, I do sympathize with the challenges that the law enforcement agencies have in recruitment. If, if I may, Delegate Cox, one thing to understand is that this statute may provide individual officers better protections. There's a provision here that the government pays and then can recover from the officer, but only to the tune of five percent or twenty five thousand, whichever is the lower. I have seen cases, many many cases in Maryland where the state or the, or the local government abandons the officer entirely if a jury comes back with gross negligence or malice. And I have judgments now in the seven figure range against officers individually. So I think the answer to the recruiting problem is to vote for this because this provides greater protections to individual officers, but incentivizes departments to make change by having them bear more than they presently bear of the risk. Because under current law, if there's a finding of gross malice or negligence, it goes directly to the officer and he pays and it, and it might be uncapped. Under this provision, uh, even with those findings, the government pays and the officer is only liable to the government for 5% or 25,000, whichever is lower. 
So there's a very good argument that this provides more protection to most officers than current law, uh, while also fairly compensating victims, while also assuring us that where the real problem lies, which is the culture of departments and the training provided by departments, that there is a remedy being brought, that there is some motivation for change. So I, so I think that's what I would say to the law enforcement officers that you meet with. Uh, and, and if they understood that, they might encourage you to vote for this, as I certainly would. But I thank you for your service, sir. Well, well I appreciate that, Mr. Hansel. And I, I certainly didn't realize there was uh, this strict cap of 5% or 25,000. So in that context, are you familiar with any uh, departments across the nation that may be utilizing this standard and whether or not insurance companies will cover the officer? Does the officer have to take out the insurance policy for that? Or how does that work? So, so this is not a question of requiring insurance by statute, but yes, there are insurance companies who will cover these things. Here in Maryland, uh, we don't have commercially available insurance because there's a local government insurance trust, uh, but they operate just like an insurance company and, and, and are uh, describe themselves that way on their website. And so they in fact pay similar judgments so one would have uh, no reason to doubt that commercially available insurance might step in if the officers felt that they had a very high risk of committing constitutional misconduct, meeting that extraordinarily high bar, and that even if they met that extraordinarily high bar, that they were going to do more than 25000 in damage. And on that off chance that they met that standard, also above that wanted insurance, I'm sure someone would step into the void. But again, I, you know, the risk to officers with the, individually with the passage of this bill, I think comes down. And I, I say that as somebody who's done this work for 20 years. Uh, but on the other hand, we are still holding them individually responsible. We're balancing between uh, uh, providing something for the victim, right? Penalizing the individual officer, and most importantly, driving reform on the part of the agency that is problematic. What we see in Maryland, and we don't, I don't have to list them for you. Everybody on this call knows Maryland has significant problems in certain jurisdictions. That tells us this is not a one bad apple situation. This is instead, more often than not, a jurisdictional problem. And this allows a jurisdictional solution because the government has to pay. So we have a solution matching the problem. There, there's only one uh, jurisdiction in Maryland that's under a consent decree right now. Right. I mean, we know from from history, historically, all of us who have studied these issues, that there are uh, jurisdiction wide problems. And that's the beauty of this solution is it spreads uh, uh, the the fix somewhat to the officer, mostly to the jurisdiction. Under current law, it's one or the other. It's black and white. One or the other pays everything. Again, that's wrong. Under current law, in many cases, the officer can be liable for an uncapped amount. This brings that, caps that liability at 25,000 at most. And again, I have judgments individually against individual officers, officers now in the mid to high seven figures. And I can give you the cases, they're reported cases. So if an officer wants to look at those cases and weigh his risk in that environment versus this environment, he's much better off in this environment. And in fact, this could be a recruiting tool if, if people are worried about that. Now, my own belief is the number of officers who take the time to study the Maryland or local government tort claims act and get into the minutia of this before deciding to become officers is zero. So I think the risk that anything we do on this bill affects recruiting is zero because I don't think people are generally aware of it. But if they are, this is a better arrangement. All right, we're gonna um, go back to Kobe Little. It looks like uh, the sound is working, so two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here today to offer uh, support for House Bill 1012, ending qualified immunity. Uh, Attorney Hansel has made many of the points uh, that I made, so I won't read all of my prepared testimony, but I do want to underscore the fact that qualified immunity is rooted in racism and discrimination and it has been used to block civil rights remedies. And that's why it's so important for this body, for the Maryland uh, General Assembly to end qualified immunity in Maryland so that people whose civil rights are violated um, do actually have remedies 
and so that we don't continue as a state to perpetuate structural racism and discrimination. Look, we have an opportunity to create law enforcement uh, departments that the community trusts and that individuals want to work for. But as long as there is distrust in the community for law enforcement, law enforcement will have a problem recruiting people from the community to come and work uh, in law enforcement. So the arguments that we've heard on this bill and on other bills about how hard it will be to recruit uh, police officers because of this legislation, look, it's already hard to recruit police officers and it has nothing to do with any of these bills like House Bill 123 or House Bill 1012 or House Bill 638 or House Bill 991. It has nothing to do with those bills and it has everything to do with the fact that police cor corruption is rampant and there is no clear path for security and the job for officers as it stands. This legislation, uh, as Attorney Hansel and others have already uh, pointed out, provides some uh, remedies and reassurances and creates a more stable environment for officers to work in. So with that, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee, we do urge a favorable report. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We will return to questions. Um, committee, we have seven bills left still after this one. Seven bills. Um, so, uh, specific question, specific person, please. Delegate Lopez. Thank you, Chair Moon. I'll make this, I'll make this brief. Uh, my question is for Mr. Hansel or for Mr. Reese. We've talked a lot about recruitment and retention and ending, um, the lack of an impact, I guess, that ending qualified immunity has had on those two, um, features of law enforcement. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how ending qualified immunity might've had an impact on behavior of the officers. I think it has an impact on recruiting because I think most officers are fantastic human beings who do a great job. And I say that as somebody who spent 20 years trying to hunt and root out bad officers. And I'm going to spend another 20 years doing that. I won't be done. But most of them are fantastic people. So we do not have a group of officers who say to themselves, my God, I can't become a police officer because I want to violate people's rights and I'll be liable. I don't think that exists. That's my, I really don't. Now, on the flip side, how does it help? I think it helps tremendously because we have officers who understand they're going to be in an environment with other officers who also do good. And believe me when I tell you, I have also represented officers for many years in a wide variety of contexts, including in employment matters. And officers, the vast majority of them, are wonderful people who want to do good and they don't want to be part of an organization where there is pressure to cover up or defend misconduct. Some of the toughest conversations I've had representing officers in misconduct cases is when the officer comes to me and says, Carrie, I know my fellow officer did wrong. What do I do? How do I handle it? That's the most vexing situation for these people. They don't want to work with bad officers in, in the same way that none of us would want to work I wouldn't want to associate with an attorney in my profession and share a case with that person who was going to break the rules. No, no delegate on this panel, on this committee, would want to associate or work with a delegate who was going to take a bribe. You'd want nothing to do with that because you're good people. That's the officers. Now, what qualified immunity does for those officers is it makes it easier for people like me to do my job if we get rid of qualified immunity. Because what it means is I can help eliminate the people that would do wrong. I can make sure, and as Mr. Reese wisely pointed out, keep in mind, immunities only matter if there is a finding of violations of constitutional rights. We're only talking, they're irrelevant if the, if it, the issue didn't happen, because then I'm not gonna win that case, or the, it's, the case gets dismissed because my client was just wrong. Immunities only matter, only come into the equation to stop righteous claims. And officers want righteous claims pursued against fellow officers because they don't want to work with bad officers any more than one of you wants to wake up one day and find out you worked on a bill with somebody who took a bribe for it. Imagine the nightmare of that. They, and, and it's no different for officers, 99.9% .9 of you whom are wonderful human beings doing a great job for us. So, so allowing people like me to do my job, allowing the court system to work, getting rid of what our courts have called unfair, unjust, 
harsh, all those quotes I gave you were directly from our appellate courts, is only going to elevate policing in Maryland and make the environment better. As to Delegate Cox's point, this is greater protection than current law allows. It caps any potential uh, liability for the individual officer, focuses on the department where the wrong is. So, so Delegate Lopez, my answer is, I think this makes the environment better. Uh, does it take some time? Sure. Are there people who are going to misunderstand it in the short term? Yes. But, but I think your job is to be wiser than that. And, and I think that's what this committee does. And, and I think it's something you should support for that reason. All right, Delegate Bartlett, Grammer, Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hansel, I have just some quick questions for you, if, you, if, you, if I could. Um, so um, you said there's a high bar for violation of um, someone's civil rights, right? Um, can you just give like one example, just one example of a constitution, constitutional violation that would um, that would fall within, you know, overcoming what we have now is qualified immunity, but where someone could um, um, win a case um, where there is no qualified immunity? That's one quick question, just one example. And then, because I, I have one quick, other quick question. Sure. I'll, I'll give you a great example where I lost a case on qualified immunity. Uh, that's the last thing any lawyer wants to talk about is cases they lose. So, you know, I'm giving you an accurate report. Many years ago in uh, uh, Baltimore. I guess, I, hold on. I'm sorry, Mr. Hansel. My question is actually where someone would win a case because you right. said it's a high bar. So I want to know when, where someone would win a case um, uh, and, under, and, oh, under the, the, the bill, where, you know, how, how it exists now. Right. Yeah. Well, so I was going to give you an example of where I lost one under the existing regime and how this would fix it and change it. Is that what you're okay. looking for? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. But we got to go fast. <laughs> okay. But very quickly, very quickly. The, the under current law, qualified immunity precludes recovery, uh, even where there are constitutional violations. Uh, it, for instance, in cases that uh, where the right may not be well established. So anytime it's the first test of that issue, you're denied uh, uh, your rights. The Freedom Riders in the Pearson case that I mentioned, the court said, well, this is the first time we've thought about Freedom Riders. So, so you can't recover, even though we find it unconstitutional. Uh, a case I had where if this were passed, the result would change is many years ago, there was a woman and people will recognize it. And because I don't want, even though she was, her family's a client of mine, I'm not gonna mention her name because I'm not, I don't want them to relive too much of the trauma, but I, I think people on this committee will recall it. There was a woman in Baltimore who had an abusive husband, had gotten away from him. Uh, police officers were refusing to serve the warrant on him to keep her safe. Instead, were texting with him, including telling him things that would help him find her. Uh, including telling him things that would help him avoid arrest by other officers who might see the warrant. They, con they uh, conspired with this man to ensure his freedom. What he did, what he used it to do, she was pregnant at the time. He met her on the courthouse steps because it was the one place he knew she'd be when she went to go for the last piece of the protective order and stabbed her to death, killing her and her unborn child. She left three children. Uh, that case was dismissed and I lost because of qualified immunity. If these immunities were not permitted, those are three children who would have something of a life in, instead of growing up without a mother, with a father in jail who'd murdered their mother, and with a government who cared not that the police actively worked uh, to keep that man out of jail to prevent him uh, from uh, being arrested and allow that attack to happen. And we had the text messages okay. and everything else. Okay, good example. Now, what was the case that you mentioned? You said there was a case that had a long list of... Um, yes. Yeah, so, can I have that case, please? Yes, of course, Delegate. Um, so that case actually happens to be out of Mississippi, and it is Pruitt versus Rode Rosedale, P-R-U-E-T-T -T versus R-O-S-E-D-A-L-E. -E. It's a Mississippi case from 1982. And that has the cases as of 82. And I will email your office with the other states that since then have been added to the list. But you will see that the vast majority of the states have taken this step. One more, one last quick question. 
if there are three officers involved, if you can answer this as quickly as possible, if there's three officers involved or four officers involved, like the situation that you gave, um, would, I mean, I know comparative negligence, but this wouldn't go under, would it go under comparative negligence? No. So how, no. Would, how would that be divided? And would each officer have the 5% or the 25,000, whichever is less? Yes, it's per officer. The reason it would work that way is because when there are multiple officers, the jury in its verdict assigns a damage amount for each officer. So their, their amounts are different very often. In fact, that's the vast majority of the time because of their actions are different and a jury makes that decision. Therefore, the each would have a different amount that that 5% would apply to or the 25,000 would apply to. Uh, so okay. yes, it, 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 it floats by the culpability of the officer, which accomplishes the goal, of course, of the civil justice system. Right, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Delegate Grammer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the gentle lady from the Office of the Public Defender, is it Miss Levy, is that how you pronounce that? Uh, I'll stick with you today, we've been doing okay. So we, anytime we talk about qualified immunity, we, we immediately go to law enforcement. Uh, is there a reason if we, if we did move something on qualified immunity that we wouldn't do it for any agent of the government, any public official? Because qualified immunity applies unilaterally, is that correct? That is correct. My experience as a public defender, and I like to stay inside of my lane, is focused on how it relates to the work that I do. So Mr. Hansel could speak better to that, but just staying inside my lane, that's how I analyze the issue. Well, I'll, I'll break the chair's rules and I'll ask Mr. Hansel then. I'm going to break speak? my rules and be brief. The answer is yes, absolutely. <laughs> this should be applied across the board. It's only fair and just. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Delegate Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is to uh, Reverend Little. What do you think about the 5% or the two, uh, uh, $25,000 uh, limits? I'm in support of the legislation as presented by Delegate uh, Wilkins. Obviously, I don't think there should be a cap, but I support uh, this as a strong step in the, in the right direction. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm specifically asking you about the cap. What do you What do you think about the cap? I just told you, okay. I don't think there should be a cap. Okay. But I support the legislation as presented by Delegate Wilkins, who I think is doing an outstanding job on this issue. And, you know, we don't get all that we want, but I think this is an important step in the right direction. Thank you so very much. Mr. Vice Chair, quick clarification, please. Yes. I just wanted to clarify, make sure everyone um, is clear. The, the victim would be made whole. The victim would receive the full judgment, whatever the full judgment is. It's just that the officer has to reimburse their employer or the jurisdiction of 5% or $25,000. So the officer has some skin in the game. And the reason why there's a cap is that you know, officers might not have, you know, $100,000 or something like that to reimburse. We do want to make sure that there is some skin in the game for them to also pay out some of that judgment. So I just wanted to clarify how that, that works. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. That looks like the end of the questions for the um, favorable panel. Uh, we have, I believe, two people signed up in addition. One um, in opposition and one uh, testifying for with information. So let's go ahead and bring Chaz Ball and Jay Schweikert up. All right, I see Chaz Ball and Jay. All right, they're both in. Um, you each have two minutes, um, Chaz Ball, whenever you are ready. Yes, thank you. My, um, th thank you again for hearing from me. I I worked under a, a contract from Baltimore City representing law enforcement officers sued in their official capacities, and that in that contract, I've represented officers in over two hundred cases, um, and and this is both in state court and federal court. And I want to start with this very very important fact: qualified immunity as a doctrine does not exist in state court. Qualified immunity as a doctrine does not exist in state court. Waiving qualified immunity in state court isn't doing anything because in the state of Maryland, there is no qualified immunity that exists in state court.
Did we just lose Chaz Ball? Okay, well, that was, it ended on a conclusory sounding statement, but we can um, restore <laughs> restore some time when, uh, uh, when and if Chaz Ball returns. Um, why don't we skip over to Jay Schweikert um, for two minutes? This is an informational witness. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, my, I, I'm an attorney uh, with the Cato Institute's Project on Criminal Justice, and my focus for the last um, nearly four years now has been the doctrine of qualified immunity. Uh, I think the pre, uh, so we're, while we don't take a position on uh, any particular piece of legislation, um, uh, we have chosen this issue as a priority because we see it as the biggest stumbling block to meaningful accountability in the criminal justice system. Um, the previous panelists have ably explained a lot of the features of qualified immunity that I normally talk about. So I simply want to elaborate on two points that I think may be helpful uh, for further consideration. One is that qualified immunity is not a good faith defense. It has nothing to do with whether an officer was acting reasonably or whether they made a good faith mistake of judgment. Um, and in fact, there are plenty of cases where officers were explicitly acting in bad faith, even intending to violate someone's constitutional rights. And they still received qualified immunity for the sole reason that there was no previous case with sufficiently similar facts as their own. So the doctrine ends up uh, meaning that whether a victim can get relief for misconduct turns pretty much entirely on the happenstance of the fact patterns of prior cases in their jurisdiction. Um, the second point I want to make is just to, to, to add a, a little bit of, of perspective to this conversation around the effect on police um, recruitment. Um, and there was there was discussion earlier uh, in the day about this idea that there needs to be trust on both sides. Uh, I believe the um, uh, the representative from the Virginia FOP made that point. And I, I agree with that point at that level of generality. And that's why I think that this doctrine, eliminating qualified immunity, will be as much of a boon to law enforcement, to professional police officers, as it will be uh, to ordinary members of the public. Because the part of the reason why policing is so difficult these days and why there is a retention and morale problem is the fact that the public accurately perceives that when police officers do commit misconduct, they are not held accountable. And even if it's only a small proportion of officers committing that sort of egregious misconduct, when they are not held accountable because of doctrines like qualified immunity, the entire profession suffers that reputational loss. And so professional officers have as much to benefit as anyone else. And so while I can understand why, um, you know, members of the law enforcement profession at the moment may feel that the profession is under attack, I think it's, it's the job of, uh, you know, the representatives of that community and of lawmakers to explain what really is and is not at stake in this discussion and why um, ensuring that unprofessional officers are held accountable is going to be something that benefits everyone in the entire profession. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, and it looks like we've got Chaz Ball back. So um, Chaz, you probably have a you know, minute and a half or whatever left, so go, go on ahead. Uh, you're on mute. The other aspects of this, this bill that are problematic, under the current law of the state of Maryland, officers can be sued either through the Maryland Tort Claims Act or through the Local Government Tort Claims Act. Both of those have provisions where the municipality can actually seek uh, to get money back from the individual officer that exists now. In existence now, in order for a municipality to, to get that money from an individual officer, there has to be a finding of actual malice on the part of that officer, as, oppo as opposed to this bill where it says the municipality shall seek 5% or up to um, 25,000 from the officer, meaning there could be a, a lawsuit that's completely frivolous. And as opposed to being able to have that matter resolved for some low nominal amount in, in the early, you know, in the early. Individual would have to continue to go through a trial to prove their innocence as, as to not have to pay money out of their own pocket. This is going to lead more cases to actually go to trial, even if they're, they're frivolous, when they might be settled for some nominal value early on. It also creates a, a conflict between the muni municipality and the officer because the, 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 the city or the county may want to just resolve a suit early, but the officer is not going to want to do it because they're going to have to pay a fine that, that will come with it. 
Um, those are those. And, and, and in addition to that, Mr. Hansel is on. Mr. Hansel has made um, has been very successful in his career suing law enforcement officers under this bill. It also includes a provision where attorney fees on top of whatever judgment um, would have to be awarded. That that creates more money coming from municipalities, more money coming from the state of Maryland that's not necessary because there, there's been no evidence, there is no evidence um, that in, that these matters aren't getting pursued because Maryland doesn't allow for attorney's fees. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions for this panel? All right, thank you very much, everybody. That's gonna conclude the hearing on House Bill 10 12 we're going to go to house bill 429 um, from delegate lopez and this one has um we're going to try another seven person favorable panel on this one um, we'll call them in this order melody cooper joanna silver nikki owens matt parsons um, deborah levy yannette emmanuel and don dalton in that order um, so Delegate Lopez, you'll have three minutes and the witnesses will each have two. And Delegate Lopez, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, patient and enduring colleagues and judiciary. For the record, my name is Delegate Leslie Lopez and I'm here to ask for your support for HB 429 called Qualms Law, which is a bill that offers simple clarification of our body-worn camera language in the policing reform package that this committee passed last year. To put it succinctly, the Office of the Attorney General understood the bill to be specific to certain tasks performed by officers as opposed to certain positions held by officers. In effect, plainclothes officers are treated the same as undercover officers, and that is primarily what this bill seeks to clarify. In an effort to be comprehensive, this bill, as amended, includes, includes municipal police departments and also police in secondary employment. HB 429 closes gaps to ensure that the intent of the legislation last year to ensure all public facing police officers who carry firearms are monitored by body worn cameras is met. This is a small tweak in language and with so many agencies already compliant, some may argue that it's so small it might not even be necessary but there is a big need for this minor change. In January 2021, as this committee began hearing police reform bills, Gaithersburg City Police shot and killed Quimena Okram, a 24-year-old man in my district. His mother, Melody Cooper, will be testifying today. The officers were in plain clothes and were not wearing body cameras. Despite the lack of physical evidence supporting their version of events, there was no body cam footage a jury could review, and they subsequently chose not to indict the officers on any criminal charges. The bill, as amended, ensures that the use of body cameras apply to the following categories of officers, municipal police officers, plainclothes police officers, who categorically have a much higher rate of misconduct allegations. The members of Baltimore City's now disgraced gun trafficking task force were plainclothes officers, and a study of New York City's police force found that they were involved in seven times more killings than uniformed officers. Police officers in uniform secondary employment are also included. Many police departments allow their officers to work part-time for private employers. When officers are working security-related employment, they are being paid to function as police officers and are able to use their same department-issued equipment that they use for their primary job. These amendments also make it clear that officers working in an undercover capacity are not plainclothes officers and are therefore excluded. These changes are not particularly radical, and many departments already operate with, under these standards. Shortly after Quimena was killed, the Gaithersburg City Police Department voluntarily adopted a policy that encompasses both plainclothes officers and uh, those in security-related secondary appointment, covering all three categories of officer that this officers that this bill aims to address as well. So to conclude, this bill, HB 429, continues our work on police reform from last year to ensure that the benefits of body-worn cameras for both officers and the public increase public safety, protection against fraudulent lawsuits, and greater trust between the police and the community, that those benefits are extended to every category of public facing officer. I thank you and I urge a favorable report. 
All right, um, let's start with Melody Cooper for two minutes. Good day. I am Ms. Melody S. Cooper, the mother of now deceased Kwamina Akron. My son was murdered just over a year ago by plainclothes Gaithersburg City police officers who were not wearing body-worn cameras. I wish to tell you a little bit about my son, who was born a prince and died a king. He started preparing four-course meals at the age of 12. At 14, he learned auto mechanics. He was an avid athlete, an honor roll student. He won several trophies for football in Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware. My son also played baseball. Kwame and I received a silver and bronze medal for swimming and was recognized on CNN. He taught his niece how to swim when he was 15 and she was only four. Before Kwame and I turned 22, he became a Maryland certified licensed roofing contractor and an outstanding rap artist who started rapping at the age of two. Kwame and I wrote his own lyric composed, arranged, performed, and recorded his own music. Kwame and I was a loving son, a wonderful brother, terrific uncle, nephew, and cousin, a loyal friend. They have stolen my baby from me and which part of my soul has been ripped out because these officers who killed my son were not wearing cameras. It was only their voices and their lies that was heard at the grand jury that decided not to charge them with my son's murder. If they had been wearing body cameras, there would be no question as to what happened to my child. Bill 429 should not only be important to me, but everyone involved because the community needs to be protected from these officers. Plainclothes officers are more cocky and, than uniform officers, like they can break the law because they're not wearing a uniform. I am here advocating against police brutality to ensure the bill 429 becomes law so that no one else will have to go through what I have. As a result of my son's death, I will never be whole again. It has cost me my livelihood, paralyzed with pain, a mother's love. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Joanna Silver for two minutes. Thank you. My name is Joanna Silver and I live in Silver Spring. I am the co-chair of the policy committee for the Silver Spring Justice Coalition and I am testifying on its behalf in favor of HB 429. When Melody Cooper asked SSJC if last year's body-worn camera law would have required the plainclothes Gaithersburg City officers who killed her son to wear body-worn cameras, we didn't know the answer. We later learned that the law wasn't clear. And so we are here today to ask you to clarify that it does not matter if an officer is in uniform or plain clothes, working for a county or a municipality, on duty or working uniform secondary employment. Body-worn cameras protect everyone and they should be used as widely as possible. This bill will not dramatically change camera use in Maryland. Almost half of Maryland's municipal police departments already have body-worn camera programs. The city of Gaithersburg already includes secondary employment in their program, and they added plainclothes officers in response to the killing of Kwamina Akron. Seven Maryland counties require or permit officers working secondary employment to use body-worn cameras, and eight counties include non-uniform officers in their programs. Including plainclothes officers in particular is critical because these officers have higher rates of misconduct and excessive force than uniformed officers. Baltimore's Gun Trace Task Force being one obvious example. And plainclothes does not mean undercover. Undercover officers will be exempted under an amendment to the bill. Moreover, camera use by plainclothes officers does not violate Maryland's wiretap law. That law spells out exactly what a non-uniformed officer must do to comply. Nor should privacy concerns stop you from making these common sense clarifications. Policies and jurisdictions that have body-worn cameras already address the privacy of witnesses and victims, and under the guidance of the Police Training and Standards Commission, those policies can evolve to encompass any new concerns that might arise. Finally, we take the same position on funding as Vice Chair Moon did in defending his bill. The state has money to spend. If jurisdictions need financial support, they should get it. We ask you to issue a favorable report. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Nikki. I might have been muted. 
I said, thank you. Next, we'll hear from Nikki Owens for two minutes. Nikki Owens, are you uh, available? So you need to unmute yourself. All right, we might be having issues with Nikki Owens. Um, we can come back. Let's skip to Matt Parsons for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Moon, uh, committee members. Again, I'm Matt Parsons with Baltimore Action Legal Team. Um, I want to reiterate what some of my fellow witnesses have stated in support of this bill. Um, but mostly note that in the aftermath of the Baltimore uh, Police Department's gun trace task force scandal, uh, body worn cameras uh, have grown in support as a proven means to increase police accountability and deter officer misconduct and brutality. Um, the ability to operate in plain clothes is what emboldened, emboldened the gun trace task force members uh, to do things like systematically plant drugs and handguns on innocent citizens alongside a bevy of other misconduct. Um, in his post-arrest debriefing, one of the defendants, Momodou Gondo, estimated as many as 70% of BPD members in plain clothes units were stealing money from suspects or the residences. That's not a scientific number, it's anecdotal, but it's still deeply troubling, coming from someone who was part of the GTTF. Um, and you know, throughout the years of this misconduct, it's led to over 800 criminal cases being overturned. Um, this systemic harm may not have been like prevented, but it could have been at least curtailed had we required plainclothes officers to wear body-worn cameras. Um, and to also cite the recently released step-toe investigation into the GTTF, um, the investigators also support a robust body-worn camera policy. Um, they directly cite body-worn cameras as, and I quote, a powerful tool to deter and detect corruption and misconduct. So we believe this bill offers Maryland residents uh, some relief from officer misconduct and also offers black and brown communities uh, security for their physical health and mental health. And so we urge a favorable report on HB 429. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna try one more time to see if we can unmute Nikki Owens on our end. Um, just give it a second here. If this doesn't work, um, we might have to um, keep moving on. Yeah, all right, it looks like we're having issues. Um, we'll, we'll keep trying with uh, Nikki. Let's um, skip over to Deborah Levy for two minutes. Good evening. Uh, I've testified on numerous bills today. I appreciate the committee's uh, a commitment, dedication, patience, and attentiveness. I will uh, explain that we have already provided written testimony. I will adopt the comments of my fellow panelists and urge a favorable report for 429. All right, thank you very much. Um, now let's go to Yannette Emanuel for two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Vice Chair Moon and members of the committee. My name is Yannette Emanuel, Interim Public Policy Director with the ACLU of Maryland. And I'm here in support of HB 429 on behalf of both my office and the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability. Um, H, as you've heard uh, my colleagues say, HB 429 seeks to fill the gaps uh, of the bill that passed last year by clarifying that the use applies to plainclothes officers, municipal officers, and off-duty police officers um, in uniform secondary employment. Plainclothes officers and off-duty officers, if they work in secondary employment in the agency uniform, often deal with the same incidences as uh, when they are on duty, including situations where they are involved in use of force incidences. Therefore, the same principles and rules for use of body-worn cameras should apply um, to these individuals as well. For the ACLU, the challenge of body-worn cameras is a conflict between their potential to uh, invade privacy and their strong benefit when it comes to police accountability. But overall, we think that this can be a win-win, but only if they're deployed with an appropriate policy framework that ensures they protect the public without becoming yet another system of routine surveillance of the public. And without this framework, their accountability benefits would, ex would not exceed their privacy risks. And we believe that HB 429 incorporates all of the privacy protections um, of SB 71, which passed last year and requires the Maryland Police uh, and Training Standards Commission to issue policies covering a wide range of subjects that protect privacy rights, including when recording is mandatory, prohibited, or discretionary. 
when recording may require the consent of a subject being recorded, when an officer must provide notice of recording, access and confidentiality of recordings, the secure storage of data from the body-worn camera, and specific protections for individuals when there is an, when there is an expectation of privacy in private or public spaces. And any additional um, issues determined to be relevant in the implementation of use of body-worn cameras by law enforcement officers. And so for the foregoing reasons, uh, the ACLU of Maryland urges a favorable report on HB 429. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. And I think third time might be a charm for Nikki Owens. Um, you have two minutes when you're ready. Um, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me speak today. My name is Nikki Owens. I am an impacted family member. I'm the cousin of William Green. He was murdered on January 27th of 2020, not by a plain clothed police officer, but by a uniformed police officer. Um, there was no body cam video. There was no dash cam video. My cousin was handcuffed. He was searched, handcuffed, and placed in the front seat of a police car. Um, the officer then got into the driver's side of the police car and he fired his weapon seven times at my cousin, striking him six times. There was only, the only reason why we have video of this is because a civilian videotaped this. And that's the only reason why this officer is now in prison and awaiting trial. Um, this was a uniformed officer who, my cousin was not his first use of force case. My cousin was not the first citizen that he killed. This man had a very long history of use of force and he killed my cousin with no regard. There was no hesitation. There was, and he did this without a camera. He knew there was, he knew he was the only witness. His statement as to what happened in that vehicle was two lines where he basically said that my cousin went for his gun and he killed him. That was it. That was his explanation. He feared for his life. If it wasn't for that video, this man would still be walking the street. There was just recently another lawsuit filed against him for use of force. So there are a lot of officers who are out here doing things and they're comfortably doing them because there is no cameras. If this man was comfortable firing his weapon seven times at a handcuffed man, God knows what he's done to other citizens. He's not an exception to the rule. Um, PG County has a long history of use of force against citizens. So I'm here in support of this bill to ensure that not only is there accountability for police officers and their behavior, but also accountability for civilians and their behavior. If the only statement that's that, that is going to be admissible in court is what the officer is writing on a piece of paper because the victim is dead and they can't stand up for themselves, then we're at the, we're at the mercy of just that one account. But with dash cam video, with body cam video, we can get a better picture of what actually occurred, which means that there can be fair information presented to grand juries. And that there can be actually families out here that can get justice, get accountability for their loved ones. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And uh, lastly, we've got Don Dalton for two minutes. Good evening, all, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I am Dawn Dalton. I am the mother of a directly impacted young man from Prince George's County, Maryland, who was brutalized by the police. Um, I'm here in support of the bill HB 429. I totally stand in support of Ms. Cooper. Um, and just justice for everyone. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the footage off of my son's actual cell phone is what exonerated my son um, eventually. But I just feel like this is pretty much a no brainer. I feel like everyone's protected or better protected, I would say, 
um, by actually having video footage. And I just really feel like it's, it's really no debate to me. At the end of the day, we're saving lives and I really feel like lives are worth more than any anything. I mean, at the end of the day, I really don't see what the debate is. So I had a script ready, but after hearing what everyone had to say, I totally agree with um, all the testimony that I've heard this evening. And I highly encourage you and urge you to please um, pass this bill because this is, this is life-changing. It's life-saving on both sides. It, it saves the police. It saves um, community members. It saves money. It saves us from lawsuits, you know, all across the board, I, I think it's life changing. So thank you for letting me speak. All right, are there any questions for this panel? Seeing none, we do have um, a couple folks signed up in opposition. So let's go ahead and bring them on. Um, Bill George and David Morris. <clears throat> See, Bill George is connecting. Um, Bill, you you have two minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you to the chair and members of the committee. Uh, Bill George with the Maryland Municipal League today in, in opposition to the bill as written. Um, I'd like to just reiterate that our, our opposition to this bill is rooted in the unfunded mandate on municipal agencies uh, and not so much on the instances in which an officer must wear the camera we're certainly not opposed to the broader, uh, the premise of broader usage of body cameras throughout the state. Um, just take this opportunity to make a case for additional state funding um, to assist our municipal police agencies in the in the rollout of uh, of new programs. Um, and for those that have already taken the leap um, and have their body camera programs uh, up and running within the municipal world, um, let me reiterate uh, that. MML looks forward to working with the committee uh, on potential ways to help mitigate the cost burden um, of body cameras to local agencies. I want to thank um, uh, everybody that's, that's testified um, and the uh, frank, honest, and good faith discussions that there appear to be um, some uh, appetite for um, potential state funding to assist our local agencies in uh, adopting broader use of body cameras. So uh, with that, um, we uh, just like to reiterate that it's a it's opposition to the unfunded mandate um, and that that specific piece of the bill. All right, thank you. And uh, next, David Morris for two minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. David Morris speaking on behalf of the Maryland Chiefs of Police and the Maryland Sheriff's Association in opposition to House Bill 429. Uh, for the record, I've served 36 years as a law enforcement officer, having served 26 years, retired as a police major with Prince George's County and recently retired as the chief of police for the town of Riverdale Park. Maryland chiefs and sheriffs have long supported the use of body-worn cameras as a means of accountability and transparency. More often than not, these videos clearly demonstrate that our law enforcement officers are well-trained, well-equipped, and professional in their interactions with the public. I wanna be clear that the policies, I hear the conversation about off-duty and secondary employment. Let's be clear, the policies of most of the police agencies, if not all in Maryland, require the use of body-worn cameras when officers are engaged in secondary employment of a law enforcement major. Uh, that's not what this bill does. And this bill goes, is, is frankly a bridge too far. The, bri the bill requires law enforcement officers, regardless of uniform or plain clothes, to. Uh, status to wear a body-worn camera. Furthermore, it requires a law enforcement officer to wear a body-worn camera if they carry a firearm issued by their agency while off-duty and in the public. This is hardly a small tweak. Even if hypothetically this bill made for good public policy, the fiscal note would minimally double if not triple the cost of a body-worn camera program. The fiscal note aside, the Maryland Chiefs and Maryland Sheriffs have previously offered the logical arguments as it relates to uniform versus plain clothes officers wearing a body worn camera. So I'll focus my comments on the provision of off duty law enforcement officers wearing a body worn camera while armed. State and federal law permits off duty officers to wear and carry a firearm under certain circumstances. The Law Enforcement Officer Safety Act, known as LEOSA, was enacted in 2004 
and it was passed to provide consistent application of these laws when officers, whether active or retired, travel from one state to the next. Departmental policy requires officers to be armed when they are off duty so they are prepared to respond in the direst of circumstances to protect lives. Requiring police officers to wear body-worn cameras while off duty, as this bill clearly states, whether those officers are shopping in their local stores, coaching your children's soccer teams, praying next to you in church or synagogues or other places of worship, or having an intimate dinner with our significant other is an unjustified and unwarranted and undeserved invasion of personal privacy and the privacy of their friends and family. Off-duty officers are required by policy to conceal their firearm when off-duty. This bill creates the equivalent of a scarlet letter, except that it poses a significant risk to the safety of our officers, their family members, and members of the community because it readily broadcasts that this person is an armed off-duty law enforcement officer. If persistent aerial surveillance goes too far in violate, violating civil rights, does this bill not violate the civil rights of our law enforcement officers? It's blatantly unfair, biased, and for these reasons and a host of others, the Maryland Chiefs and Sheriffs recommend an unfavorable report. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. All right, we have two hands, uh, Delegate Lopez and then Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question for, for Mr. Morris, um, I assume that you wrote your comments before the amendments were publicly made available because a lot of your concerns, I think were addressed in the amendments, specifically around um, you know the off-duty officers. In the amendments, I would, I would draw the committee's attention to uh, one of the amendments that's very specific to that. It talks about secondary appointment that's approved by the law enforcement agency. So no, it's not you know going to the grocery store at your place of worship. There's, there's clearly um, provisions in line for, for that already. Um, but Mr. Morris, I want, so much of our conversation has really been about the costs associated with body-worn cameras. And I wanted to get your insights about um, a report that was referenced earlier today. It's out of the University of Chicago, which is, um, you know, as an academic institution, it's, it's very conservative. But they had a report that came out just last year, and this is from their uh, Council on Criminal Justice, that basically said the cost of benefit ratio for body worn cameras is five to one. So for every $1 invested in the program, there's a $5 return on that investment. So I'm, I'm just wondering um, what your reaction is to that. Well, Delegate, first off, we were not afforded the amendment. So yes, my testimony was based upon the bill that was written and we'll take and the Maryland Chiefs and Sheriffs will review those amendments and we'll get back to you and, and, and address any additional concerns that we may have. As it relates to the study, I haven't seen that study. But as I indicated in my initial testimony, the chiefs and sheriffs fully support the body-worn camera program. As the chief of police in the town of Riverdale Park, I implemented both an in-car camera program and a body-worn camera program uh, to promote the transparency and accountability for police officers assigned to that department. We, we, we are not arguing that there's not uh, a return on the investment. What we're stating that is uh, many agencies, because of the length of time that body-worn cameras uh, operate for their batteries. Uh, a lot of agencies currently assign two body-worn cameras. So we're talking about off-duty as well as on-duty, and that's going, to, that's going to significantly increase the cost. All we're saying, as Mr. George pointed out, this is an unfunded mandate, and when these unfunded mandates are placed in local law enforcement agencies by the, by the state general assembly, it's the local pet taxpayers to have to pick up that cost. So all we're saying is that if we're going to pass these types of, uh, if we're going to pass this type of legislation, then we need to take that cost factor into consideration. Last year, uh, under one of the uh, Senate bills, it, it increased the length of time that the body-worn camera has to capture from 30 seconds to 60 seconds. It may not seem like a lot of time, but when you multiply that by the number of cameras, that's a considerable amount of storage. And we're seeing that play out now in renegotiated contracts with body-worn camera uh, contract vendors uh, and adding those additional costs, substantial additional costs uh, to the body-worn camera programs. So let me be clear, the chiefs and sheriffs support the body-worn camera program. You've never heard anything different from, from myself or any of my colleagues as it relates to uh, the use of those cameras. What we're saying is that there is a substantial cost 
when we start increasing the use of the body worn camera and extending it to uh, to other areas within the uh, within the profession. All right, it looks like that might be the end of the questions for that panel. Um, I think that's the end of the testimony. Um, so we are going to go now to a pair of bills from a trio of bills from Delegate Acevedo. Um, we're going to go in this order, House Bill 524, House Bill 1373, and House Bill 532. Um, so let's start with House Bill 524. Um, this one's a solo uh, bill. So Delegate Acevedo, you have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening. Um, for the record, Delegate Acevedo uh, here to uh, present House Bill 524, um, which uh, in essence uh, addresses um, a problem that um, is least talked about, but is certainly uh, very concerning as it relates to policing, and that's the issue of white nationalism um, in law enforcement. I um, want to direct the uh, committee's attention to a unredacted FBI assessment that was released um, by <clears throat> 2006, but later released by a, a congressional committee that just points to the concerns around um, not just the infiltration of law enforcement in the United States, um, uh, uh, white nationalist groups, infiltration of law enforcement in the United States, but, that's, but that it's a problem, uh, certainly not um, unique to any one state. Um, but across the country. And so House Bill 524, uh, in essence, uh, requires that the Maryland Police Trainings and Standards Commission, which certifies potential and current police officers, um, ensuring that their criminal history checks undergo, I mean, they, they, they also um, undergo mental health screenings um, and ensure that they satisfy certain physical agility requirements. Um, so House Bill 524's addition um, of a requirement prohibiting affiliation with white supremacist organizations, which is what HB 524 calls for, um, is a necessary extension of the Maryland Police Trainings and Standard Commission's mandate. Um, and it just reconfirms and reflects our state's commitment to ensuring fairness in policing. Uh, it's a serious problem, and I think we have an opportunity to lead, um, and House Bill 534 does that. Thank you. I can continue going on the other bills or however you want to do that. Maybe. Well, let's, uh, are there any um, questions for the sponsor? Uh, yeah, it's Delegate McComas. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Delegate Acevedo, just a real quick question. You mentioned the FBI report or something. Could you be a little bit more specific? So if I wanted to look it up. Yeah, if you were to do just a simple uh, Google search, it's a 2006 um, FBI assessment um, entitled White Supremacy Infiltration of Law Enforcement. Um, a good bit of the report um, uh, was redacted, but the committee that uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland sits on and civil rights and civil liberties, in essence, released like sort of like more information on the um, sort of unredacted, um, in essence, and uh, it, it sort of points to some really troubling uh, information about the infiltration of white uh, supremacists and white nationalist groups in law enforcement. Um, and the potential problems that it could pose for not just Black, Latinx communities, but Jewish communities as well, LGBTQ+, immigrant communities, or new American communities. So, so just to be clear, there's a 2006 FBI white supremacy of police enforcement. And then do I look up Jamie Raskin and, and uh, the uh, concerns for white supremacy or something? I'm happy to provide that information to the committee if, if that would be helpful. But yeah, yeah I, I think I think it would. Yeah. So because uh, yeah, that would be good, yeah. sir. Thank but you. A, but a cursory Google search would would be able to pull it up. It's, it's not not a uh, not difficult to find, but I can provide that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you you know exactly what what we're looking for. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I think that's the end of the hearing on House Bill Five Twenty Four. We're going to go to House Bill 1373 next. Um, Delegate Acevedo, you have three minutes when you're ready. 
uh, I'll be uh, brief, but House Bill 1373 in essence ensures that um, the conflict of interest that uh, uh, certainly the appearance that um, uh, exists as it relates to elected state's attorneys and the attorney general um, and police associations and groups. Uh, this bill is in essence designed to restore that um, essential faith and trust um, uh, not just uh, in law enforcement, but particularly in the criminal legal system. States attorneys and attorney generals um, are charged with the responsibility of seeking accountability on behalf of the public um, uh, and also using the law to do that. Um, and what this bill does is ensures that any state's attorney or attorney general that um, accepts um, contributions, um, monetary, et cetera, um, uh, that he, she, or they then must recuse themselves from uh, investigations and prosecutions of uh, law enforcement, particularly around police misconduct. Um, this ensures that there is, again, that confidence that um, state's attorneys and attorney generals who are elected by the people um, uh, are able to do their jobs and not necessarily influenced um, you know, uh, by any one particular group. Um, uh, and whatnot. So House Bill 1373, um, it, I think it would make monumental strides in the direction of meaningful reform when it comes to law enforcement in our state. Um, our work is far from done. We did quite a bit last year, but um, there's really significant work that still needs to be done around police transparency and accountability. Um, and this addresses the prosecutorial piece of it. All right, are there any questions for the sponsor? We do have three people signed up in opposition from the state's attorneys, uh, Joe, Joe Riley, Gavin Katashnik, and Stephen Kroll. Um, we may not have them here right now. Um, let me, let's just give them one second. And if not, they are not here. Okay. Uh, we will... They're also signed up on the next bill. So I'll tell you what, let's move on to um, uh, Bill Agasavero's third bill. And if they happen to show up, we can try and catch them. Um, so this is uh, House Bill 532. Um, we have Delegate Acevedo and two people signed up on the favorable panel, Deborah Levy and Nicole Hansen Mundell. Um, and Delegate Acevedo, you have uh, three minutes when you're ready. I'll be very brief. We'll not even take the three minutes, but appreciate it. Um, uh, colleagues, this is really, um, again, unfinished work of uh, police accountability. Uh, if I recall correctly, I, and I know we made commitments to uh, banning or ending no-knock warrants, but um, uh, uh, what, what, what the General Assembly did was reformed it. And I think when we look at cases like the one more recently in Minneapolis, Minnesota with Amir Locke and so many others, we do not want a situation where, um, you know, a no-knock warrant not only goes wrong, um, but, um, you know, that then has um, a ripple impact on our community. And what we need to be doing is ensuring that we're legislating before um, and my hope is that we would finally end no-knock warrants um, and we would stop uh, allowing this dangerous practice to continue that not only puts civilians, but really law enforcement in danger um, and is not particularly effective. Um, so this bill changes that and allows for then uh, uh, law enforcement to seek um, a search warrant from a judge who will then approve. And it also indicates uh, the hours in which um, law enforcement would have to conduct that uh, that search warrant after notifying uh, the person um, uh, who's, you know, uh, who's, uh, who the search warrant uh, is, um, uh, whose property the search warrant is, 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 is for. So um, again, uh, we need to do this. I, I, I think um, there are enough examples across the country as to why we should. Um, and my hope is that uh, this committee and its wisdom would, uh, would um, uh, uh, provide a favorable report. Thank you. All right, next uh, we will hear from Deborah Levy for two minutes. Good evening, uh, Vice Chairman Moon and committee members. 
Um, this is Deborah Levy again from the Office of the Public Defender. We urge a favorable report on House Bill 532, and we actually adopt the testimony that I provided earlier today on House Bill 651 and echo uh, the comments of the delegate uh, in, in favor of his own bill. Um, and with that, I'll be available for questions. All right, and next we'll hear from Nicole hansen Wendell for two minutes. Nicole, are you uh, able to unmute yourself? I cannot, uh, yeah, you gotta unmute yourself. We can see you, but we can't hear it. There you go. Oh, thank you. Um, long day. Um, thank you all for uh, sticking in there with us and uh, doing your best to pass laws and policies that impact Marylanders. I know you all are tired. Um, just wanna introduce myself, Nicole Hanson Mundell. Executive Director of Out for Justice, a grassroots group that advocate for laws and policies that impact uh, formerly and currently incarcerated people. Um, we, um, I apologize. We are uh, in support of HB 532. I hope this is uh, especially what we're talking about because I had a long list today. These no not ones force entry raids become more, well, become more common during the failed war on drugs during the 1980s. We know that this and other dangerous tough on crime policies have caused tremendous harm and very little good. The majority, 54% 54, 54 of these harmful no-knock um, raids target black and brown Americans, 42% target black Americans, and an additional 12% target Hispanic Americans. This is a growing consensus that the risk of this tactic far outweighs the reward, as though it is. Um, the executive director of the National Tactical Officers Association has said, what's the likelihood of us not making entry and it being disposed of? It's not like the occupant has an um, incinerator. Where's the gun go? At the end of the day, if you're going to risk human life, even including the suspect, because you want a piece of evidence, then it's flawed analysis of risk mitigation. Um, and I'll repeat, this is from the executive director of the National Tactical Officers Association. Lastly, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, if you would allow me, uh, data about no-knock raids is not clearly collected or available, but in the New York Times investigation found that at least 94 people were killed in no-knock raids between 2010 and 2016, including 81 uh, civilians. Um, if I have a little bit more time, it's a the psych psychology tra traumatic for adults and even more traumatic for children. And I'll tell you, I, I have been victim of a no-knock warrant in my day um, and, and my children still remember it. The absolute 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. time restriction is uh, in this bill, very critical. Sleeping people will not hear police announcing themselves and are more likely to awake ready to defend themselves if they don't know what is going on. And I know my two minutes have probably um, uh, was over, but I appreciate the work of this committee. I know how hard you all work. I know these long days in front of the computer. Um, it's not healthy for your eyes or your eating habits. And so, um, for those reasons, I want to just thank you all um, for sticking in there with us. And thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, for allowing me uh, a little bit more time. Not a problem. Um, we have three people signed up <clears throat> unfavorable on this one. Also, the same uh, three state's attorneys, Joe Riley, Gavin Potashnik, and Stephen Kroll. Doesn't appear that they are here. Um, no show. Okay. So that will end the testimony on, oh, sorry. Are there any questions? Okay. There are no questions. That will end the uh, testimony on House Bill 532. Thank you, everybody. Um, okay. We are now going to go to a pair of bills from Delegate Sham. 
House Bill 946, and then House Bill 1184. So we'll start with House Bill 946. This is a solo bill. Um, Delegate Sham, you have three minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and to my esteemed colleagues on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, you're hanging in there. It's been a long day. I, I promise I won't keep you long. Delegate Brendan Cham here to present House Bill 946, which is Washington County Police Administrative Charging Committee. Um, this bill is an extension of House Bill 670 that passed last year to address uh, transparency, accountability, accountability, and citizen participation with regard to policing complaints. This only applies to Washington County and will require the head of law enforcement agency or the designee that employs a police officer who is the subject of a complaint to serve as an advisory member, non-voting member of the administrative charging committee for each complaint reviewed by the administrative charging committee. The head of law enforcement agency or the designee one, must be present for all of these deliberations. Two, they may answer questions that may come from the administrative charging committee. And three, they are prohibited from participating in any of the voting. Since the administrative charging committee will be comprised of four civilian members, two selected by the county's police accountability board, and two selected by the chief executive officer of the county, Though these civilian members will receive training to understand the policies and procedures of law enforcement, the sheriff, who is the head of the law enforcement agency or designee can provide vital wisdom and input to the charging committee. The sheriff or designee will be present for all of the deliberations. This person, the sheriff or the designee may answer any questions that might be provided by the charge committee. So it's as simple as that, colleagues. Uh, there's nothing more to share with you with regards to this bill. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Thank you for your time and I look forward to a favorable outcome. One question, Delegate McComas. Delegate Cham. Yes. <laughs> um, are, uh, I assume you're gonna be getting a Washington County delegation letter of approval. Okay, just check. Yes, yes, it was it was just sent over pretty late. Um, I do exactly. have it in my inbox. Do I need to send it out to the committee members? I no, share. I just, just I think, um, just, I well, maybe you should talk to Delegate Moon or the chair as to how they- We do want to deliver it to the committee. Okay, I will send that. I like your accommodations. <laughs> Thank you. All right, are there any other questions on this bill? Um, that's gonna end the hearing on House Bill 946. We're gonna go to House Bill 1184. Also, Delegate Sham, we have um, uh, six, six people plus the sponsor, so we'll take them in this order. Adam Rabizinski. Russell Hamill, um, Bill George, Jacob Day, uh, Angelica Bailey, and Abigail McNinch. And uh, it'll be three minutes for Delegate Cham when you're ready and two minutes for the witnesses. All right, thank you again, Mr. Vice Chair. And to my colleagues on Judiciary Committee, for the record again, this is Delegate Brenda Cham here to present um, House Bill 1184. Police Accountability Boards and Administrative Charging Committees, um, Municipal Corporations. After the passing of House Bill 670 last year, with the expectancy to be in effect July 1st, 2022, my mayor and police chief reached out to me to discuss their concern about sharing the Police Accountability Board and the Administrative Charging Committee with the Sheriff's Law Enforcement Agency at the county level with respect to complaints made towards the law enforcement officer. I was informed, quite frankly, this isn't going to work. Policies and best practices are different with regard to municipalities versus sheriff's departments at the county level. The question that provoked this bill is why should non-residents participate in the investigatory complaint process of city residents and make disciplinary decisions against city police officers? This bill 
started out as a local bill, but, but I was quickly informed that many other municipalities will be impacted by future police accountability boards and administrative charging committees. Therefore, I reached out to fellow colleagues in my Republican caucus to find out if their districts are also facing the same questions. I came to realize this is beyond Hagerstown. This bill will simply authorize each municipal corporation in the state to, number one, establish an administrative charging committee to serve law enforcement agencies at the municipal level, and two, have an, have an accountability board to hold quarterly, quarterly meetings with specified representatives to improve policing in municipal corporations, appoint civilian members to the charging committees, and receive complaints of police misconduct filed by members of the public of the public. The bill establishes the required composition of the charging committee and requires a municipal corporation to determine the composition and select the members of the accountability board. This bill doesn't fly in the face of House Bill 670 that passed last year. It simply allows municipalities to form their own accountability boards and charging committees and not have to share at the county level. As simple as that. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I look forward to a favorable report. Thank you. We do have uh, Mr. Chair um, back at the helm. All right. And this is 946 then? We're on 1184. Um, we have uh, the witnesses called. So we're starting with Adam. Rebczynski? Uh, yes, sir. Good Let's evening. Go with that. Adam Rebczynski representing the city of Havre de Grace. Uh, the city supports House Bill 1184. Chapter 59 of 2021 repealed the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights and replaced it with police accountability and discipline. This section of Chapter 59 on the subject matter will go into effect later this year and requires each county to have a police accountability board in each county to have an administrative charging committee under which municipal law enforcement officers will be subject. Chapter 59 does not authorize municipal governments to create and administer police accountability boards or administrative charging committees, nor does any other law in the books, even though municipalities are more than capable of administering these types of boards. House Bill 1184 would enable municipal governments to establish police accountability boards and charging com committees to handle matters of police misconduct followed by members of the public. The city of Havre de Grace requests the committee give HB 114 a favorable report, and we thank you for your time. Russell Hamill, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Clippinger. I appreciate this time today. I'm Russ Hamill, and I'm representing the Maryland Chiefs of Police Association as the first vice president, as well as the Maryland Sheriff's Association, in support of House, House Bill 1184. As you heard, the bill authorizes municipalities throughout Maryland to establish their own police accountability boards and charging committees within specifications provided for in the legislation enacted last year. Although it doesn't require such, so municipalities can still utilize county boards and committees if they so choose. The legislation passed last year established police accountability boards and charging committees at the county level, but it did not provide for such at the municipal level. This structure provides that a county level police accountability board will receive and review complaints of alleged police misconduct, and a county level charging committee will decide whether an officer should be administratively charged, but that's including officers from municipal from municipality, not just the county. A county does not have authority over a municipality in these matters, nor does it employ the officers. The county will now decide disciplinary matters for it. Simply, there is not an employee-employer relationship between municipal employees and the county government. This establishes an awkward relationship among these entities, whereby the county is inserted into municipal government operations, effectively removing the duly elected municipal officials from the autonomy in managing their employees and overseeing accountability measures for their employees as expected by their constituents. The community that elects municipality officials to represent their local interests and pays additional taxes for their, their municipal services, including police services, is also marginalized as their collective and individual voices are not heard as such deserve to be, and will be providing for such municipal level boards and committees if we do so. 
House Bill 1184 simply authorizes municipalities to establish these required bodies should they choose to do so. For these reasons, the MCPA and MSA support 1184 and urge a favorable committee report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time and thank you to the committee for listening to me today. I appreciate it. Bill George. Thank you to the chair and members of the committee. Bill George with the Maryland Municipal League uh, here in support of House Bill 1184. Um, many of my points were hit on by uh, Mr. Hamill. Um, you know, this, uh, the, the current arrangement of the uh, county created accountability board and uh, charging committees is awkward at best. Um, this type of county oversight over municipal services is found next to nowhere um, in the rest of state law. Um, a, uh, someone once made the analogy that it's, uh, it's similar to a store manager at a Safeway overseeing the operations of a butcher shop at a giant. Um, it just doesn't make sense. Um, it's, uh, it's a structure of government issue, um, but it's also uh, that of municipal residents uh, and municipal uh, elected officials' voices being lost in this process. Um, when it comes down to something as serious as the uh, review of a complaint against a police officer, um, uh, especially one that's in a uh, municipal police agency, um, to have the voices of municipal residents and, and elected officials uh, excluded from the process, um, to, it, uh, it doesn't sit right. Um, the other is that um, with, uh, with one um, charging committee hearing all of the complaints against officers from all agencies within the county, um, we're concerned about a backlog um, of cases occurring in jurisdictions that have uh, many police uh, agencies. Um, you know, there are several counties uh, throughout the state that have many municipalities and many municipalities with police agencies. And um, a, uh, any delay in, in resolution of these cases, um, it is, uh, does a disservice to the complainant uh, as well as the officer uh, in question. So. For these reasons, we thank the sponsor for introducing this bill um, and ask for a favorable report. Mayor Day. Could be that we don't have him anymore. Mr. Chair, you're muted. It's fighting with me. Uh, I don't think we have Angelica Bailey or Abigail McNinch. Oh, wait, I see Abigail McNinch, please, for two minutes. Um, thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Good evening. I'm Abby McNinch, Mayor of Denton and the Chair of MML's Legislative Committee this year. And I'm here in favor of this House Bill 1184. While there might be many reasons for municipalities in Maryland to support this bill, I'm actually here just um, to provide my town's perspective, the town of Denton. For reference, my town is a town of 4,500 people with a police force of 14. Um, my county um, is in dollars to establish their police accountability board. This money um, will need to come for, from somewhere. Um, we're concerned that the county will look to the towns to absorb some of the cost. Essentially, my town residents could be double taxed and literally have no representation. Um, we, um, we want input on the board, including fiscal management, a presence on the board, and we strongly believe that this will strengthen the integrity of our police force. Um, it, it's pretty simple. We want to do the right thing. We, we demand integrity of our officers, and we want to have a voice about what goes on with our employees. Um, the county has no other say in the hiring, retention, or dis dismissal of any other department within local government. Without this bill, we feel like our um, hands will be tied. This, bail, this current bill is fair and balanced and will assist in refining policing as well as strengthening local departments. For those reasons, I strongly support House Bill 1184 and hope for hope for a favorable report. Thank you. Are there questions for the panel? Questions for the panel? All right, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1184. And we thank you all very much for being with us today.
We're going to go to our last bill of the evening, and that's House Bill 860. Delegate Cox, uh, we'll hear from Delegate Cox. We'll hear from uh, also from uh, Sheriff DeWeese from Carroll County. So we'll hear from the two of them, Dele Delegate Cox for three minutes, the Sheriff for two minutes. Then we'll hear from those people in opposition. So Delegate Cox, go ahead for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, <clears throat> according to the statistics reported by the FBI, 59 police officers were killed in the line of duty from January 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2021. That's only nine months. This was a 51% increase in the number of police officers killed when compared to the same period last year. Nationally, 60,105 law enforcement officers were assaulted while performing their duties in 2020. Based on these reports, there are more than 4,071 uh, more officers assaulted in 2020 than, in, uh, than the year before in 2019. The reflections on these sacrifices uh, by the FBI, um, the uh, director stated as follows, uh, quote, we are looking now at 59 officers or agents murdered in the line of duty this year. It's an over 50% increase from last year, and that translates to about every five days more often than every five days in this country, an officer is murdered in the line of duty. That's totally unacceptable. It's a tragedy and it needs attention. Well, one of the ways we can provide uh, additional support and security and attention to those who may be targeting officers for assassination or other kinds of uh, assault is my bill HB 860. It means protecting our law enforcement personnel by requiring that anyone who wishes to use the Public Information Act request do so uh, with objective transparency. Um, just like what members of the legislature have in terms of our protection for those who seek our public records uh, that is made public and is notified to us, uh, the same needs to happen for police officers. Um, if a person, my bill will, will do this, if a person submits a written application to a custodian to inspect a record, the custodian uh, will uh, provide that record so long as the person does the following names, uh, provides their name and address, uh, the name and address of the employer or a statement that the person is not employed, and a phone number and valid email address for the person. And a very important part, the name of any organization on behalf of which the person is submitting the written application or a, a statement that the individual is not submitting the written application on behalf of any organization. This required uh, information then is provided by a notice to the police officer uh, and the law enforcement agency. The bill requires the custodian to deny this record unless this is provided. This notice is due process. It provides notice to the officer uh, with the identification information. It also provides uh, a requirement that the information be publicly posted on the website for all citizens to see. This actually can have a benefit for all individuals involved because transparency obviously provides uh, better information for everyone and for better government. This might sound familiar to us, um, as I mentioned earlier, because this is exactly what we have in terms of our own uh, protections as legislators uh, when someone asks for our records. So this is a common sense measure. It's a simple measure. And it does not change uh, path, the, the law that was passed in terms of MPIAs. It actually strengthens that uh, from the perspective of all parties involved. And um, I'm not sure, Mr. Chair, if uh, Sheriff DeWeese was able to remain on. It, it doesn't did. look like he's here. So I think I'm just going to throw it to questions and if the <laughs> committee. Yes. He, he did, Mr. Chair, send, I just want to mention, he did send around his um, testimony in support of Okay. Bill 860 uh, to the committee via email, and I res respectfully ask for a favorable report. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Delegate Cox? All right. Seeing none, that concludes the testimony of those in favor. We'll go to those opposed. Deborah Levy and Rebecca Snyder. I believe uh, Debbie Levy is in the waiting room. Yes, she is. So we'll hear from her for two minutes. I don't believe Ms. Snyder is here uh, for an opposition, but there is uh, Deborah Levy. So let's hear from her, please, for two minutes. Um, good evening again, um, Chairman Clippinger, Vice Chairman Moon, if you're still here, and members of the committee. 
Uh, again, I believe that this is uh, resistance to Anton's law pushback. I would adopt my previous comments um, from House Bill 1042 earlier today. And I would just add this extra caution that this, this bill quite candidly as a member of the public, as a member of the Office of the Public Defender is, is actually a frightening bill. Um, I have submitted MPIA requests across the state and law enforcement agents, some of them in particular jurisdictions will call me and ask, what is the nature of my request um, and why do I want it? Which fundamentally misunderstands the Public Information Act. It's supposed to be easy for folks to access. And candidly, I should never have to justify why I want information that the law requires public. It's intimidating. Um, I'm a lawyer uh, for a sheriff to call me on my phone and ask me what is the basis for my request. I could only imagine what a non-law trained member of the general public um, would, how they would feel in response to that. Um, this is again, just another end run, an exercise at intimidation for members of the general public. And I would urge an strongly urge an unfavorable report for House Bill, uh, where are we? 860, thank you. Questions, I don't see uh, Ms. Snyder, Rebecca Snyder. Are there questions for the panel, for the witness? Um, all right, Delegate McComas. Just a, a real quick question um, to uh, Ms. Levy. Um, I think when you wanna look at a record, at least in the district court, um, and you wanna look at the file, um, you have to sign uh, some paperwork. Uh, like if you if you're tangentially what you want to look at a case because it's you know you may not be representing the person in that particular case but you might be representing them in something else isn't isn't that true if i want to look at a record in the circuit court and i generally practice in the circuit court for maryland uh at different various circuit courts uh, the reason that i have to check out a record is because that belongs to the circuit court i'm looking at it from the records division and there's only one copy of a court record. So if I want a copy of something, I don't that that I don't they don't retain my information if I want to ask for a copy of something. But it's because it's a secure court case file. I have to check it out, and then I, and then I, they're not holding that information for any other reason than I'm holding a secure case file. If I'm asking for an MPIA document, I'm just asking for a copy of a document, so they don't need any information from me. I don't, I provide my information in the request in the letter, they have to send it somewhere, but it's not, shouldn't be a requirement that they be able to keep tabs and notify the law enforcement officer that I'm looking for public records. I mean, it seems at its face intimidation. Well, um, I know when I wanna get a sheriff's record of a police report, sometimes I won't be getting it from the state's attorney. I, I'll have to go directly to the police department or i want to so uh, you know and i have to sign for i have to sign a public information thing and and i get it um so well, i i guess maybe everybody does it differently well the requirements for the public information act are specific and all you have to do and the idea if you look at the legislative history and the history of the public information act is to make it easier for the public to access information that is deemed public and so if there's really very few requirements, except that you clearly state this is a request under the Public Information Act, and this is what I want to have. And that's it. If you don't give them your information, they'll not know where to send it. Um, and I can tell you from my experience this past year, I've had several uh, officers from law enforcement agencies call and ask, why do I need it? Is it legitimate? I think that I give them the answer as a courtesy, but I tell them that I don't have to. Um, and I, I just think that that's dangerous territory. That, that, that we, we don't wanna wade into because there's a very strong power differential from a member of the public who's walking in to get just public information. And look, if they don't put a place for the information to be sent, they won't get it. So, but that's not a requirement under the Public Information Act. And I guess I would posit to the members, like where else is there some specific delineation for a PIA request that you'd have to provide this information? And, and most respectfully, asking to see a court file is different than a Public Information Act request because again, that's a secure court file. And, and I don't know, I would issue a subpoena for other documents. So I don't have an experience where I would walk down to the district court and not have to show any information. Usually I'm getting that by subpoena power. 
Well, if anyway, if you don't have a case and you you know that you're involved in, right? Okay, uh, you have to sign the paperwork, and and I think don't don't you think that um, with uh, I, I know where I am, my jurisdiction, all the buildings are very close together. And I think that um, depending on, you know, if there's grand juries or something, um, I know one, one, one guy who was an officer was very concerned because he saw somebody was kind of tracking him. And it's very, you know, a witness, a witness intimidation of a police officer. So I, I just think that there's, there's reasons why they're kind of a little hyper vigilant. Their work, you know, they do some some really incredible work, and that might be part of it. Undercover guys. They well, they do, but just because you're getting a PIA request, most respectfully, I've never had anybody revealed in a PIA request or response that somebody's undercover. I have never, and I've never, we're not looking for officers' private or personal information. And I will tell you that for two days I litigated access to an internal of an, an officer's internal affairs files in Baltimore for two days. And I have a photograph of it. The police parked outside his house, caddy corner to his row house for two days. This is at the same time that the officer, and it was reported in the Baltimore Sun, Fabian Lorande threatened my witnesses and was taken into custody. That was the law enforcement officer whose files we were litigating. He also went to the attorneys for the FOP and asked who was that public defender who was looking around at his records. I have had juveniles who were approached by officers. We were litigating an officer's IED files in Baltimore and the officer went to a juvenile and he said, you tell your lawyer, I didn't even represent him, that she's not getting into that file. That was an officer who stopped a child on the street to question them and intimidate them about access to his records from the lawyer. Those have been my experiences as an officer of the court that the intimidation has gone the other way and I have never in my experience heard, I have never gotten an officer's private information from an IAD file. We're not seeking that kind of information. Um, so I have never seen, although I guess there's a potential for that, I've never seen that type of thing happen. And I think if we practice in fear of what might happen for the officer, then we're going again backwards. Well, I have a question. Somebody, somebody has to redact a lot of a lot of personal information, right? Before you get it. That's for the witnesses and the report, the people who have reported it and they are not public servants. So that's the distinction. Okay, thank you. The, the, the IED file doesn't list, I've never seen an officer's home address listed in an internal affairs file. I've never seen their personal information. Sometimes candidly folks will come in if there's a domestic disturbance and folks will report each other in the police department, I've never, we're not taking that for admissibility for court. Those, and, and that's not information that um, I've ever used in court, wanted. But again, that doesn't even disclose an officer's private information. So in, unless somebody's, and I make hundreds of these requests. So, I, and if I'm not seeing it, I think that that potentially we're we're talking in, in in potential fears and potential bad outcomes. Look, individuals' addresses are posted on case search when they're merely charged with a crime. Um, so we have people's private information displayed regularly. Everybody has access to the internet and white pages, and and we're talking about private information that's not even contained inside of a PIA. So how could it be disclosed if it's not contained in the record? Delegate Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Levy, thanks so much. I Real quickly, two questions though. Um, number one, do you, do you support anonymous uh, styled um, requests, MPIA requests uh, from people who could be um, related to or connected to a criminal investigation? In other words, um, you, you mentioned witness information is redacted, but you know that's not true in the, in the context of the names. The identities are not redacted specifically. That was a huge fight we had last year. So we could literally have individuals involved uh, in a criminal investigation wanting to know names of witnesses like and I'm, I'm sorry you didn't know this, but in Baltimore City, like what happened last year with a mother calling the jail, telling her son, 
and they're you know they were going to target a witness um, because uh, she passed the name along. So this is a concern that um, that individuals you know without identifying themselves, there's no way of knowing whether or not this could be potentially connected to a criminal investigation. Uh, someone who shouldn't uh, have access to the names of witnesses, for instance. That's that's my first question. So to, in response to your first question, since the passage of Anton's law and its effective date of October 1st, I have not received one Public Information Act response with any witnesses' names at all. And in fact, I have not received substantive responses generally. In other words, all of the law enforcement agencies who we've reached out to have asked, could they summarize or it will cost X amount of dollars for the redactions. And we're still waiting on production from that. So I haven't had any responses that speak to that. As far as an anonymous MPIA request is concerned, I have always included my name and contact information. I have also used a service called Muckrock. Muckrock is a service that was founded by journalists to help organize massive MPIA requests. Um, and if so if it goes through Muckrock, then the information goes to Muckrock and then gets routed to me. Even still, folks call me and ask, what is Muckrock? Is this legitimate? Why are you making this request? And I get those calls on the regular, particularly from jurisdictions outlying the Western and the Southern part of Maryland. Again, I don't, I, I, I respectfully explain to my fellow public servants that there is no requirement that I provide that information. Um, and I guess if somebody provides an anonymous request, where would the information go? I mean, they have to provide an email address, they have to provide a street address, They it, it has to be, or it could be picked up, um, I guess, in person, but I haven't had that experience. So I would think at, at their own peril, I guess, but but we're, we're talking about the heart of the MPIA law, and that is really for the benefit of the public. Well, thank you. And the, the follow-up to that is, are, are you, uh, since you said you don't pursue personal information, are you... Um, not as concerned about the part of the bill which would uh, limit access to the university records of officers? Um, I just had an intuition that I was gonna get. Can you direct me precisely to what um, line of the bill you're talking about, Delegate Cox? Okay, so let me try to pull it up quickly. I apologize. Um, so that would be uh, beginning on page three, line 12, and extending on through the page four. A custodian of a record kept by a public institution of higher education. Um, I don't exactly know what that means. I know I can point, I don't know what that means. So does that mean that an officer, for example, I can think of one officer who left Baltimore after we litigated access to his files and we received over a decade of files that showed a pattern and practice as per a judge of the circuit court found of, of abusive behavior where he would injure people with his department issued walkie talkie, leave them bloodied, illegally enter their apartment buildings. And all of this is, is reported in the Baltimore Sun. This officer, and he was disciplined multiple times, not just for his own misconduct, but for also covering up meetings of other, um, by other officers. Um, after that was exposed in the circuit court for Baltimore City, he's went now to and is employed currently at Anne Arundel Community College. So he is interacting with students on a regular basis. And it's my best guess that folks at Anne Arundel Community College have absolutely no idea of his discipline history from the Baltimore City Police Department, which is well documented in the Baltimore Sun and in the court file. So if, is, is that a record of a higher education institution that would not be accessible if he had complaints then while he's at Anne Arundel Community College right now? Because if that's the case, I would want those records to be disclosed. People's children, young people are going to Anne Arundel Community College and it would, I would think mother, I'm a mother, right? If my children are there, if there's any um, circumstances where he could have a negative interaction with the public, I think everybody would be entitled to know about his sustained discipline history in Baltimore. So if it covers that, I'm for disclosure. Well, no, I mean, I think that that's an overread. I think that because in that situation, you would have a person of interest who would automatically get access. But what we have uh, right now presently is 
uh, imagine yourself being, you know, as an officer of the court, a member of the uh, public defender's office, having just simply blanket MPIA requests against yourself for every single academic record that you have uh, without any specific reason. And that's the concern that I had. And that's why we put that in the bill. So I, I didn't know what your thinking is with that. Maybe there's a way to limit it, but I appreciate your time. Are there qu further questions? All right, seeing none, we thank you very much. That concludes the testimony for House Bill 860 and it concludes the testimony for us here on the Judiciary Committee today. Uh, thank you all very much. We'll be back tomorrow at one o'clock. Thanks again. Have a good evening.